Section 18 of the Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. Section 18. St. John Chrysostom by John Malone St. John Chrysostom, A.D. 347-407 to A strong soldier of the cross, and from good fighting stock, was that John of Antioch, who among the people that were first of the earth to bear the name of Christian, was called Chrysostom, mouth of gold. His father Secundus, who died about the time of Chrysostom's birth, was a military commander in Syria under Constantine and Constantius the Second. John was born at Antioch, A.D. 347, when the Eastern Empire and the city of Constantine were new. His young mother, Arethusa, a Christian, then but twenty years of age, devoted herself to widowhood and the education of her son in the city of his birth. The youth's early years were passed under her careful guidance, and at the age of twenty he entered on the study of oratory and philosophy under the celebrated Libanius. In 369 he became a baptized Christian and reader in the house of Miletius the bishop. The unhappy reigns of Valens and Valentinian, when neo-paganism in the west and in the Gothic settlement in the east began to work the empire's fall, saw John devoted to an ascetic life after the example of the monks and hermits who sheltered in the mountains about the gay and queenly city of his birth. His mother's grief and loneliness brought him back from his cave to an energetic career as an outspoken preacher of God's word and the eternal prophet of good stout-hearted workaday well-doing. He made himself dear to the people of Antioch, for he had eloquence such as had been unknown to Greeks since Demosthenes, and he shrank not from labor and self-denial. So they called him Golden Mouth as the Indians call their tried men straight tongues. On the death of Nectarius, the successor of Gregory of Nazian Zenus, Theophilus of Alexandria, and Arcadius the emperor made him Metropolitan of Constantinople, A.D. 397. All before this time he was laying about him with good ear-smiting Greek at vice and luxury, of which there was abundance both in palace and in hovel, and his elevation to an imperial neighborhood did not stay him. He cleared Byzantium of pagan shows, gathered the relics of the martyrs, and sent missionaries to preach to the Goths in their own speech. Not many years of this kind of leadership were allowed him. Arcadius, well disposed but indolent, was under the rule of a willful woman, and when Chrysostom turned his swayful voice against her pet vanities, the vexed Eudoxia intrigued his disposition. In 403, John went to exile in Bithynia with the words, The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away, upon his lips. A great earthquake so frightened the imperial city and family that with one outcry they called Chrysostom back. When the fear of the infirm earth had worn away, Eudoxia remembered her enmity and took it back to nurse. So one day, when John had said in his sword-like invective that Herodias was raging again, she showed less mercy than the Baptists had obtained, for under the plea that his restoration had been unwarranted, the Metropolitan was sent to a forced wandering in the wilds of outer provinces, from which there returned to him only the venerated relics of a martyr. Driven from spot to spot, sometimes in chains, always under the prod of guarding spears, one day of September 407, he dragged himself to the tomb of the martyr Basiliscus at Comana in Pontus, and laid his soul in the hands of God. Thirty years afterward, Theodosius the Younger brought the body back to Constantinople. In person, Chrysostom was small and spare. His life of rigorous fasting and toil made him still more slight and hollow-cheeked. But it is told that there was always a blaze of fire in the deep-set eyes. The work of Chrysostom was chiefly ecclesiastical oratory, in which no one of his own or later times surpassed him. First of the great Christian preachers after the church came from the caves, 
he was not less able as a teacher his letters full of sweetness and firm honesty his poetry delicate and musical and his philosophic essays rich with the clear-cut jewels of dialectics are worthy of his station in the first order of the doctors of the church the real wealth is from within from the treatise to prove that no one can harm the man who does not injure himself what i undertake is to prove only make no commotion that no one of those who are wronged is wronged by another but experiences this injury at his own hands but in order to make my argument plainer let us first of all inquire what injustice is and of what kind of things the material of it is wont to be composed also what human virtue is and what it is which ruins it and further what it is which seems to ruin it but really does not for instance for i must complete my argument by means of examples each thing is subject to one evil which ruins it iron to rust wool to moth flocks of sheep to wolves the virtue of wine is injured when it ferments and turns sour of honey when it loses its natural sweetness and is reduced to a bitter juice ears of corn are ruined by mildew and drought the fruit leaves and branches of vines by the mischievous host of locusts other trees by the caterpillar and irrational creatures by diseases of various kinds and not to lengthen the list by going through all possible examples our own flesh is subject to fevers and palsies and a crowd of other maladies as then each one of these things is liable to that which ruins its virtue let us now consider what it is which injures the human race and what it is which ruins the virtue of a human being most men think that there are diverse things which have this effect for i must mention the erroneous opinions on the subject and after confuting them proceed to exhibit that which really does ruin our virtue and to demonstrate clearly that no one could inflict this injury or bring this ruin upon us unless we betrayed ourselves the multitude then having erroneous opinions imagine that there are many different things which ruin our virtue some say it is poverty others bodily disease others loss of property others calumny others death and they are perpetually bewailing and lamenting these things and whilst they are commiserating the sufferers and shedding tears they excitedly exclaim to one another what a calamity has befallen such and such a man he has been deprived of all his fortune at a blow of another again one will say such and such a man has been attacked by severe sickness and is despaired of by the physicians in attendance some bewail and lament the inmates of the prison some those who have been expelled from their country and transported to the land of exile others those who have been deprived of their freedom others those who have been seized and made captives by enemies others those who have been drowned or burnt or buried by the fall of a house but no one mourns those who are living in wickedness on the contrary which is worse than all they often congratulate them a practice which is the cause of all manner of evils come then only as i exhorted you at the outset do not make a commotion let me prove that none of the things which have been mentioned injure the man who lives soberly nor can ruin his virtue for tell me if a man has lost all either at the hands of calumniators or of robbers or has been stripped of his goods by knavish servants what harm has the loss done to the virtue of the man but if it seems well let me rather indicate in the first place what is the virtue of a man beginning by dealing with the subject in the case of existences of another kind so as to make it more intelligible and plain to the majority of readers what then is the virtue of a horse is it to have a bridle studded with gold and girth to match and a band of silken threads to fasten the housing and clothes wrought in diverse colors and gold tissue and headgear studded with jewels and locks of hair plaited with gold cord or is it to be swift and strong in its legs and even in its paces and to have hoofs suitable to a well-bred horse and courage fitted for long journeys and warfare 
and to be able to behave with calmness in the battlefield, and if a rout takes place, to save its rider. Is it not manifest that these are the things which constitute the virtue of the horse, not the others? Again, what should you say was the virtue of asses and mules? Is it not the power of carrying burdens with contentment, and accomplishing journeys with ease, and having hoofs like rock? Shall we say that their outside trappings contribute anything to their own proper virtue? By no means. And what kind of vine shall we admire? One which abounds in leaves and branches, or one which is laden with fruit? Of what kind of virtue do we predicate of an olive? Is it to have large boughs and great luxuriance of leaves, or to exhibit an abundance of its proper fruit, dispersed over all parts of the tree? Well, let us act in the same way in the case of human beings also. Let us determine what is the virtue of man, and let us regard that alone as an injury which is destructive to it. What then is the virtue of man? Not riches, that thou shouldst fear poverty, nor health of body, that thou shouldst dread sickness, nor the opinion of the public, that thou shouldst view an evil reputation with alarm, nor life simply for its own sake, that death should be terrible to thee, nor liberty, that thou shouldst avoid servitude, but carefulness in holding true doctrine, in rectitude of life, of these things not even the devil himself will be able to rob a man, if he who possesses them guards them with the needful carefulness, and that most malicious and ferocious demon is aware of this. Thus in no case will any one be able to injure a man who does not choose to injure himself. But if a man is not willing to be temperate and to aid himself from his own resources, no one will ever be able to profit him. Therefore also that wonderful story of the Holy Scriptures, as in some lofty, large, and broad picture, has portrayed the lives of the men of old time, extending the narrative from Adam to the coming of Christ. And it exhibits to you both those who are vanquished and those who are crowned with victory in the contest, in order that it may instruct you by means of all examples that no one will be able to injure one who is not injured by himself, even if all the world were to kindle a fierce war against him. For it is not stress of circumstances, nor variation of seasons, nor insults of men in power, nor intrigues besetting thee like snowstorms, nor a crowd of calamities, nor a promiscuous collection of all the ills to which mankind is subject, which can disturb even slightly the man who is brave and temperate and watchful. Just as on the contrary, the indolent and supine man who is his own betrayer cannot be made better even with the aid of innumerable ministrations. On Encouragement During Adversity From the Letters to Olympias To my lady, the most reverend and divinely favored deaconess Olympias, I, John Bishop, send greeting in the Lord. Come now, let me relieve the wound of thy despondency, and to disperse the thoughts which gather this cloud of care around thee. For what is it which upsets thy mind, and why art thou sorrowful and dejected? It is because of the fierce black storm which has overtaken the church, enveloping all things in darkness as of a night without a moon, and is growing to a head every day, traveling to bring forth disastrous shipwrecks, and increasing the ruin of the world. I know all this as well as you none shall gainsay it and if you like i will form an image of the things now taking place so as to present the tragedy yet more distinctly to thee we behold a sea upheaved from the very lowest depths some sailors floating dead upon the waves others engulfed by them the planks of the ships breaking up the sails torn to tatters the masts sprung the oars dashed out of the sailors hands the pilots seated on the deck, clasping their knees with their hands, instead of grasping the rudder, bewailing the hopelessness of their situation with sharp cries and bitter lamentations, neither sky nor sea clearly visible, but all one deep and impenetrable darkness, so that no one can see his neighbor, whilst mighty is the roaring of the billows, and monsters of the sea attack the crews on every side. But how much further shall I pursue the unattainable? 
for whatever image of our present evils i may seek speech shrinks baffled from the attempt nevertheless even when i look at these calamities i do not abandon the hope of better things considering as i do who the pilot is in all of this not one who gets the better of the storm by his art but calms the raging waters by his rod and if he does not effect this at the outset and speedily such is his custom he does not at the beginning put down these terrible evils but when they have increased and come to extremities and most persons are reduced to despair then he works wondrously and beyond all expectation thus manifesting his own power and training the patience of those who undergo these calamities do not therefore be cast down for there is only one thing olympias which is really terrible only one real trial and that is sin and i have never ceased continually harping upon this theme but as for all other things plots enmities frauds calumnies insults accusations confiscation exile the keen sword of the enemy the peril of the deep warfare of the whole world or anything else you like to name they are but idle tales for whatever the nature of these things may be they are transitory and perishable and operate in a mortal body without doing any injury to the vigilant soul therefore the blessed paul desiring to prove the insignificance both of the pleasures and sorrows relating to this life declared the whole truth in one sentence when he said for the things which are seen are temporal why then dost thou fear temporal things which pass away like the stream of a river for such is the nature of present things whether they be pleasant or painful and another prophet compared all human prosperity not to grass but to another material even more flimsy describing the whole of it as the flower of grass for he did not single out any one part of it as wealth alone or luxury alone or power or honor but having comprised all the things which are esteemed splendid amongst men under the one designation of glory he said all the glory of man is as the flower of grass nevertheless you will say adversity is a terrible thing and grievous to be borne yet look at it again compared with another image and then also learn to despise it for the railing and insults and reproaches and jibes inflicted by enemies and their plots are compared to a worn-out garment and moth-eaten wool when god says fear ye not the reproach of men neither be ye afraid of their revilings for they shall wax old as doth a garment and like a moth-eaten wool so shall they be consumed therefore let none of these things which are happening trouble thee but ceasing to invoke the aid of this or that person and to run after shadows for such are human alliances do thou persistently call upon jesus whom thou servest merely to bow his head and in a moment of time all these evils will be dissolved but if thou hast already called upon him and yet they have not been dissolved such is the manner of god's dealing for i will resume my former argument he does not put down evils at the outset but when they have grown to a head when scarcely any form of the enemy's malice remains ungratified then he suddenly converts all things to a state of tranquillity and conducts them to an unexpected settlement for he is not only able to turn as many things as we expect and hope to good but many more yea infinitely more wherefore also paul saith now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think could he not for example have prevented the three children at the outset from falling into trial but he did not choose to do this thereby conferring great pain upon them therefore he suffered them to be delivered into the hands of the barbarians and the furnace to be heated to an immeasurable height and the wrath of the king to blaze even more fiercely than the furnace and hands and feet to be bound with great severity and they themselves to be cast into the fire and then when all they who beheld despaired of their rescue suddenly and beyond all hope the wonder-working power of god the supreme artificer was displayed and shone forth with exceeding splendor 
for the fire was bound and the bondmen were released and the furnace became a temple of prayer a place of fountains and dew of higher dignity than a royal court and the very hairs of their head prevailed over that all-devouring element which gets the better even of iron and stone and masters every kind of substance and a solemn song of universal praise was instituted there by those holy men inviting every kind of created thing to join in the wondrous melody and they uttered hymns of thanksgiving to god for that they had been bound and also burnt as far at least as the malice of their enemies had power that they had been exiles from their country captives deprived of their liberty wandering outcasts from city and home sojourners in a strange and barbarous land for all this was the outpouring of a grateful heart and when the malicious devices of their enemies were perfected for what further could they attempt after their death and the labors of the heroes were completed and the garland of victory was woven and their rewards were prepared and nothing more was wanting for their renown then at last their calamities were brought to an end and the one who caused the furnace to be kindled and delivered them over to that great punishment became himself the panegyrist of those holy heroes of the herald of god's marvellous deed and everywhere throughout the world issued letters full of reverent praise recording what had taken place and becoming the faithful herald of the miracles wrought by the wonder-working god for inasmuch as he had been an enemy and adversary what he wrote was above suspicion even in the opinion of enemies thus thou see the abundance of resource belonging to god his extraordinary power his loving kindness and care be not therefore dismayed or troubled but continue to give thanks to god for all things praising and invoking him beseeching and supplicating even if countless tumults and troubles come upon thee even if tempests are stirred up before thine eyes let none of these things disturb thee for our master is not baffled by the difficulty even if all things are reduced to the extremity of ruin for it is possible for him to raise those who have fallen to convert those who are in error to set straight those who have been ensnared to release those who have been laden with countless sins and make them righteous to quicken those who are dead to restore lustre to decayed things and freshness to those who have waxen old for if he makes things which are not to come into being and bestows existence on things which are nowhere by any means manifest how much more will he rectify things which already exist concerning the statutes from homily eight knowing these things let us take heed to our life and let us not be earnest as to the goods that perish neither as to the glory that goeth out nor as to the body which groweth old nor as to that beauty which is fading nor as to that pleasure which is fleeting but let us expend all our care about the soul and let us provide for the welfare of this in every way for to cure the body when diseased is not an easy matter to every one but to cure a sick soul is easy to all and the sickness of the body requires medicine as well as money for its healing but the healing of the soul is a thing easy to procure and devoid of expense and the nature of the flesh is with much labor delivered from those wounds which are troublesome for very often the knife must be applied and medicines that are bitter but with respect to the soul there is nothing of this kind it suffices only to exercise the will and the desire and all things are accomplished and this hath been the work of god's providence inasmuch as from bodily sickness no great injury could arise for though we were not diseased yet death would in any case come and destroy and dissolve the body but everything depends upon the health of our souls this being by far the more precious and necessary he hath made the medicine of it easy and void of expense or pain what excuse therefore or what pardon shall we obtain if when the body is sick and money must be expended on its behalf the physicians called in and much anguish endured we make this so much a matter of our care though what might result from that sickness could be no great injury to us and yet treat the soul with neglect and this when we are neither called upon to pay down money nor to give others any trouble 
nor to sustain any sufferings but without any of all these things by only choosing and willing have it in our power to accomplish the entire amendment of it and knowing assuredly that if we fail to do this we shall sustain the extreme sentence and punishments and penalties which are inexorable for tell me if any one promised to teach thee the healing art in a short space of time without money or labor wouldst thou not think him a benefactor wouldst thou not submit both to do and to suffer all things whatsoever he who promised these things commanded behold now it is permitted thee without labor to find a medicine for wounds not of the body but of the soul and to restore it to a state of health without any suffering let us not be indifferent to the matter for pray what is the pain of laying aside anger against one who hath aggrieved thee it is a pain indeed to remember injuries and not to be reconciled what labor is it to pray and to ask for a thousand good things from god who is ready to give what labor is it not to speak evil of any one what difficulty is there in being delivered from envy and ill will what trouble is it to love one's neighbor what suffering is it not to utter shameful words nor to revile nor to insult another what fatigue is it not to swear for again i return to this same admonition the labor of swearing is indeed exceedingly great oftentimes whilst under the influence of anger or wrath we have sworn perhaps that we would never be reconciled to those who have injured us i am now for the sixth day admonishing you in respect of this precept henceforth i am desirous to take leave of you meaning to abstain from the subject that ye may be on your guard there will no longer be any excuse or allowance for you for of right indeed if nothing had been said on this matter it ought to have been amended of yourselves for it is not a thing of an intricate nature or that requires great preparation but since ye have enjoyed the advantage of so much admonition and counsel what excuse will ye have to offer when ye stand accused before that dread tribunal and are required to give account of this transgression it is impossible to invent any excuse but of necessity you must either go hence amended or if you have not amended be punished and abide the extremest penalty thinking therefore upon all these things and departing hence with much anxiety about them exhort ye one another that the things spoken of during so many days may be kept with all watchfulness in your minds so that whilst we are silent ye instructing edifying exhorting one another may exhibit great improvement and having fulfilled all the other precepts may enjoy eternal crowns which god grant we may all obtain through the grace and knowledge of our lord jesus christ end of section eighteen section eighteen of the library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine section eighteen st john chrysostom by john malone st john chrysostom a d three forty seven to four o seven a strong soldier of the cross and from good fighting stock was that john of antioch who among the people that were first of the earth to bear the name of christian was called chrysostom mouth of gold his father secundus who died about the time of chrysostom's birth was a military commander in syria under constantine and constantius the second john was born at antioch a d three forty seven when the eastern empire and the city of constantine were new his young mother arethusa a christian then but twenty years of age devoted herself to widowhood and the education of her son in the city of his birth the youth's early years were passed under her careful guidance and at the age of twenty he entered on the study of oratory and philosophy under the celebrated libanius 
in 369 he became a baptized christian and reader in the house of Meletius the bishop the unhappy reigns of valens and valentinian when neo-paganism in the west and in the gothic settlement in the east began to work the empire's fall saw john devoted to an ascetic life after the example of the monks and hermits who sheltered in the mountains about the gay and queenly city of his birth his mother's grief and loneliness brought him back from his cave to an energetic career as an outspoken preacher of god's word and the eternal prophet of good stout-hearted workaday well-doing he made himself dear to the people of antioch for he had eloquence such as had been unknown to greeks since demosthenes and he shrank not from labor and self-denial so they called him golden mouth as the indians call their tried men straight tongues on the death of nectarius the successor of gregory of nazian zenus theophilus of alexandria and arcadius the emperor made him metropolitan of constantinople a d three ninety seven all before this time he was laying about him with good ear-smiting greek advice and luxury of which there was abundance both in palace and in hovel and his elevation to an imperial neighborhood did not stay him he cleared byzantium of pagan shows gathered the relics of the martyrs and sent missionaries to preach to the goths in their own speech not many years of this kind of leadership were allowed him arcadius well disposed but indolent was under the rule of a wilful woman and when chrysostom turned his swayful voice against her pet vanities the vexed eudoxia intrigued his disposition in 403 john went to exile in bithynia with the words the lord hath given the lord hath taken away upon his lips a great earthquake so frightened the imperial city and family that with one outcry they called chrysostom back when the fear of the infirm earth had worn away eudoxia remembered her enmity and took it back to nurse so one day when john had said in his sword-like invective that herodias was raging again she showed less mercy than the baptists had obtained for under the plea that his restoration had been unwarranted the metropolitan was sent to a forced wandering in the wilds of outer provinces from which there returned to him only the venerated relics of a martyr driven from spot to spot sometimes in chains always under the prod of guarding spears one day of september four o seven he dragged himself to the tomb of the martyr basiliscus at comana in pontus and laid his soul in the hands of god thirty years afterward theodosius the younger brought the body back to constantinople in person chrysostom was small and spare his life of rigorous fasting and toil made him still more slight and hollow-cheeked but it is told that there was always a blaze of fire in the deep-set eyes the work of chrysostom was chiefly ecclesiastical oratory in which no one of his own or later times surpassed him first of the great christian preachers after the church came from the caves he was not less able as a teacher his letters full of sweetness and firm honesty his poetry delicate and musical and his philosophic essays rich with the clear-cut jewels of dialectics are worthy of his station in the first order of the doctors of the church the real wealth is from within from the treatise to prove that no one can harm the man who does not injure himself what i undertake is to prove only make no commotion that no one of those who are wronged is wronged by another but experiences this injury at his own hands but in order to make my argument plainer let us first of all inquire what injustice is and of what kind of things the material of it is wont to be composed also what human virtue is and what it is which ruins it and further what it is which seems to ruin it but really does not for instance for i must complete my argument by means of examples each thing is subject to one evil which ruins it iron to rust wool to moth flocks of sheep to wolves the virtue of wine is injured when it ferments and turns sour of honey when it loses its natural sweetness and is reduced to a bitter juice ears of corn are ruined by mildew and drought 
the fruit leaves and branches of vines by the mischievous host of locusts other trees by the caterpillar and irrational creatures by diseases of various kinds and not to lengthen the list by going through all possible examples our own flesh is subject to fevers and palsies and a crowd of other maladies as then each one of these things is liable to that which ruins its virtue let us now consider what it is which injures the human race and what it is which ruins the virtue of a human being most men think that there are diverse things which have this effect for i must mention the erroneous opinions on the subject and after confuting them proceed to exhibit that which really does ruin our virtue and to demonstrate clearly that no one could inflict this injury or bring this ruin upon us unless we betrayed ourselves the multitude then having erroneous opinions imagine that there are many different things which ruin our virtue some say it is poverty others bodily disease others loss of property others calumny others death and they are perpetually bewailing and lamenting these things and whilst they are commiserating the sufferers and shedding tears they excitedly exclaim to one another what a calamity has befallen such and such a man he has been deprived of all his fortune at a blow of another again one will say such and such a man has been attacked by severe sickness and is despaired of by the physicians in attendance some bewail and lament the inmates of the prison some those who have been expelled from their country and transported to the land of exile others those who have been deprived of their freedom others those who have been seized and made captives by enemies others those who have been drowned or burnt or buried by the fall of a house but no one mourns those who are living in wickedness on the contrary which is worse than all they often congratulate them a practice which is the cause of all manner of evils come then only as i exhorted you at the outset do not make a commotion let me prove that none of the things which have been mentioned injure the man who lives soberly nor can ruin his virtue for tell me if a man has lost all either at the hands of calumniators or of robbers or has been stripped of his goods by knavish servants what harm has the loss done to the virtue of the man but if it seems well let me rather indicate in the first place what is the virtue of a man beginning by dealing with the subject in the case of existences of another kind so as to make it more intelligible and plain to the majority of readers what then is the virtue of a horse is it to have a bridle studded with gold and girth to match and a band of silken threads to fasten the housing and clothes wrought in diverse colors and gold tissue and headgear studded with jewels and locks of hair plaited with gold cord or is it to be swift and strong in its legs and even in its paces and to have hoofs suitable to a well-bred horse and courage fitted for long journeys and warfare and to be able to behave with calmness in the battlefield and if a rout takes place to save its rider is it not manifest that these are the things which constitute the virtue of the horse not the others again what should you say was the virtue of asses and mules is it not the power of carrying burdens with contentment and accomplishing journeys with ease and having hoofs like rock shall we say that their outside trappings contribute anything to their own proper virtue by no means and what kind of mind shall we admire one which abounds in leaves and branches or one which is laden with fruit of what kind of virtue do we predicate of an olive is it to have large boughs and great luxuriance of leaves or to exhibit an abundance of its proper fruit dispersed over all parts of the tree well let us act in the same way in the case of human beings also let us determine what is the virtue of man and let us regard that alone as an injury which is destructive to it what then is the virtue of man not riches that thou shouldst fear poverty nor health of body that thou shouldst dread sickness nor the opinion of the public that thou shouldst view an evil reputation with alarm nor life simply for its own sake that death should be terrible to thee 
nor liberty that thou shouldst avoid servitude but carefulness in holding true doctrine in rectitude of life of these things not even the devil himself will be able to rob a man if he who possesses them guards them with the needful carefulness and that most malicious and ferocious demon is aware of this thus in no case will any one be able to injure a man who does not choose to injure himself but if a man is not willing to be temperate and to aid himself from his own resources no one will ever be able to profit him therefore also that wonderful story of the holy scriptures as in some lofty large and broad picture has portrayed the lives of the men of old time extending the narrative from adam to the coming of christ and it exhibits to you both those who are vanquished and those who are crowned with victory in the contest in order that it may instruct you by means of all examples that no one will be able to injure one who is not injured by himself even if all the world were to kindle a fierce war against him for it is not stress of circumstances nor variation of seasons nor insults of men in power nor intrigues besetting thee like snowstorms nor a crowd of calamities nor a promiscuous collection of all the ills to which mankind is subject which can disturb even slightly the man who is brave and temperate and watchful just as on the contrary the indolent and supine man who is his own betrayer cannot be made better even with the aid of innumerable ministrations on encouragement during adversity from the letters to olympias to my lady the most reverend and divinely favored deaconess olympias i john bishop send greeting in the lord come now let me relieve the wound of thy despondency and to disperse the thoughts which gather this cloud of care around thee for what is it which upsets thy mind and why art thou sorrowful and dejected it is because of the fierce black storm which has overtaken the church enveloping all things in darkness as of a night without a moon and is growing to a head every day traveling to bring forth disastrous shipwrecks and increasing the ruin of the world i know all this as well as you none shall gainsay it and if you like i will form an image of the things now taking place so as to present the tragedy yet more distinctly to thee we behold the sea upheaved from the very lowest depths some sailors floating dead upon the waves others engulfed by them the planks of the ships breaking up the sails torn to tatters the masts sprung the oars dashed out of the sailors hands the pilots seated on the deck clasping their knees with their hands instead of grasping the rudder bewailing the hopelessness of their situation with sharp cries and bitter lamentations neither sky nor sea clearly visible but all one deep and impenetrable darkness so that no one can see his neighbor whilst mighty is the roaring of the billows and monsters of the sea attack the crews on every side but how much further shall i pursue the unattainable for whatever image of our present evils i may seek speech shrinks baffled from the attempt nevertheless even when i look at these calamities i do not abandon the hope of better things considering as i do who the pilot is in all of this not one who gets the better of the storm by his art but calms the raging waters by his rod and if he does not effect this at the outset and speedily such is his custom he does not at the beginning put down these terrible evils but when they have increased and come to extremities and most persons are reduced to despair then he works wondrously and beyond all expectation thus manifesting his own power and training the patience of those who undergo these calamities do not therefore be cast down for there is only one thing olympias which is really terrible only one real trial and that is sin and i have never ceased continually harping upon this theme but as for all other things plots enmities frauds calumnies insults accusations confiscation exile the keen sword of the enemy the peril of the deep warfare of the whole world or anything else you like to name they are but idle tales for whatever the nature of these things may be they are transitory and perishable 
and operate in a mortal body without doing any injury to the vigilant soul therefore the blessed paul desiring to prove the insignificance both of the pleasures and sorrows relating to this life declared the whole truth in one sentence when he said for the things which are seen are temporal why then dost thou fear temporal things which pass away like the stream of a river for such is the nature of present things whether they be pleasant or painful and another prophet compared all human prosperity not to grass but to another material even more flimsy describing the whole of it as the flower of grass for he did not single out any one part of it as wealth alone or luxury alone or power or honor but having comprised all the things which are esteemed splendid amongst men under the one designation of glory he said all the glory of man is as the flower of grass nevertheless you will say adversity is a terrible thing and grievous to be borne yet look at it again compared with another image and then also learn to despise it for the railing and insults and reproaches and jibes inflicted by enemies and their plots are compared to a worn-out garment and moth-eaten wool when god says fear ye not the reproach of men neither be ye afraid of their revilings for they shall wax old as doth a garment and like a moth-eaten wool so shall they be consumed therefore let none of these things which are happening trouble thee but ceasing to invoke the aid of this or that person and to run after shadows for such are human alliances do thou persistently call upon jesus whom thou servest merely to bow his head and in a moment of time all these evils will be dissolved but if thou hast already called upon him and yet they have not been dissolved such is the manner of god's dealing for i will resume my former argument he does not put down evils at the outset but when they have grown to a head when scarcely any form of the enemy's malice remains ungratified then he suddenly converts all things to a state of tranquillity and conducts them to an unexpected settlement for he is not only able to turn as many things as we expect and hope to good but many more yea infinitely more wherefore also paul saith now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think could he not for example have prevented the three children at the outset from falling into trial but he did not choose to do this thereby conferring great pain upon them therefore he suffered them to be delivered into the hands of the barbarians and the furnace to be heated to an immeasurable height and the wrath of the king to blaze even more fiercely than the furnace and hands and feet to be bound with great severity and they themselves to be cast into the fire and then when all they who beheld despaired of their rescue suddenly and beyond all hope the wonder-working power of god the supreme artificer was displayed and shone forth with exceeding splendor for the fire was bound and the bondmen were released and the furnace became a temple of prayer a place of fountains and dew of higher dignity than a royal court and the very hairs of their head prevailed over that all-devouring element which gets the better even of iron and stone and masters every kind of substance and a solemn song of universal praise was instituted there by those holy men inviting every kind of created thing to join in the wondrous melody and they uttered hymns of thanksgiving to god for that they had been bound and also burnt as far at least as the malice of their enemies had power that they had been exiles from their country captives deprived of their liberty wandering outcasts from city and home sojourners in a strange and barbarous land for all this was the outpouring of a grateful heart and when the malicious devices of their enemies were perfected for what further could they attempt after their death and the labors of the heroes were completed and the garland of victory was woven and their rewards were prepared and nothing more was wanting for their renown then at last their calamities were brought to an end and the one who caused the furnace to be kindled and delivered them over to that great punishment became himself the panegyrist of those holy heroes of the herald of god's marvellous deed and everywhere throughout the world issued letters full of reverent praise 
recording what had taken place and becoming the faithful herald of the miracles wrought by the wonder-working god for inasmuch as he had been an enemy and adversary what he wrote was above suspicion even in the opinion of enemies thus thou see the abundance of resource belonging to god his extraordinary power his loving kindness and care be not therefore dismayed or troubled but continue to give thanks to god for all things praising and invoking him beseeching and supplicating even if countless tumults and troubles come upon thee even if tempests are stirred up before thine eyes let none of these things disturb thee for our master is not baffled by the difficulty even if all things are reduced to the extremity of ruin for it is possible for him to raise those who have fallen to convert those who are in error to set straight those who have been ensnared to release those who have been laden with countless sins and make them righteous to quicken those who are dead to restore lustre to decayed things and freshness to those who have waxen old for if he makes things which are not to come into being and bestows existence on things which are nowhere by any means manifest how much more will he rectify things which already exist concerning the statutes from homily eight knowing these things let us take heed to our life and let us not be earnest as to the goods that perish neither as to the glory that goeth out nor as to the body which groweth old nor as to that beauty which is fading nor as to that pleasure which is feeding but let us expend all our care about the soul and let us provide for the welfare of this in every way for to cure the body when diseased is not an easy matter to every one but to cure a sick soul is easy to all and the sickness of the body requires medicine as well as money for its healing but the healing of the soul is a thing easy to procure and devoid of expense and the nature of the flesh is with much labor delivered from those wounds which are troublesome for very often the knife must be applied and medicines that are bitter but with respect to the soul there is nothing of this kind it suffices only to exercise the will and the desire and all things are accomplished and this hath been the work of god's providence inasmuch as from bodily sickness no great injury could arise for though we were not diseased yet death would in any case come and destroy and dissolve the body but everything depends upon the health of our souls this being by far the more precious and necessary he hath made the medicine of it easy and void of expense or pain what excuse therefore or what pardon shall we obtain if when the body is sick and money must be expended on its behalf the physicians called in and much anguish endured we make this so much a matter of our care though what might result from that sickness could be no great injury to us and yet treat the soul with neglect and this when we are neither called upon to pay down money nor to give others any trouble nor to sustain any sufferings but without any of all these things by only choosing and willing have it in our power to accomplish the entire amendment of it and knowing assuredly that if we fail to do this we shall sustain the extreme sentence and punishments and penalties which are inexorable for tell me if any one promise to teach thee the healing art in a short space of time without money or labor wouldst thou not think him a benefactor wouldst thou not submit both to do and to suffer all things whatsoever he who promised these things commanded behold now it is permitted thee without labor to find a medicine for wounds not of the body but of the soul and to restore it to a state of health without any suffering let us not be indifferent to the matter for pray what is the pain of laying aside anger against one who hath aggrieved thee it is a pain indeed to remember injuries and not to be reconciled what labor is it to pray and to ask for a thousand good things from god who is ready to give what labor is it not to speak evil of any one what difficulty is there in being delivered from envy and ill will what trouble is it to love one's neighbor what suffering is it not to utter shameful words nor to revile nor to insult another 
what fatigue is it not to swear for again i return to this same admonition the labor of swearing is indeed exceedingly great oftentimes whilst under the influence of anger or wrath we have sworn perhaps that we would never be reconciled to those who have injured us i am now for the sixth day admonishing you in respect of this precept henceforth i am desirous to take leave of you meaning to abstain from the subject that ye may be on your guard there will no longer be any excuse or allowance for you for of right indeed if nothing had been said on this matter it ought to have been amended of yourselves for it is not a thing of an intricate nature or that requires great preparation but since ye have enjoyed the advantage of so much admonition and counsel what excuse will ye have to offer when ye stand accused before that dread tribunal and are required to give account of this transgression it is impossible to invent any excuse but of necessity you must either go hence amended or if you have not amended be punished and abide the extremest penalty thinking therefore upon all these things and departing hence with much anxiety about them exhort ye one another that the things spoken of during so many days may be kept with all watchfulness in your minds so that whilst we are silent ye instructing edifying exhorting one another may exhibit great improvement and having fulfilled all the other precepts may enjoy eternal crowns which god grant we may all obtain through the grace and knowledge of our lord jesus christ in the section eighteen section twenty of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by colleen mcmahon library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine section twenty of the offices of literature and poetry from the oration for the poet archaeus and honors proposed for the dead statesman sulpicius from the ninth philippic by cicero of the offices of literature and poetry from the oration for the poet archaeus you ask us o gratius why we are so exceedingly attached to this man because he supplies us with food whereby our mind is refreshed after this noise in the forum and with rest for our ears after they have been wearied with bad language do you think it possible that we could find a supply for our daily speeches when discussing such a variety of matters unless we were to cultivate our minds by the study of literature or that our minds could bear being kept so constantly on the stretch if we did not relax them by that same study but i confess that i am devoted to those studies let others be ashamed of them if they have buried themselves in books without being able to produce anything out of them for the common advantage or anything which may bear the eyes of men and the light but why need i be ashamed who for many years have lived in such a manner as never to allow my own love of tranquillity to deny me to the necessity or advantage of another or my fondness for pleasure to distract or even sleep to delay my attention to such claims who then can reproach me or who has any right to be angry with me if i allow myself as much time for the cultivation of these studies as some take for the performance of their own business or for celebrating days of festival and games or for other pleasures or even for the rest and refreshment of mind and body or as others devote to early banquets to playing at dice or at ball and this ought to be permitted to me because by these studies my power of speaking and those faculties are improved which as far as they do exist in me have never been denied to my friends when they have been in peril and if that ability appears to any one to be but moderate at all events i know whence i derive those principles which are of the greatest value for if i had not persuaded myself from my youth upwards both by the precepts of many masters and by much reading that there is nothing in life greatly to be desired except praise and honour and that while pursuing those things all tortures of the body all dangers of death and banishment are to be considered but of small importance 
I should never have exposed myself in defense of your safety to such numerous and arduous contests and to these daily attacks of profligate men. But all books are full of such precepts, and all the sayings of philosophers and all antiquity are full of precedents teaching the same lesson. But all these things would lie buried in darkness if the light of literature and learning were not applied to them. How many images of the bravest men, carefully elaborated, have both the Greek and Latin writers bequeathed to us, not merely for us to look at and gaze upon, but also for our imitation? And I, always keeping them before my eyes as examples for my own public conduct, have endeavored to model my mind and views by continually thinking of those excellent men. Some one will ask, what? Were those identical great men, whose virtues have been recorded in books, accomplished in all that learning which you are extolling so highly? It is difficult to assert this of all of them, but still I know what answer I can make to that question. I admit that many men have existed, of admirable disposition and virtue, who, without learning, by the almost divine instinct of their own mere nature, have been, of their own accord as it were, moderate and wise men. I even add this, that very often nature without learning has had more to do with leading men to credit and to virtue than learning when not assisted by a good natural disposition. And I also contend that when to an excellent and admirable natural disposition there is added a certain system and training of education, then from that combination arises an extraordinary perfection of character, such as is seen in that godlike man whom our fathers saw in their time, Africanus, and in Caius Lelius and Lucius Furius, most virtuous and moderate men, and in that most excellent man, the most learned man of his time, Marcus Cato the Elder. And all these men, if they had been to derive no assistance from literature in the cultivation and practice of virtue, would never have applied themselves to the study of it. Though even if there were no such great advantage to be reaped from it, and if it were only pleasure that is sought from these studies, still I imagine you would consider it a most reasonable and liberal employment of the mind. For other occupations are not suited to every time, nor to every age or place, but these studies are the food of youth, the delight of old age, the ornament of prosperity, the refuge and comfort of adversity, a delight at home, and no hindrance abroad. They are companions by night, and in travel, and in the country. And if we ourselves were not able to arrive at these advantages, nor even taste them with our senses, Still, we ought to admire them even when we saw them in others, and indeed we have constantly heard from men of the greatest eminence and learning that the study of other sciences was made up of learning and rules and regular method, but that a poet was such by the unassisted work of nature, and was moved by the vigor of his own mind, and was inspired, as it were, by some divine wrath. Wherefore rightly does our own great Aeneas call poets holy, because they seem to be recommended to us by some especial gift, as it were, and liberality of the gods. Let, then, judges, this name of poet, this name which no barbarians even have ever disregarded, be holy in your eyes, men of cultivated minds as you all are. Rocks and deserts reply to the poet's voice. Savage beasts are often moved and arrested by song. And shall we who have been trained in the pursuit of the most virtuous acts refuse to be swayed by the voice of poets? The Colophonians say that Homer was their citizen, the Cayennes claim him as theirs, the Salaminians assert their right to him, but the men of Smyrna loudly assert him to be a citizen of Smyrna, and they have even raised a temple to him in their city. Many other places also fight with one another for the honor of being his birthplace. They then claim a stranger, even after his death, because he was a poet. Shall we reject this man while he is alive? A man who, by his own inclination and by our laws, does actually belong to us? Especially when Archaeus has employed all his genius with the utmost zeal in celebrating the glory and renown of the Roman people? For when a young man he touched on our wars against the Cimbri, and gained the favor even of Caius Marius himself, a man who was tolerably proof against this sort of study. For there was no one so disinclined to the muses as not willingly to endure that the praise of his labors should be made immortal by means of verse. They say that the great Themistocles, the greatest man that Athens produced, 
said when someone asked him what sound or whose voice he took the greatest delight in hearing, the voice of that by whom his own exploits were best celebrated. Therefore the great Marius was also exceedingly attached to Lucius Plosius, because he thought that the achievement which he had performed could be celebrated by his genius. And the whole Mithridatic War, great and difficult as it was, and carried on with so much diversity of fortune by land and sea, has been related at length by him, and the books in which that is sung of not only make illustrious Lucius Lucullus that most gallant and celebrated man, but they do honor also to the Roman people. For while Lucullus was general, the Roman people opened Pontus, though it was defended both by the resources of the king and by the character of the country itself. Under the same general, the army of the Roman people, with no very great numbers, routed the countless hosts of the Armenians. It is the glory of the Roman people that by the wisdom of that same general, the city of the Cyzacenes, most friendly to us, was delivered and preserved from all the attacks of the kind, and from the very jaws, as it were, of the whole war. Ours is the glory which will be forever celebrated, which is derived from the fleet of the enemy, which was sunk after its admirals had been slain, and from the marvelous naval battle off Tenedos. Those trophies belong to us, those monuments are ours, those triumphs are ours. Therefore I say that the men by whose genius these exploits are celebrated make illustrious at the same time the glory of the Roman people. Our countryman Aeneas was dear to the elder Africanus, and even on the tomb of the Scipios his effigy is believed to be visible carved in the marble. But undoubtedly it is not only the men who are themselves praised who are done honor to by these praises but the name of the Roman people also is adorned by them. Cato, the ancestor of this Cato, is extolled to the skies. Great honor is paid to the exploits of the Roman people. Lastly, all those great men, the Maximi, the Marcelli, and the Fulvi, are done honor to, not without, all of us having also a share in the panegyric. Certainly, if the mind had no anticipations of posterity, and if it were to confine all its thoughts within the same limits as those by which the space of our lives is bounded, it would neither break itself with such severe labors, nor would it be tormented with such cares and sleepless anxiety, nor would it so often have to fight for its very life. At present there is a certain virtue in every good man, which night and day stirs up the mind with the stimulus of glory and reminds it that all mention of our name will not cease at the same time with our lives, but that our fame will endure to all posterity. Do we all who are occupied in the affairs of the state, and who are surrounded by such perils and dangers in life, appear to be so narrow-minded as, though to the last moment of our lives we have never passed one tranquil or easy moment, to think that everything will perish at the same time as ourselves? Ought we not, when many most illustrious men have with great care collected and left behind them statues and images, representations not of their minds but of their bodies, much more to desire to leave behind us a copy of our counsels and of our virtues, wrought and elaborated by the greatest genius? I thought at the very moment of performing them that I was scattering and disseminating all the deeds which I was performing, all over the world, for the eternal recollection of nations and whether that delight is to be denied to my soul after death, or whether, as the wisest men have thought, it will affect some portion of my spirit, at all events I am at present delighted with some such idea and hope. Honors proposed for the dead statesman Sulpicius, from the ninth Philippic. Our ancestors indeed decreed statues to many men, public sepulchres to few, but statues perish by weather, by violence, by lapse of time. The sanctity of the sepulchres is in the soil itself, which can neither be moved nor destroyed by any violence, and while other things are extinguished, so sepulchres become holier by age. Let then this man be distinguished by that honor also, a man to whom no honor can be given which is not deserved. Let us be grateful in paying respect in death to him to whom we can now show no other gratitude, and by that same step let the audacity of Marcus Antonius, waging a nefarious war, be branded with infamy. For when these honors have been paid to Servius Sulpicius, the evidence of his embassy having been insulted and rejected by Antonius will remain for everlasting. 
on which account I give my vote for a decree in this form, as Servius Sulpicius Rufus, the son of Quintus, of the Lemonian tribe, at a most critical period of the Republic, and being ill with a very serious and dangerous disease, preferred the authority of the Senate and the safety of the Republic to his own life, and struggled against the violence and severity of his illness, in order to arrive at the camp of Antonius, to which the Senate had sent him, and as he, when he had almost arrived at the camp, being overwhelmed by the violence of the disease, has lost his life in discharging a most important office of the Republic, and as his death has been in strict correspondence to a life passed with the greatest integrity and honor, during which he, Servius Sulpicius, has often been of great service to the Republic, both as a private individual and in the discharge of various magistracies, and as he, being such a man, has encountered death on behalf of the Republic while employed on an embassy, the Senate decrees that a brazen pedestrian statue of Servius Sulpicius be erected in the rostra in compliance with the resolution of this order, and that his children and posterity shall have a place round this statue of five feet in every direction, from which to behold the games and gladiatorial combats, because he died in the cause of the Republic, and that this reason be inscribed on the pedestal of this statue, and that Caius Pansa and Aulus Hirsius, the consuls, one or both of them, if it seem good to them, shall command the quaestors of the city to let out a contract for making that pedestal and that statue, and erecting them in the rostra, and that whatever price they contract for, they shall take care the amount is given and paid to the contractor. And as in old times the Senate has exerted its authority with respect to the obsequies of, and honors paid to brave men, it now decrees that he shall be carried to the tomb on the day of his funeral with the greatest possible solemnity. And as Servius Sulpicius Rufus, the son of Quintus of the Lemonian tribe, has deserved so well the Republic as to be entitled to be complimented with all those distinctions, the Senate is of the opinion, and thinks it for the advantage of the Republic, that the curule et aisle should suspend the edict which usually prevails with respect to funerals, in the case of the funeral of Servius Sulpicius Rufus, the son of Quintus of the Lemonian tribe, and that Caius Panza, the consul, shall assign him a place for a tomb in the Esquiline Plain, or in whatever place shall seem good to him, extending thirty feet in every direction, where Servius Sulpicius may be buried, and that that shall be his tomb, and that of his children and posterity, as having been a tomb most deservedly given to them by the public authority. End of section 20. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 21 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 21. Selected Excerpts from the Dialogues of Cicero. Old Friends Better Than New, from the Dialogue on Friendship. But there arises on this subject a somewhat difficult question, whether ever new friends, if deserving friendship, are to be preferred to old ones, just as we are wont to prefer young colts to old horses, a perplexity unworthy of a man, for there ought to be no satiety of friendship as of other things. Everything which is oldest, as those wines which bear age well, ought to be sweetest. And that is true which is sometimes said, many bushels of salt must be eaten together, before the duty of friendship can be fulfilled. But new friendships, if they afford a hope that, as in the case of plants which never disappoint, fruits shall appear, such are not to be rejected. Yet the old one must be preserved in its proper place, for the power of age and custom is exceedingly great. Besides, in the very case of the horse which I just mentioned, if there is no impediment, there is no one who does not more pleasurably use that to which he is accustomed, than one unbroken and strange to him. And habit asserts its power, and habit prevails, not only in the case of this, which is animate, but also in the cases of those things which are inanimate since we take delight in the very mountainous or woody scenery among which we have long dwelt. 
Honored Old Age, from The Dialogue on Old Age. But in my whole discourse, remember that I am praising that old age which is established on the foundations of youth, from which this is effected, which I once asserted with the great approbation of all present, that wretched was the old age which had to defend itself by speaking. Neither gray hairs nor wrinkles can suddenly catch respect, but the former part of life honorably spent reaps the fruits of authority at the close. For these very observances, which seem light and common, are marks of honor. To be saluted, to be sought after, to receive precedence, to have persons rising up to you, to be attended on the way, to be escorted home, to be consulted, points which, both among us and in other states, in proportion as they are the most excellent in their morals, are the most scrupulously observed. They say that Lysander the Lacedaemonian, whom I mentioned a little above, was accustomed to remark that Lacedaemon was the most honorable abode for old age, for nowhere is so much conceded to that time of life, nowhere is old age more respected. Nay, further, it is recorded that when at Athens during the games a certain elderly person had entered the theatre, a place was nowhere offered him in that large assembly by his own townsmen. But when he had approached the Lacedaemonians, who, as they were ambassadors, had taken their seats together in a particular place, they all rose up and invited the old man to a seat, and when reiterated applause had been bestowed upon them by the whole assembly, one of them remarked that the Athenians knew what was right, but were unwilling to do it. There are many excellent rules in our college, but this of which I am treating especially, that in proportion as each man has taken the advantage in age, so he takes precedence in giving his opinion, and older augurs are preferred not only to those who are higher in office, but even to such as are in actual command. What pleasures, then, of the body can be compared with the privileges of authority, which they who have nobly employed seem to me to have consummated the drama of life, and not like inexpert performers to have broken down in the last act? Still, old men are peevish and fretful, and passionate and unmanageable, nay, if we seek for such, also covetous. But these are the faults of their characters, not of their old age. And yet, that peevishness and those faults which I have mentioned have some excuse, not quite satisfactory indeed, but such as may be admitted. They fancy that they are neglected, despised, made a jest of. Besides, in a weak state of body, every offense is irritating. All which defects, however, are extenuated by good dispositions and qualities. And this may be discovered not only in real life, but on the stage, from the two brothers that are represented in The Brothers, how much austerity in the one, and how much gentleness in the other. Such is the fact, for as it is not every wine, so it is not every man's life that grows sour from old age. I approve of gravity in old age, but this in a moderate degree, like everything else, harshness by no means. What avarice in an old man can propose to itself I cannot conceive, for can anything be more absurd than in proportion as less of our journey remains to seek a greater supply of provisions? Death is welcome to the old. From the Dialogue on Old Age An old man indeed has nothing to hope for, yet he is in so much the happier state than a young one, since he has already attained what the other is only hoping for. The one is wishing to live long, the other has lived long. And yet, good gods, what is there in man's life that can be called long? For allow the latest period, let us anticipate the age of the kings of the Tartessi. For there dwelt, as I find it recorded, a man named Arganthonius Agatis, who reigned for eighty years and lived one hundred and twenty. But to my mind, nothing whatever seems of long duration, in which there is any end, for when that arrives, then the time which has passed has flowed away. That only remains which you have secured by virtue and right conduct. Hours indeed depart from us, and days, and months, and years. Nor does past time ever return, nor can it be discovered what is to follow. Whatever time is assigned to each to live, with that he ought to be content. For neither need the drama be performed entire by the actor in order to give satisfaction provided he be approved in whatever act he may be, nor need the wise man live till the plaudite, for the short period of life is long enough for living well and honorably. And if you should advance further, you need no more grieve than farmers do when the loveliness of springtime hath passed, that summer and autumn have come. 
for spring represents the time of youth and gives promise of the future fruits the remaining seasons are intended for plucking and gathering in those fruits now the harvest of old age as i have often said is the recollection and abundance of blessings previously secured in truth everything that happens agreeably to nature is to be reckoned among blessings what however is so agreeable to nature as for an old man to die which even is the lot of the young though nature opposes and resists and thus it is that young men seem to me to die just as when the violence of flame is extinguished by a flood of water whereas old men die as the exhausted fire goes out spontaneously without the exertion of any force and as fruits when they are green are plucked by force from the trees but when ripe and mellow drop off so violence takes away their lives from youths maturity from old men a state which to me indeed is so delightful that the nearer i approach to death i seem as if it were to be getting sight of land and at length after a long voyage to be just coming into harbour great orators and their training from the dialogue on oratory for who can suppose that amid the great multitude of students the utmost abundance of masters the most eminent geniuses among men the infinite variety of causes the most ample rewards offered to eloquence there is any other reason to be found for the small number of orators than the incredible magnitude and difficulty of the art a knowledge of a vast number of things is necessary without which volubility of words is empty and ridiculous speech itself is to be formed not merely by choice but by careful construction of words and all the emotions of the mind which nature has given to man must be intimately known for all the force and art of speaking must be employed in allaying or exciting the feelings of those who listen to this must be added a certain portion of grace and wit learning worthy of a well-bred man and quickness and brevity in replying as well as attacking accompanied with a refined decorum and urbanity besides the whole of antiquity and a multitude of examples is to be kept in the memory nor is the knowledge of laws in general or of the civil law in particular to be neglected and why need i add any remarks on delivery itself which is to be ordered by action of body by gesture by look and by modulation and variation of the voice the great power of which alone and in itself the comparatively trivial art of actors and the stage proves on which though all bestow their utmost labor to form their look voice and gesture who knows not how few there are and have ever been to whom we can attend with patience what can i say of that repository for all things the memory which unless it be made the keeper of the matter and words that are the fruits of thought and invention all the talents of the orator we see though they be of the highest degree of excellence will be of no avail let us then cease to wonder what is the cause of the scarcity of good speakers since eloquence results from all those qualifications in each of which singly it is a great merit to labor successfully and let us rather exhort our children and others whose glory and honor is dear to us to contemplate in their minds the full magnitude of the object and not to trust that they can reach the height at which they aim by the aid of the precepts masters and exercises that they are all now following but to understand that they must adopt others of a different character in my opinion indeed no man can be an orator possessed of every praiseworthy accomplishment unless he has attained the knowledge of everything important and of all liberal arts for his language must be ornate and copious from knowledge since unless there be beneath the surface matter understood and felt by the speaker oratory becomes an empty and almost puerile flow of words i am then of opinion said crassus that nature and genius in the first place contribute most aid to speaking and that to those writers on the art to whom antoninus just now alluded it was not skill and method in speaking but natural talent that was wanting for there ought to be certain lively powers in the mind and understanding which may be acute to invent fertile to explain and adorn and strong and retentive to remember and if any one imagines that these powers may be acquired by art which is false for it is very well if they can be animated and excited by art but they certainly cannot by art be engrafted or instilled since they are all the gifts of nature what will he say of those qualities which are certainly born with the man himself volubility of tongue tone of voice strength of lungs 
and the peculiar conformation and aspect of the whole countenance and body. I do not say that art cannot improve in these particulars, for I am not ignorant that what is good may be made better by education, and what is not very good may be in some degree polished and amended. But there are some persons so hesitating in their speech, so inharmonious in their tone of voice, or so unwieldy and rude in the air and movements of their bodies, that whatever power they possess, either from genius or art, they can never be reckoned in the number of accomplished speakers. While there are others so happily qualified in these respects, so eminently adorned with the gifts of nature, that they seem not to have been born like other men, but molded by some divinity. It is indeed a great task and enterprise for a person to undertake and profess that while everyone else is silent, he alone must be heard on the most important subjects and in a large assembly of men, for there is scarcely any one present who is not sharper and quicker to discover defects in the speaker than merits. And thus whatever offends the hearer effaces the recollection of what is worthy of praise. I do not make these observations for the purpose of altogether deterring young men from the study of oratory, even if they be deficient in some natural endowments. For who does not perceive that to see Calius, my contemporary, a new man, the mere mediocrity in speaking which he was enabled to attain was a great honor. Who does not know that Q. Varius, your equal in age, a clumsy, uncouth man, has obtained his great popularity by the cultivation of such faculties as he has? But as our inquiry regards the complete orator, we must imagine in our discussion an orator from whom every kind of fault is abstracted, and who is adorned with every kind of merit. For if the multitude of suits, if the variety of causes, if the rabble and barbarism of the forum afford room for even the most wretched speakers, we must not, for that reason, take our eyes from the object of our inquiry. In those arts in which it is not indispensable usefulness that is sought, but liberal amusement for the mind, how nicely, how almost fastidiously do we judge. For there are no suits or controversies which can force men though they may tolerate indifferent orators in the forum, to endure also bad actors upon the stage. The orator, therefore, must take the most studious precaution not merely to satisfy those whom he necessarily must satisfy, but to seem worthy of admiration to those who are at liberty to judge disinterestedly. If you would know what I myself think, I will express to you, my intimate friends, what I have hitherto never mentioned, and thought that I never should mention. To me, those who speak best, and speak with the utmost ease and grace, appear, if they do not commence their speeches with some timidity, and show some confusion in the exordium, to have almost lost the sense of shame, though it is impossible that such should not be the case. For the better qualified a man is to speak, the more he fears the difficulties of speaking, the uncertain success of a speech, and the expectation of the audience. But he who can produce and deliver nothing worthy of his subject, nothing worthy of the name of an orator, nothing worthy the attention of his audience, seems to me, though he be ever so confused while he is speaking, to be downright shameless. For we ought to avoid a character for shamelessness, not by testifying shame, but by not doing that which does not become us. But the speaker who has no shame, as I see to be the case with many, I regard as deserving not only of a rebuke, but of personal castigation. Indeed, what I often observe in you, I very frequently experience in myself, that I turn pale in the outset of my speech, and feel a tremor through my whole thoughts, as it were, and limbs. When I was a young man, I was on one occasion so timid in commencing an accusation, that I owed to Q. Maximus the greatest of obligations for immediately dismissing the assembly as soon as he saw me absolutely disheartened and incapacitated through fear. Here they all signified assent, looked significantly at one another, and began to talk together, for there was a wonderful modesty in Crassus, which, however, was not only no disadvantage to his oratory, but even an assistance to it, by giving it the recommendation of probity. End of section 21 Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 22 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. Section 22. Selected Epistles by Cicero. Cicero to Tyro. The following epistles are taken by permission from Jeans's Letters of Cicero. This letter gives a vivid glimpse of Cicero's tenderness to his slaves and freedmen. Tyro was probably the first editor of his former master's letters. Egypta arrived here on the 12th of April. Although he reported that you were now quite rid of your fever and going on very well, he nevertheless caused me some anxiety by his report that you were not able to write to me, the more so because Hermia, who ought to have been here on the same day, has not yet come. I am more anxious than you can believe about your health. Only free me from this anxiety, and I will free you from all duties. I would write you more if I thought you could now read more with pleasure. Use all the talents you possess, of which I have no small opinion, to keep yourself safe for my sake as well as your own. Again and again I repeat, take every precaution about your health. Goodbye. P.S. Hermia is just come. I have your note with its poor, weak handwriting. No wonder, too, after so severe an illness. I sent out Egypta to stay with you because he is not a bad companion, and appeared to me to be fond of you, and with him a cook for you to make use of his services. Goodbye. Cicero to Atticus The family affection of Cicero might be illustrated by many such letters as the following. It being now eleven days since I left you, I am scrawling this little bit of a note just as I am leaving my country house before it is light. I think of being at my place at Inagnia today and Tusculum tomorrow, only one day there, so that I shall come up all right to time on the 28th. And oh, if I could but run on at once to embrace my Tolia and give Attica a kiss. Talking of this, by the by, do please write and let me know while I am stopping at Tusculum what her prattle is like or, if she is away in the country, what her letters to you are about. Meanwhile, either send or give her my love, and Pilia too. And even though we shall meet immediately, yet will you write to me anything you can find to say? P.S. I was just fastening up this letter, but your courier has arrived here after a long night journey with your letter. I was very sorry, you may be sure, to find on reading it that Attica is feverish. Everything else that I was waiting for I now know from your note. But when you tell me that to have a little fire in the morning sent la vie le lard, I retort, il est sent plus, for one's poor old memory to begin to totter, because it was the twenty-ninth I had promised to Axius, the thirtieth to you, and the day of my arrival, the thirty-first, to Quintus. So take that for yourself, you shall have no news. Then what on earth is the good of writing, and what good is it when we are together and chatter whatever comes to our tongues? Surely there is something in causury after all. Even if there is nothing under it, there is always at least the delicious feeling that we are talking with one another. Sulpicius consoles Cicero after his daughter Tullia's death. For some time after I had received the information of the death of your daughter Tullia, you may be sure that I bore it sadly and heavily, as much indeed as was right for me. I felt that I shared that terrible loss with you, and that had I but been where you are, you on your part would not have found me neglectful, and I on mine should not have failed to come to you and tell you myself how deeply grieved I am. And, though it is true that consolations of this nature are painful and distressing, because those dear friends and relations upon whom the task naturally devolves are themselves afflicted with a similar burden, and incapable even of attempting it without many tears, so that one would rather suppose them in need of the consolations of others for themselves than capable of doing this kind office to others. Yet nevertheless, I have decided to write to you briefly such reflections as have occurred to me on the present occasion. Not that I imagine them to be ignored by you, but because it is possible that you may be hindered by your sorrow from seeing them as clearly as usual. What reason is there why you should allow the private grief which has befallen you to distress you so terribly? Recollect how fortune has hitherto dealt with us, how we have been bereft of all that ought to be no less dear to men than their own children, of country, position, rank, and every honorable office. If one more burden has now been laid upon you, could any addition be made to your pain? Or is there any heart that, having been trained in the school of such events, 
ought not now to be steeled by use against emotion and think everything after them to be comparatively light or is it for her sake i suppose that you are grieving how many times must you have arrived at the same conclusion as that into which i too have frequently fallen that in these days theirs is not the hardest lot who are permitted painlessly to exchange their life for the grave now what was there at the present time that could attach her very strongly to life what hope what fruition what consolation for the soul the prospect of a wedded life with the husband chosen from our young men of rank truly one would think it was always in your power to choose a son-in-law of a position suitable to your rank out of our young men one to whose keeping you would feel you could safely entrust the happiness of a child or that of being a joyful mother of children who would be happy in seeing them succeeding in life able by their own exertions to maintain in its integrity all that was bequeathed to them by their father intending gradually to rise to all the highest offices of the state and to use that liberty to which they were born for the good of their country and the service of their friends is there any one of these things that has not been taken away before it was given but surely it is hard to give up one's children it is hard but this is harder still that they should bear and suffer what we are doing a circumstance which was such as to afford me no light consolation i cannot but mention to you in the hope that it may be allowed to contribute equally towards mitigating your grief as i was returning from asia when sailing from aegina in the direction of megara i began to look around me at the various places by which i was surrounded behind me was aegina in front megara on the right the piraeus on the left corinth all of them towns that in former days were most magnificent but are now lying prostrate and in ruins before one's eyes ah me i began to reflect to myself we poor feeble mortals who can claim but a short life in comparison complain as though a wrong was done us if one of our number dies in the course of nature or has met his death by violence and here in one spot are lying stretched out before me the corpses of so many cities servius be master of yourself and remember that it is the lot of men to which you have been born believe me i found myself in no small degree strengthened by these reflections let me advise you too if you think good to keep this reflection before your eyes how lately at one and the same time have many of our most illustrious men fallen how grave an encroachment has been made on the rights of the sovereign people of rome every province in the world has been convulsed with the shock if the frail life of a tender woman has gone too who being born to the common lot of man must needs have died in a few short years even if the time had not come for her now are you thus utterly stricken down do you then also recall your feelings and your thoughts from dwelling on this subject and as beseems your character bethink yourself rather of this that she has lived as long as life was of value to her that she has passed away only together with her country's freedom that she lived to see her father elected praetor consul augur that she had been the wife of young men of the first rank that after enjoying well nigh every blessing that life can offer she left it only when the republic itself was falling the account is closed and what have you what has she to charge of injustice against fate in a word forget not that you are cicero that you are he who was always wont to guide others and give them good advice and be not like those quack physicians who when others are sick boast that they hold the key of the knowledge of medicine to heal themselves are never able but rather minister to yourself with your own hand the remedies which you are in the habit of prescribing for others and put them plainly before your own soul there is no pain so great but the lapse of time will lessen and assuage it it is not like yourself to wait until this time comes instead of stepping forward by your philosophy to anticipate that result and if even those who are low in the grave have any consciousness at all such was her love for you and her tenderness for all around her that surely she does not wish to see this in you make this a tribute then to her who is dead to all your friends and relations who are mourning in your grief and make it to your country also that if in anything the need should arise she may be able to trust to your energy and guidance finally since such is the condition we have come to that even this consideration must perforce be obeyed do not let your conduct induce any one to believe that it is not so much your daughter as the circumstances of the republic and the victory of others which you are deploring 
I shrink from writing to you at greater length upon this subject, lest I should seem to be doubtful of your own good sense. Allow me, therefore, to put before you one more consideration, and then I will bring my letter to a close. We have seen you not once, but many times, bearing prosperity most gracefully, and gaining yourself great reputation thereby. Let us see at last that you are capable also of bearing adversity equally well, and that it is not in your eyes a heavier burden than it ought to seem, lest we should think that of all the virtues this is the only one in which you are wanting. As for myself, when I find you are more composed in mind, I will send you information about all that is being done in these parts, and the state in which the province finds itself at present. Farewell. Cicero's reply to Sulpicius. Yes, my dear Servius, I could indeed wish you had been with me, as you say, at the time of my terrible trial. How much it was in your power to help me if you had been here, by sympathizing with, and, I may almost say, sharing equally in my grief, I readily perceive from the fact that after reading your letter I now feel myself considerably more composed. For not only was all that you wrote just what is best calculated to soothe affliction, but you yourself, in comforting me, showed that you too had no little pain at heart. Your son Servius, however, has made it clear, by every kindly attention which such an occasion would permit of, both how great his respect was for myself, and also how much pleasure his kind feeling for me was likely to give you. And you may be sure that while such attentions from him have often been more pleasant to me, they have never made me more grateful." It is not, however, only your arguments and your equal share, I may almost call it, in this affliction which comforts me, but also your authority, because I hold it shame in me not to be bearing my trouble in a way that you, a man endowed with such wisdom, think it ought to be borne. But at times I do feel broken down, and I scarcely make any struggle against my grief, because those consolations fail me which under similar calamities were never wanting to any of those other people whom I put before myself as models for imitation. Both Fabius Maximus, for example, when he lost a son who had held the consulship, the hero of many a famous exploit, and Lucius Paulus, from whom two were taken in one week, and your own kinsman Gallus, and Marcus Cato, who was deprived of a son of the rarest talents and the rarest virtue, all these lived in times when their individual affliction was capable of finding a solace in the distinctions they used to earn from their country. For me, however, after being stripped of all those distinctions which you yourself recall to me, and which I had won for myself by unparalleled exertions, only that one solace remained which has been torn away. My thoughts were not diverted by work for my friends or by the administration of affairs of state. There was no pleasure in pleading in the courts. I could not bear the very sight of the Senate House. I felt, as was indeed too true, that I had lost all the harvest of both my industry and my success. But whenever I wanted to recollect that all this was shared with you and other friends I could name, and whenever I was breaking myself in and forcing my spirit to bear these things with patience, I always had a refuge to go to where I might find peace, and in whose words of comfort and sweet society I could rid me of all my pains and griefs. Whereas now, under this terrible blow, even those old wounds which seem to have healed up are bleeding afresh, for it is impossible for me now to find such a refuge from my sorrows at home in the business of the state, as in those days I did in that consolation of home, which was always in store whenever I came away sad from thoughts of state to seek for peace in her happiness. And so I stay away both from home and from public life because home now is no more able to make up for the sorrow I feel when I think of our country, than our country is for my sorrow at home. I am therefore looking forward all the more eagerly to your coming, and long to see you as early as that may possibly be. No greater alleviation can be offered me than a meeting between us for friendly intercourse and conversation. I hope, however, that your return is to take place, as I hear it is, very shortly. As for myself, while there are abundant reasons for wanting to see you as soon as possible, my principal one is in order that we may discuss together beforehand the best method of conduct for the present circumstances, which must entirely be adapted to the wishes of one man only, a man nevertheless who is far-seeing and generous, and also, as I think I have thoroughly ascertained, to me not at all ill-disposed, and to you extremely friendly. 
But admitting this, it is still a matter for much deliberation, what is the line, I do not say of action, but of keeping quiet, that we ought by his good leave and favor to adopt. Farewell. Homesick Exile I send this with love, my dearest Terentia, hoping that you and my little Tullia and my Marcus are all well. From the letters of several people and the talk of everybody, I hear that your courage and endurance are simply wonderful, and that no troubles of body or mind can exhaust your energy. How unhappy I am to think that with all your courage and devotion, your virtues and gentleness, you should have fallen into such misfortunes for me, and my sweet Tolia too, that she who was once so proud of her father should have to undergo such troubles owing to him. And what shall I say about my boy Marcus, who ever since his faculties of perception awoke has felt the sharpest pangs of sorrow and misery? Now could I but think, as you tell me, that all this comes in the natural course of things, I could bear it a little easier. But it has been brought about entirely by my own fault, for thinking myself loved by those who were jealous of me, and turning from those who wanted to win me. I have thanked the people you wanted me to, and mentioned that my information came from you. As to the block of houses which you tell me you mean to sell, why, good heavens, my dear Terencia, what is to be done? Oh, what troubles I have to bear! And if misfortune continues to persecute us, what will become of our poor boy? I cannot continue to write. My tears are too much for me nor would I wish to betray you into the same emotion. All I can say is that if our friends act up to their bounden duty, we shall not want for money. If they do not, you will not be able to succeed only with your own. Let our unhappy fortunes, I entreat you, be a warning to us not to ruin our boy, who is ruined enough already. If he only has something to save him from absolute want, a fair share of talent and a fair share of luck will be all that is necessary to win anything else. Do not neglect your health, and send me messengers with letters to let me know what goes on, and how you yourselves are faring. My suspense in any case cannot now be long. Give my love to my little Tullia and my Marcus. Dirachium, November 26th. P.S. I have moved to Dirachium because it is not only a free city, but very much in my interest, and quite near to Italy but if the bustle of the place proves an annoyance, I shall betake myself elsewhere and give you notice. Cicero's Vacillation in the Civil War Being in extreme agitation about these great and terrible events, and having no means of discussing matters with you in person, I want at any rate to avail myself of your judgment. Now, the question about which I am in doubt is simply this. If Pompeius should fly from Italy, which I suspect he will do, how do you think I ought to act? To make it easier for you to advise me, I will briefly set forth the arguments that occur to me on both sides of the question. The obligations that Pompeius laid me under in the matter of my restoration, my own intimacy with him, and also my patriotism, incline me to think that I ought to make my decision as his decision, or, in other words, my fortunes as his fortunes. There is this reason also. If I stay behind and desert my post among that band of true and illustrious patriots, I must perforce fall completely under the yoke of one man. Now, although he frequently takes occasion to show himself friendly to me, indeed, as you well know, anticipating this storm that is now hanging over our heads, I took good care that he should be so long ago. Still, I have to consider two different questions. First, how far can I trust him? And secondly, assuming it to be absolutely certain that he is friendly disposed to me, would it show the brave man or the honest citizen to remain in a city where one has filled the highest offices of peace and war, achieved immortal deeds, and been crowned with the honors of her most dignified priesthood, only to become an empty name and undergo some risk, attended also very likely with considerable disgrace, should Pompeius ever again grasp the helm? So much for this side. See now what may be said on the other. Pompeius has in our cause done nothing wisely, nothing strongly, nothing, I may add, that has not been contrary to my opinion and advice. I pass over those old complaints, that it was he who himself nourished this enemy of the Republic, gave him his honors, put the sword into his hand, that it was he who advised him to force laws through by violence, trampling on the warnings of religion, that it was he who made the addition of Transalpine Gaul, 
he who is his son-in-law, he who is augur allowed the adoption of Clodius, who showed more activity in recalling me than in preventing my exile, who took it on him to extend Caesar's term of government, who supported all his proceedings while he was away, that he, too, even in his third consulship, after he had begun to pose as a defender of the Constitution, actually exerted himself to get the ten tribunes to propose that absence should not invalidate the election. Nay, more, he expressly sanctioned this by one of his own acts, and opposed the consul, Marcus Marcellus, who proposed that the tenure of the Gallic provinces should come to an end on the 1st of March. But anyhow, to pass over all this, what could be more discreditable, what more blundering, than this evacuation of the city, or, I had better say, this ignominious flight? What terms ought not to have been accepted sooner than abandon our country? The terms were bad? That I allow. But is anything worse than this? But he will win back the Constitution? When? What preparations have been made to warrant such a hope? Have we not lost all Picanum? Have we not left open the road to the capital? Have we not abandoned the whole of our treasure, public and private, to the foe? In a word, there is no common cause, no strength, no center to draw such people together as might yet care to show fight for the Republic. Apulia has been chosen, the most thinly populated part of Italy, and the most remote from the line of movement of this war. It would seem that in despair they were looking for flight, with some easy access to the coast. I took the charge of Capua much against my will, not that I would evade that duty, but in a cause which evoked no sympathy from any class as a whole, nor any openly even from individuals. There was some, of course, among the good citizens, but as languid as usual. And where I saw for myself that the mass of the people, and all the lowest stratum, were more and more inclined to the other side, many even longing for a revolution, I told him to his face I would undertake to do nothing without forces and without money. Consequently, I have had no responsibility at all, because I saw from the very first that nothing was really intended but flight. Say that I now follow this, then whither? Not with him. I had already set out to join him when I found that Caesar was in those parts, so that I could not safely reach Lucaria. I must sail by the western sea in the depth of winter, not knowing where to steer for. And again, what about being with my brother, or leaving him and taking my son? How, then, must I act, since either alternative will involve the greatest difficulty, the greatest mental anxiety? And then, too, what a raid he will make on me and my fortunes when I am out of the way, fiercer than on other people, because he will think, perhaps, that in outrages on me he holds a means of popularity. Again, these fetters, remember, I mean these laurels on my attendant staves, how inconvenient it is to take them out of Italy. What place indeed will be safe for me? supposing I now find the sea calm enough, before I have actually joined him, though where that will be and how to get there I have no notion. On the other hand, say that I stop where I am and find some place on this side of the water, then my conduct will precisely resemble that of Philippus, or Lucius Flaccus, or Quintus Mucius under Cinna's reign of terror, and however this decision ended for the last name, Yet still he at any rate used to say that he saw what really did happen would occur, but that it was his deliberate choice in preference to marching sword in hand against the homes of the very city that gave him birth. With Thrasybulus it was otherwise, and perhaps better. But still, there is a sound basis for the policy and sentiments of Mucius, as there is also for this which Philippus did, to wait for your opportunity when you must, just as much as not lose your opportunity when it is given. But even in this case, those staves again of my attendance still involve some awkwardness. For say that his feelings are friendly to me. I am not sure that this is so, but let us assume it. Then he will offer me a triumph. I fear that to decline may be perilous, to accept an offense with all good citizens. Ah, you exclaim, what a difficult, what an insoluble problem. Yet the solution must be found for what can one do? And lest you should have formed the idea that I am rather inclined towards staying because I have argued more on that side of the question, it is quite possible, as is so frequently the case in debates, that one side has more words, the other more worth. 
Therefore, I should be glad if when you give me your opinion, you would look upon me as making up my mind quite dispassionately on a most important question. I have a ship both at Caida and at Brundisium. But lo and behold, while I am writing you these very lines by night in my house at Calus, in come the carriers, and here is a letter to say that Caesar is before Corfinium, and that in Corfinium is Domitius, with an army resolute and even eager for battle. I do not think our chief will go so far as to be guilty of abandoning Domitius, though it is true he had already sent Scipio on before two cohorts to Brundisium and written a dispatch to the consuls ordering that the legion enrolled by Faustus should go under the command of one consul to Sicily. But it is a scandal that Domitius should be left to his fate when he is imploring him for help. There is some hope, not in my opinion a very good one, but strong in these parts, that there has been a battle in the Pyrenees between Aphranius and Trebonius, that Trebonius has been beaten off, that your friend Fabius also has come over to us with all his troops, and, to crown it all, that Aphranius is advancing with a strong force. If this be so, we shall perhaps make a stand in Italy. As for me, since Caesar's route is uncertain, he is expected about equally by way of Capua and of Luceria. I have sent Lepta to Pompeius with a letter, while I myself, for fear of falling in with him anywhere, have started again for Formiae. I thought it best to let you know this, and am writing with more composure than I have written of late, not inserting any opinion of my own, but trying to elicit yours. End of section 22. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 23 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 23, Cicero's Correspondence. It seems desirable to add a few letters by other hands than Cicero's, to indicate the manifold sidelights thrown on the inner history of this intensely interesting period. Sulpicius' famous attempt at consolation has already been given above. Two brief letters by Caesar will illustrate the dictator's marvelous ability to comprehend and control other men. Pompey's gruff rudeness forms a contrast which is hardly accidental on the editor's part. Caelius' fit is biting as ever. And lastly, Matthew's protest against being persecuted merely because he, who loved Caesar, openly mourned for his dead friend, has an unconscious tone of simple heroism unequaled in the entire correspondence. W. C. Lee Caesar to Cicero You know me too well not to keep up your character as an augur by divining that nothing is more entirely alien from my nature than cruelty. I will add that while my decision is in itself a great source of pleasure to me, to find my conduct approved by you is a triumph of gratification. Nor does the fact at all disturb me that those people whom I have set at liberty are reported to have gone their ways only to renew the attack upon me, because there is nothing I wish more than that I may ever be as true to my own character as they to theirs. May I hope that you will be near town when I am there, so that I may as usual avail myself in everything of your advice and means of assistance. Let me assure you that I am charmed beyond everything with your relation Dolabella, to whom I shall acknowledge myself indeed indebted for this obligation, for his kindliness is so great and his feeling and affection for me are such that he cannot possibly do otherwise." Caesar to Cicero Though I had fully made up my mind that you would do nothing rashly, nothing imprudently, still I was so far impressed by the rumors in some quarters as to think it my duty to write to you, and ask it as a favor due to our mutual regard, that you will not take any step, now that the scale is so decisively turned, which you would not have thought it necessary to take, 
even though the balance still stood firm. For it will really be both a heavier blow to our friendship, and a step on your part still less judicious for yourself, if you are to be thought, not even to have bowed the knee to success, for things seem to have fallen out as entirely favourably for us, as disastrously for them, nor yet to have been drawn by attachment to a particular cause, for that has undergone no change since you decided to remain aloof from their counsels, but to have passed a stern judgment on some act of mine, than which, from you, no more painful thing could befall me, and I claim the right of our friendship to entreat that you will not take this course. Finally, what more suitable part is there for a good peace-loving man, and a good citizen, than to keep aloof from civil dissensions? There were not a few who admired this course, but could not adopt it, by reason of its danger. You, after having duly weighed both the conclusions of friendship and the unmistakable evidence of my whole life, will find that there is no safer nor more honourable course than to keep entirely aloof from the struggle. Pompey to Cicero Today, the 10th of February, Fabius Vergilianus has joined me. From him I learn that Domitius with his eleven cohorts and fourteen cohorts that Vibulius had brought up is on his way to me. His intention was to start from Corfinium on the 13th, Herus to follow soon after with five of the cohorts. I decide that you are to come to us at Luceria. Here I think you will be most in safety. Caelius in Rome to Cicero in Cilicia. The capture of his Parthian majesty and the storming of Soloikeia itself had not been enough to compensate for missing the sight of our doings here. Your eyes would never have ached again if you had only seen the face of Domitius when he was not elected. The election was important, and it was quite clear that party feeling determined the side which people took. Only a few could be brought to acknowledge the claims of friendship. Consequently, Domitius is so furious with me that he scarcely hates any of his most intimate friends as much as he does me, and all the more because he thinks that it was to do him wrong, that his hopes of being in the College of Augurs are snatched away, and that I am responsible for it. He is savage now to see everybody so delighted in his mortification, and myself more active than anybody, with one exception, on behalf of Antonius. As to political prospects, I have often mentioned to you that I do not see any chance of peace lasting a year, and the nearer that struggle which must infallibly take place is drawing to us, the more manifest does its danger become. The point at issue about which our lords and masters are going to fight is this. Pompeius has absolutely determined not to allow Caesar to be elected consul on any terms except a previous resignation of his army and his government, while Caesar is convinced that he must inevitably fall if he separates himself from his army. He offers, however, this compromise, that they should both of them resign their armies. So you see, their great affection for one another, and their much-abused alliance, has not even dwindled down into suppressed jealousy, but has broken out into open war. Nor can I discover what is the wisest course to take in my own interests a question which I make no doubt will give much trouble to you also. For while I have both interest and connections among those who are on one side, on the other too it is the cause and not the men themselves I dislike. You are not, I feel sure, blind to the fact that where parties are divided within a country, we are bound, so long as the struggle is carried on, with none but constitutional weapons, to support the more honourable cause. But when we come to blows and to open war, then the safer one. And to count that cause the better which is the less likely to be dangerous. In the present division of feeling I see that Pompeius will have the Senate and all judicially minded people on his side. Those who have everything to dread and little to hope for will flock to Caesar. The army is not to be compared. 
On the whole, we have plenty of time for balancing the strength of parties and making our decision. I had all but forgotten my principal reason for writing. Have you heard of the wonderful doings of our Senzel Appius? How he is rigorously inquiring into our statues and pictures, our amount of land and our depths? He has persuaded himself that his censorship is a moral soap or toilet powder. He is wrong, I take it, for while he only wants to wash off the dirt, he is really laying bare his veins and his flesh. Heaven and earth, you must run and come to laugh at the things here. Appius questioning about pictures and statues. You must make haste, I assure you. Our friend Curio is thought to have acted wisely in giving way about the pay of Pompeius troops, if I must sum up my opinion, as you ask, about what will happen, unless one or other of them consents to go and fight the Parthians, I see a great split impending, which will be settled by the sword and by force. Each is well inclined for this and well equipped. If it could only be without danger to yourself, you would find this a great and most attractive drama which fortune is rehearsing. Matthews to Cicero I received great pleasure from your letter, because I found that your opinion of me was what I had hoped and wished it to be, nor that I was in any doubt about it, but for the very reason that I valued it so highly, I was most anxious that it should remain unimpaired. Conscious, however, that I had done nothing which would give offence to the feelings of any good citizen, I was naturally the less inclined to believe that you, adorned as you are with so many excellences of the most admirable kind, could have allowed yourself to be convinced of anything on mere idle report, particularly seeing that you were a friend for whom my spontaneous attachment had been and still was unbroken. And knowing now that it has been as I hoped, I will answer those attacks which you have often opposed on my behalf, as was fairly to be expected from your well-known generosity and the friendship existing between us. For I am well aware of all they have been heaping on me since Caesar's death. They make it a reproach against me that I go heavily for the loss of a friend, and think it cruel that one whom I loved should have fallen, because, say they, Country must be put before friends, as though they have hitherto been successful in proving that his death really was the gain of the commonwealth. But I will not enter any subtle plea. I admit that I have not attained to your higher grades of philosophy, for I have neither been a partisan of Caesar in our civil dissensions, though I did not abandon my friend, even when his action was a stumbling block to me. Nor did I ever give my approval to the civil war, or even to the actual ground of quarrel, of which indeed I earnestly desired, that the first spark should be trampled out. And so, in the triumph of a personal friend, I was never ensnared by the charms, either of place or of money, prizes which have been recklessly abused by the rest, though they had less influence with him than I had. I may even say that my own private property was impaired by that act of Caesar, thanks to which many of those who are rejoicing at Caesar's death continued to live in their own country. That our defeated fellow countrymen should be spared was as much an object to me as my own safety. Is it possible then for me, who wanted all to be left uninjured, not to feel indignation, that he by whom this was secured is dead? Above all, when the very same men were the cause at once of his own popularity and his untimely end. You shall smart then, say they, since you dare to disapprove of our deed. What unheard of insolence! One man they may boast of a deed, which another is not even allowed to lament without punishment. Why, even slaves have always been free of this to feel their fears, their joys, their sorrows as their own, and not at anybody's else dictation. And these are the very things which now, at least according to what your liberators have always in their mouth, they are trying to wrest from us by terrorism, 
but they try in vain. There is no danger which has terrors enough ever to make me desert the side of gratitude or humanity. For never have I thought that death in a good cause is to be shunned, often indeed that it deserves to be courted. But why are they inclined to be enraged with me, if my wishes are simply that they may come to regret their deed, desiring, as I do, that Caesar's death may be felt to be untimely by us all? It is my duty as a citizen to desire the preservation of the Constitution. Well, unless both my life in the past and all my hopes for the future prove without any words of mine that I do earnestly desire this, I make no demand to prove it by my professions. To you, therefore, I make a specially earnest appeal to let facts come before assertions, and to take my word for it, that, if you feel that honesty is the best policy, it is impossible I should have any association with lawless villains. Or can you believe that the principles I pursued in the days of my youth, when even error could pass with some excuse, I shall renounce now that I am going down the hill, and with my own hands unravel all the web of my life? That I will not do, nor yet will I commit any act that could give offence, beyond the fact that I do lament the sad fall of one who was to me the dearest friend and the most illustrious of men. But where I otherwise disposed, I would never deny what I was doing, lest it should be thought I was at once shameless in doing wrong, and false and cowardly in dissembling it. But then I undertook the management of those games which Caesar's heir celebrated for Caesar's victory. Well, this is a matter which belongs to one's private obligations, not to any political arrangement. It was, however, in the first place a tribute of respect, which I was called upon to pay, to the memory and the eminent position of a man whom I dearly loved, even though he was dead, and also one that I could not refuse, at the request of a young man so thoroughly promising, and so worthy in every way of Caesar as he is. Again, I have frequently paid visits of compliment to the consul Antonius, and you will find that the very men who think me but a lukewarm patriot are constantly going to his house in crowds, actually for the purpose of soliciting, or carrying away some favor. But what a monstrous claim it is, that while Caesar never laid any such embargo as this to prevent me from associating freely with anybody I pleased, even if they were people whom he personally did not like, these men who have robbed me of my friend should attempt by malicious insinuations, to prevent my showing a kindness to whomsoever I will. I have, however, no fear that the moderation of my life will hereafter prove an insufficient defense against false insinuations, and that even those who do not love me, because of my loyalty to Caesar, would not rather have their own friend imitate me than themselves. Such a life as remains to me, at least, if I succeed in what I desire, I shall spend in quiet at Rhodes. But if I find that some chance has put a stop to this, I shall simply live at Rome as one who is always desirous that right should be done. I am deeply grateful to our good friend Trebatius for having thus disclosed to me your sincere and friendly feeling, and given me even an additional reason for honoring and paying respect to one whom it has always been a pleasure to me to regard as a friend. Farewell heartily, and let me have your esteem. End of section 23。Section 24 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 24 The Dream of Scipio by Cicero From The Dialogue 
The Republic. Translation of Professor T. R. Lonsbury. When I went into Africa with the consul Manius Manilius, holding the rank, as you are aware, of military tribune of the Fourth Legion, nothing lay nearer to my heart than to meet Massinissa, a king who, for good reasons, was on the most friendly terms with our family. When I had come to him, the old man embraced me with tears, and then, looking up to heaven, said, I give thanks to thee, O supremest soul, and to you, ye inhabitants of heaven, that before I depart this life I behold in my dominions, and under this roof, Publius Cornelius Scipio, by whose very name I am revived, so never passes away from my mind the memory of that best and most invincible hero. Thereupon I made inquiries of him, as to the state of his own kingdom, and he of me as to our republic, and with many words uttered on both sides, we spent the whole of that day. Moreover, after partaking of a repast prepared with royal magnificence, we prolonged the conversation late into the night. The old man would speak of nothing but Africanus, and remembered not only all his deeds, but likewise his sayings. After we parted to go to bed, a sounder sleep than usual fell upon me, partly on account of weariness occasioned by the journey, and partly because I had stayed up to a late hour. Then Africanus appeared to me, I think in consequence of what we had been talking about, for it often happens that our thoughts and speeches bring about in sleep something of that illusion of which Ennius writes in regard to himself and Homer, of which poet he was very often accustomed to think and speak while awake. Africanus showed himself to me in that form, which was better known to me from his ancestral image than from my recollection of his person. As soon as I recognized him, I was seized with a fit of terror, but he thereupon said, Be of good courage, O Scipio, lay aside fear, and commit to memory these things which I am about to say. Do you see that state which, compelled by me to submit to the Roman people, renews its former wars, and cannot endure to remain at peace? At these words, from a certain lustrous and bright place, very high and full of stars, he pointed out to me Carthage. To fight against that city, thou no comest in a rank, but little above that of a private soldier. But in two years from this time, thou shalt as consul utterly overthrow it, and in consequence shalt gain, by thy own exertions, that very surname of Africanus, which up to this time thou hast inherited from us. But when thou shalt have destroyed Carthage, shalt have had the honour of a triumph, and shalt have been censor, thou shalt during thy absence be chosen consul for a second time, shalt put an end to a great war, and lay Numantia in ruins. But when thou shalt be carried in thy triumphal chariot to the capital, thou wilt find the republic disturbed by the designs of my grandson. Then, O Scipio, it will be necessary that thou exhibit the purity and greatness of thy heart, thy soul, and thy judgment. But I see at that time a double way disclosed itself, as if the fates were undecided. For when thy life shall have completed eight times seven revolutions of the sun, and these two numbers, each one of which is looked upon as perfect, the one for one reason, the other for another, shall have accomplished for thee, by their natural revolution, the fatal product, to thee alone, and to thy name the whole state shall turn, upon thee the senate, upon thee all good men, upon thee the allies, upon thee the Latins, will fasten their eyes, thou wilt be the one upon whom the safety of the state shall rest, and in short, as dictator, it will be incumbent on thee to establish and regulate the republic, if thou art successful in escaping the impious hands of kinsmen. At this point Lelius uttered an exclamation of sorrow, and the rest groaned more deeply, but Scipio slightly smiling said, Keep silence, I beg of you, do not awake me from my dream, and hear the rest of his words. 
but o africanus that thou mayest be the more zealous in the defence of the republic know this for all who have preserved who have succoured who have aggrandized their country there is in heaven a certain fixed place where they enjoy an eternal life of blessedness for to that highest god who governs the whole world there is nothing which can be done on earth more dear than those combinations of men and unions made under the sanction of law which are called states the rulers and preservers of them depart from this place and to it they return i had been filled with terror not so much at the fear of death as at the prospect of treachery on the part of those akin to me nevertheless at this point i had the courage to ask whether my father paulus was living and others whom we thought to be annihilated certainly said he they alone live who have been set free from the fetters of the body as if from prison for that which you call your life is nothing but death nay thou mayest even behold thy father paulus coming towards thee no sooner had i seen him than i burst into a violent fit of tears but he thereupon embracing and kissing me forbade my weeping i as soon as i had checked my tears and was able again to speak said to him tell me i beseech thee o best and most sacred father since this is life as i hear africanus say why do i tarry upon earth why shall i not hasten to go to you not so said he not until that god whose temple is all this which thou seest shall have freed thee from the bonds of the body can any entrance lie open to thee here for men are brought into the world with this design that they may protect and preserve that globe which thou seest in the middle of this temple and which is called earth to them a soul is given from these everlasting fires which you name constellations and stars which in the form of globes and spheres run with incredible rapidity the rounds of their orbits under the impulse of divine intelligences wherefore by thee o publius and by all pious men the soul must be kept in the guardianship of the body nor without the command of him by whom it is given to you can there be any departure from this mortal life lest you seem to have shunned the discharge of that duty as men which has been assigned to you by God. But, O Scipio, like as thy grandfather who stands here, like as I who gave thee life, cherish the sense of justice and loyal affection, which latter, in however great measure, due to thy parents and kinsmen, is most all due to thy country. Such a life is the way to heaven, and to that congregation of those who have ended their days on earth, and freed from the body dwell in that place which you see that place which as you have learned from the greeks you are in the habit of calling the milky way this was a circle shining among the celestial fires with a most brilliant whiteness as i looked from it all other things seemed magnificent and wonderful moreover they were such stars as we have never seen from this point of space and all of such magnitude as we have never even suspected among them that was the least which the farthest from heaven and the nearest to earth shone with a borrowed light but the starry globes far exceeded the size of the earth indeed the earth itself appeared to me so small that i had a feeling of mortification at the sight of our empire which took up what seemed to be but a point of it as i kept my eyes more intently fixed upon this spot africanus said to me how long i beg of thee will thy spirit be chained down to earth seest thou not into what a holy place thou hast come everything is bound together in nine circles or other spheres of which the farthest is the firmament which embraces the rest is indeed the supreme god himself confining and containing all the others to that highest heaven are fixed those orbits of the stars which eternally revolve below it are seven spheres which move backward with a motion contrary to that of the firmament 
one of these belongs to that star, which on earth they call Saturn. Then follows that shining orb, the source of happiness and health to the human race, which is called Jupiter. Then the red planet, bringing terror to the nations, to which you give the name of Mars. Then, almost directly under the middle region, stands the sun, the leader, the chief, the governor of the other luminaries, the soul of the universe, and its regulating principle, of a size so vast that it penetrates and fills everything with its own light. Upon it, as if they were an escort, follow two spheres, the one of Venus, the other of Mercury, and in the lowest circle revolves the moon, illuminated by the rays of the sun. Below it there is nothing, which is not mortal and transitory, save the souls which are given to mankind, by the gift of the gods, above the moon all things are eternal. For that ninth sphere which is in the middle is the earth, it has no motion, it is the lowest in space, and all heavy bodies are borne toward it by their natural downward tendency. I looked at these, lost in wonder. As soon as I had recovered myself, I said, What is this sound so great and so sweet which fills my ears? This, he replied, is the music which, composed of intervals unequal, but divided proportionately by rule, is caused by the swing and movement of the spheres themselves and by the proper combination of acute tones with grave, creates with uniformity, manifold and diverse harmonies. For movements so mighty cannot be accomplished in silence, and it is a law of nature that the farthest sphere on the one side gives forth a bass tone, the farthest on the other a treble, for which reason the revolution of that uppermost arch of the heaven, the starry firmament, whose motion is more rapid, is attended with an acute and high sound, while that of the lowest, or lunar arc, is attended with a very deep and grave sound. For the ninth sphere, the earth, embracing the middle region of the universe, stays immovably in one fixed place, but those eight globes between, two of which have the same essential action, produce tones, distinguished by intervals, to the number of seven, which number indeed is the knot of almost all things. Men of skill, by imitating the result on the strings of the lyre, or by means of the human voice, have laid open for themselves a way of return to this place, just as other men of lofty souls have done the same by devoting themselves during their earthly life to the study of what is divine. But the ears of men surfeited by this harmony, have become deaf to it, nor is there in you any duller sense, just as at that cataract which is called Catadupa, where the Nile rushes down headlong from the lofty mountain tops, the people who dwell in that neighborhood have lost the sense of hearing in consequence of the magnitude of the sound. So likewise this harmony, produced by the excessively rapid revolution of the whole universe, is so great that the heirs of men are not able to take it in, in the same manner as you are not able to look the sun in the eye, and your sight is overcome by the power of its rays. Though I was filled with wonder, nevertheless I kept turning my eyes from time to time to the earth. I perceive, then said Africanus, that though still continues to contemplate the habitation of the home of man, if that seems to thee as small as it really is, keep then thy eyes fixed on these heavenly objects, look with contempt on those of mortal life. For what notoriety that lives in the mouths of men, or what glory that is worthy of being sought after, art thou able to secure? Thou seest that the earth is inhabited, in a few small localities, and that between those inhabited places, spots as it were on the surface, vast desert regions lie spread out, and that those who inhabit the earth are not only so isolated that no communication can pass among them from one to another, but that some dwell in an oblique direction as regards you, 
some in a diagonal, and some stand even exactly opposite you. From these you are certainly not able to hope for any glory. Moreover, thou observest that this same earth is surrounded, and as it were girdled by certain zones, of which thou seest that too, the farthest apart, and resting at both sides on the very poles of the sky, are stiffened with frost, and that again, the central and largest one is burned up with the heat of the sun. Two are habitable, of these the southern one, in which dwell those who make their footprints opposite yours, is a foreign world to your race. But even this other one, which lies to the north which you occupy, see with how small a part of it you come into contact. For all the land which is cultivated by you, very narrow at the extremities but wider at the sides, is only a small island surrounded by that water which on earth you call the Atlantic or the Great Sea, or the Ocean. But though its name is so high-sounding, yet thou beholdest how small it is. From these cultivated and well-known regions can either thy name or the name of any of us surmount and pass this Caucasus which thou seest, or cross yonder flood of the Ganges? Who in the farthest remaining regions of the rising and the setting sun or on the confines of the north and the south, will hear thy name. When these are taken away, thou assuredly perceivest how immense is the littleness of that space in which your reputation seeks to spread itself abroad. Moreover, even those who speak of us, for how long a time will they speak? Nay, even if the generations of men were desirous, one after the other, to hand down to posterity, the praises of any one of us heard from their fathers, nevertheless on account of the changes in the earth, wrought by inundations and conflagration, which are sure to recur at certain fixed epochs, we are not simply unable to secure for ourselves a glory which lasts forever, but are even unable to gain a glory which lasts for a long time. Moreover, of what value is it that the speech of those who are to be born hereafter shall be about thee, when nothing has been said of thee by all those who were born before, who were neither fewer in number and were unquestionably better men, especially when no one is able to live in the memory of those very persons of whom one's name can be heard for the space of one year. For men commonly measure the year by the return to its place of the sun alone, that is, of one star, but when all the stars shall have returned to that same point, from which they once set out, and after a long period of time, have brought back the same relative arrangement of the whole heaven, that, then, can justly be called the complete year. In it I hardly dare say how many ages of human life are contained. For once in the past the sun seemed to disappear from the eyes of men and to be annihilated, and the time when the soul of Romulus made its way into this very temple, when, from the same region of the sky and at the same moment of time, the sun shall have again vanished, then be sure that all constellations and stars have come back to the position they had in the beginning and that the perfect year is completed. Of that year know that now not even the twentieth part has passed. Wherefore, if thou givest up the hope of a return to this place, in which all things exist for lofty and preeminent souls, yet of how much value is that human glory, which can hardly endure for even the small part of a single year? But if, as I was saying, Thou wishest to look on high, and to fix thy gaze upon this abode of the blessed and this eternal home. Never give thyself up to the applause of the vulgar, nor rest the recompense of thy achievements in the rewards which can be bestowed upon thee by men. It is incumbent on thee that virtue herself shall draw thee by her own charm to true glory. As for the way in which others talk about thee, 
let them take care of that themselves. Yet, without doubt, they will talk. But all such renown is limited to the petty provinces of the regions which thou seest, nor in the case of any one is it everlasting, for it both dies with the death of men, and is buried in oblivion by the forgetfulness of posterity. When he had said these things, O Africanus, I replied, if the path that leads to the entrance of heaven lies open to those who have rendered great service to their country, although in following from my boyhood in thy footsteps and in those of my father, I have not failed in sustaining the honor derived from you, yet henceforth I shall toil with far more zeal, now that so great a reward has been held out before me. Do thou indeed, said he, continue to strive, and bear this in mind, that those thyself are not mortal, but this body of thine, for thou art not the one which that form of thine proclaims thee to be, but the soul of any one, that alone is he, not that external shape which can be pointed out with the finger. Therefore know thyself to be a god, if that is essentially God which lives, which feels, which remembers, which foresees, which rules and regulates and moves that body over which it is put in authority, as the Supreme Being governs this universe, and as the Eternal God moves the world, which in a certain point of view is perishable, so the incorruptible soul moves the corruptible body. For what always moves itself is eternal, but that which communicates to anything a motion which it has itself received from another source must necessarily have an end of life when it has an end of motion. Therefore, that alone never ceases to move which moves itself, for the reason that it is never deserted by itself. This indeed is the wellhead, this the beginning of motion to all other things that are moved. But to a beginning there is no birth, for all things are born from the beginning. But it itself cannot be born of anything, for that would not be a beginning which sprang from some other source. And just as it is never begotten, so it never dies. For a beginning annihilated could neither itself be brought back to life by anything else, nor could it create anything else out of itself since it is necessary that all things should come from a beginning. So it results that the beginning of motion is in itself, because it is self-moved. And this can neither be born nor die, for if it did, the heavens would fall to ruin, and all nature would stand still, nor could it come into the possession of any power by the original impulse of which it might be put into motion. Since therefore it is clear that what is self-moved is eternal, who can deny that this essential characteristic has been imparted to the soul? For everything which is moved by a foreign impulse is without a soul, but that which lives is made to go by an inward motion of its own, for this is the special nature and power of the soul. But if it is the one thing among all which is self-moved, then certainly it has had no beginning, and is eternal. Do thou, then, employ it in the noblest duties, but those are the loftiest cares which are concerned with the well-being of our native land. The soul that is inspired by these, and occupied with them, will hasten the quicker into this its real home and habitation. So much the more speedily, indeed, will it do this, if while it is shut up in the body, it shall pass beyond its limits, and by the contemplation of those things which are outside of it, shall withdraw itself as far as possible from the body. For the souls of those who have given themselves up to sensual pleasures, and have made themselves, as it were, ministers to these, and who under the pressure of desires, which are subservient to these pleasures, have violated the laws of God and man, when they shall have parted from the body, will fly about the earth itself, nor will return to this place, until they shall have suffered torments for many ages. 
he departed. I awoke from my sleep. End of section 24「Section 25 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 25, Selected Excerpt from the Poem of My Cid. By Charles Frog Smith. In the Cid, we have two distinct personages. Rodrigo, or Guy Diaz, Dia, son of Diego, who flourished during the last half of the 11th century, and that legendary hero of Spanish epic poems, ballads, and dramas, whom Philip II tried to have canonized. We are not left to our own conjectures as to the character and life of the historical Cid. Both Spanish and Arabic records placed the main facts beyond all controversy. He was born at Bivar, a hamlet three miles north of Burgos, circa 1040 to 1050, of an ancient Castilian family claiming descent from Lane Calvo, one of the two judges who, tradition declares, was named by the Castilian people as their governor after the Leonos king had treacherously put their counts to death, circa 923. The period of the Cid coincides with the political disruption of Arabic Spain. The Caliphate of Cordova, which in the preceding century had attained its high point in power and in all the arts of civilization, had fallen. A multitude of petty Moorish states disputed with each other the heritage of the Omeyyad Caliphs. The Christian states were not slow to profit by their opportunity. Ferdinand I of Leon Castile, surnamed the Great, 1037-65, to not only extended his territory at the expense of the Moors, but also imposed tribute upon four of their more important states, Sargosa, Toledo, Baroja, and Sevilla. Valencia only escaped a similar fate through his death. The peninsula was at this time divided among a large number of mutually independent and warring states, Christian and Muslim. The sentiments of loyalty to religion and to country were universally subordinated to those of personal interest. Christians fought under Moorish banners, Moors under Christian. Humanity towards the enemy, loyalty to oaths, were not virtues in the common estimation. Between the Christian states of Leon and Castile, great jealousy ruled. Castile had come into being as a border province of the Asturian kingdom, governed by military counts. From the first, there seems to have been a spirit of resistance to the overrule of the Asturian kings, later known as kings of Leon. Finally, under its Count Fernand Gonzalez, who died 970, Castile secured its independence. But whether leading a separate political existence or united with Leon, Castile was ever jealously sensitive of any precedence claimed or exercised by its sister kingdom. Ferdinand I of Leon Castile, treating his territorial possessions as personal property, a policy repeatedly fatal to all advance in Spanish history, divided them at his death, 1005, among his five children. Sancho, the eldest, received Castile, Nehera, and Pampaluna. Alfonso, Leon and the Asturias. Garcia, Gallica, and that portion of Portugal which had been wrested from the Moors. Uraca received the city of Zamora, and Elvira, Toro. The expected occurred. Sancho made war on his brothers, compelling both to flee to Moorish territories, and wrested Toro from Elvira. Rodrigo Diaz, the Cid, appears first at this period. He is the Alferez, i.e. the standard-bearer, or commander-in-chief under the king in Sancho's army. The brother kings, Sancho and Alfonso, had agreed to submit their dispute to a single combat, the victor to receive the territories of both. Alfonso's Leonese army conquered the Castilian, and relying upon the agreement withdrew to its tents. Rodrigo Diaz was already known as the Compriador, a title won through his having vanquished in single combat the champion of Sancho of Navarre, and signifying probably one skilled in battle, or champion. Rodrigo gave a wily counsel to the routed Castilians. The Leonese are not expecting an attack, he said. Let us return and fall upon them at unawares. The counsel was followed. The victors, resting in their tents, were surprised at daybreak, and only a few, Alfonso among the number, escaped with their lives. 
Alfonso was imprisoned at Burgos, but soon released at the entreaty of the Princess Urica, on condition of his becoming a monk. Availing himself of such liberty, he escaped from the monastery to the Moorish court of Mamon, king of Toledo. Sancho ruled thus over the entire heritage of his father, Zamora accepted, the portion of Uraca. While laying siege to that city, he was slain by a cavalier in Uraca's service, Balido Dolphus, who, sallying from the city, made good his escape, though almost overtaken by the avenging Compiador, 1072. Alfonso, the fugitive of Toledo, was now rightful heir to the throne, and however reluctant the Castilian nobles were to recognize the authority of a Leonese king, they yielded to necessity. It is asserted, but the historical evidence here is not complete, that before recognizing Alfonso's authority, the Castilian nobles required of him an oath that he had no part in his brother's murder, and that it was the Compiador who administered this oath, 1073. Whatever the facts, Alfonso will have thought it wise to conciliate the goodwill of the Castilian grandees, and especially that of their leader Rodrigo, until at least his own position became secure. To this we may attribute his giving to Rodrigo in marriage of Jimena, daughter of Diego, Count of Oviedo, and first cousin of the king. The marriage contract, bearing date 1074, is preserved at Burgos. Some years later, Rodrigo was sent to collect the tribute due Alfonso by his vassal Motamed, king of Seville. Finding the king of Granada at war with Motamed, Rodrigo requested him not to attack an ally of Alfonso. But prayers and threats were alike unavailing. It came to battle, and Rodrigo conquered. Among the prisoners were several Christians in the service of Granada, notably Garcia Odones, a scion of the royal Leonese house. Not long after, we find Rodrigo charged with having appropriated to his own use a portion of the tributes and gifts sent to Alfonso by Motamed, Garcia Odones being his chief accuser. Taking advantage of the pretext, it can have been but a pretext, of Rodrigo's attacking the Moors without first securing the royal consent, Alfonso banished him. Old wrong still rankling in the king's memory furnished probably the real motive. And now began that career as soldier of fortune, which has furnished themes to Spanish poets of high low degree, and which, transformed and idealized by tradition, has made of Rodrigo the perfect cavalier of crusading Christian Spain. He offered first, it would seem, his service and that of his followers to the Christian Count of Barcelona, and when refused by him to the Moorish King of Saragossa. This state was one of the more important of those resulting from the distribution of the Caliphate of Cordova. The offer was accepted, and Rodrigo remained here until 1088, serving successively three generations of the Beni Hood, father, son, and grandson, warring indifferently against Christians and Moors, and through his successes rising to extraordinary distinction and power. At this time, 1088, the attention of both Molstein, the king of Saragossa, and of his powerful captain Rodrigo, was drawn to Valencia. This city, after the fall of the Caliphate of Cordova, had been ruled for forty-four years by descendants of Almanzor, the great prime minister of the last period of the Omeyad dynasty. Mamoun, king of Toledo, who sheltered the fugitive Alfonso, deposed the last of these Valencian kings, his son-in-law, and annexed the state to his own dominion. At Mamoun's death in 1075, Valencia revolted. The governor declared himself independent, and placed himself under Alfonso's protection. Ten years later, Mamoun's successor, the weak Kadir, finding his position a desperate one, offered to yield up to Alfonso his own capital Toledo, on condition that the latter should place Valencia in his hands. Alfonso consented. Valencia was too weak to offer resistance, but Kadir proved equally incompetent as king and as general. Depending entirely upon his Castilian soldiery, captained by Alfar Fanez, a kinsman of Rodrigo, he grievously burdened the people in order to satisfy the demands of this auxiliary troop. But grinding taxes and extortions alike failed, and the soldiery, their wages and arrears, battened upon the country, the dregs of the Moorish population joining them. The territory was delivered at last from their robberies, rapes, and murders by the appearance of the Almoravides. This new Muslim sect had grown strong in Africa, attaining there the political supremacy, and in their weakness the Moorish kings of Spain implored his assistance in repelling the attacks of the Christian north. King Alfonso, alarmed at the appearance of these African hordes, recalled Alfar Fenez, was defeated by the Amorabides in Salaca in 1086, and could think no more of garrisoning Valencia for Cadir. 
The position of Gadir thus became critical, and he appealed for help both to Alfonso and to Mostain of Saragossa. Mostain sent Rodrigo, ostensibly to his assistance, but a secret agreement had been made, Arabic historians assert, between the king and his general, whereby Kadir was to be despoiled, the city fall to Mostain, the booty to Rodrigo. 1088. The expedition was a successful one. Kadir's enemies were compelled to withdraw, and Rodrigo established himself in Valencian territory. As the recognized protector of the lawful king, in reality the suzerain of Valencia, Rodrigo received a generous tribute, but he had no intention of holding to his agreement with Mostain and assisting the latter to win the city. It is clear, on the contrary, that he had already resolved to secure, when opportunity offered, the prize for himself. Meanwhile, he skillfully held off, now by force, now by ruse, all other competitors, Christian and Muslim alike, including among these King Alfonso, whose territories he wasted with fire and sword when that monarch attempted once, in Rodrigo's absence, to win Valencia for himself. At another time, we find him intriguing simultaneously with four different rivals for the control of the city, Alfonso and Mostain among the number, deceiving all with fair words. As head of an independent army, Rodrigo made now successful forays in all directions, despoiling, levying tribute, garrisoning strongholds, strengthening thus in every way his position. At last, the long-awaited opportunity came. During his temporary absence, Kadir was dethroned and put to death, and the leader of the insurgents, the Kadi Ibn Donhof, named president of a republic. Rodrigo returned, and appealing in turn to ruse and force, at last sat down before the city to reduce it by famine. During the last period of the siege, those who fled from the city to escape the famine were thrown to dogs or burned at slow fires. The city capitulated on favorable terms, June 15, 1094, but all the conditions of the capitulation were violated. The Cadi president was buried in a trench up to his armpits, surrounded with burning brands and slowly tortured to death, several of his kinsmen and friends sharing his fate. Rodrigo was, with difficulty, restrained from throwing into the flames the Cadi's children and the women of his harem. Yet the lives and property of Ibdanov and his family had been expressly safeguarded in the capitulation. It is probably that Rodrigo's title of the Cid, or My Cid, Arabic, Cid E, equal My Lord, was given to him at this time by his Moorish subjects. Master of Valencia, the Cid dreamed of conquering all that region of Spain still held by the Moors. An Arab heard him say, One Rodrigo, the last king of the Goths, has lost this peninsula. Another Rodrigo will recover it. Success crowned his arms for several years. But in 1099, the troops he had sent against the Amoribides were utterly routed, few escaping. The Cid, already enfeebled in health, died, it is said, of grief and shame. July 1099. His widow held the city for two years longer. Besieged at that time by the Amoribides, she sought help of Alfonso. He came and forced the enemy to raise the siege. But judging that it was not possible for him to defend a city so remote from his dominions, counseled its abandonment. As the Christians, escorting the body of the Cid, marched out, Valencia was fired, and only ruins awaited the Amoribides. 1102. The Cid's body was brought to San Pedro de Cardena, a monastery not far from Burgos, and thrown, it is said, beside the high altar for ten years, and thereafter buried. Jimena survived her husband until 1104. Ibn Basim, an Arabic contemporary, writing at Sevilla only ten years after the death of the Cid, after describing his cruelty and duplicity, adds, Nevertheless, that man, the scourge of his time, was one of the miracles of the Lord in his love of glory, the prudent firmness of his character, and his heroic courage. Victory always followed the banner of Rodrigo. May God curse him. He triumphed over the barbarians. He put to flight their armies, and with his little band of warriors slew their numerous soldiery. The Cid, a man not of princely birth, through the exercise of virtues which his time esteemed, courage and shrewdness, had won for himself from the Moors an independent principality. Legend will have begun to color and transform his exploits already during his lifetime. Some fifty years later, he had become the favorite hero of popular songs. It is probable that these songs, cantares, were at first brief tales in rude metrical form, and that the epic poems, dating from about 1200, used them as sources. The earliest poetic monument in Castilian literature which treats of the Cid is called The Poem of My Cid. While based upon history, 
its material is largely legendary. The date of its composition is doubtful, probably about 1200. The poem, the beginning is lost, opens with the departure of my Cid from Bavare, and describes his Moorish campaigns, culminating with the conquest of Valencia. Two Leonese nobles, the Inventates, princes, of Carrion, besiege Alfonso to ask for them in marriage the conqueror's daughters. The Cid assents. To his king he would refuse nothing, and the marriages are celebrated in Valencia with due pomp. But the princes are arrant cowards. To escape the jibes of the Cid's companions, after securing rich wedding portions, they depart for Carrion. In the oak wood of Carpus, they pretend a desire to be left alone with their wives. Despoiling them of their outer garments, with saddle girth and spurred boot, they seek to revenge upon the Cid's daughters the dishonor to which their own base conduct subjected them while at the Cid's court. But time brings a requital. The infantates, called to account, forfeit property and honor, esteeming themselves fortunate to escape with their lives from the judicial duels. Princes of Navarre and Aragon present themselves as suitors, and in second marriages, Donna Elvira and Donna Sola become queens of Spain. The marriages with the Infantatus of Carrion are pure invention, intended, perhaps, to defame the Leonese nobility, these nobles being princes of the blood royal. The second marriages, if we substitute Barcelona for Aragon, are historical. Of the Cid's two daughters, one married Prince Romero of Navarre, and the other Count Reynard Berenger III of Barcelona. In 1157, two of the Cid's great-grandchildren, Sancho VI of Navarre, and his sister, Dona Blanca, queen of Sancho III of Castile, sat on Spanish thrones. Through intermarriage, the blood of the Cid has passed into the Bourbon and Habsburg lines, with Eleanor of Castile into the English royal house. The poem of My Cid is probably the earliest monument of Spanish literature. It is also, in our opinion, the noblest expression, as far as the characters are concerned, for the verse halts and the description sometimes lags, of the entire medieval folk epic of Europe. Homeric in its simplicity, its characters are drawn with clearness, firmness, and concision, presenting a variety true to nature, far different from the uniformity we find in The Song of Roland. The spirit which breathes in it is of a noble, well-rounded humanity, a fearless and gentle courage, a manly and modest self-reliance, an unswerving loyalty and simple trust towards country, king, kinsmen, and friends, a child faith in God, slightly tinged with superstition, for my Cid believes in auguries, and a chaste, tender family affection, where the wife is loved and honored as wife and as mother, and the children's welfare fills the father's thoughts. The duplicity of the historical Cid has left indeed its traces. When abandoning Castile, he sends to two Jewish moneylenders of Burgos, chests filled, as he pretends, with fine gold, but in reality with sand, borrows upon this security, and so far as we are informed, never repays the loan. The princes of Carrion, his sons-in-law, are duped into thinking that they will escape from the accounting with the loss of Tizan and Colada, the swords which the Cid gave them. But a certain measure of prudent shrewdness is not out of place in dealing with men of the treacherous character of the Infantatus. And as to the Jewish moneylenders, to despoil them would scarcely have been regarded as an offense against the moral law in medieval Spain. The second poetic monument is variously named. Amanda de los Rios, a historian of Spanish literature, styles it the legend or chronicle of the youth of Rodrigo. Its date also is disputed, some authorities placing its composition earlier, some later than that of the poem. The weight of evidence seems to us in favor of the later date. It is rude and of inferior merit, though not without vigorous passages. It treats the earliest period of the Cid's life, and is, so far as we know, purely legendary. The realm of Castileon is at peace under the rule of Ferdinand, the first, when the Count Don Gomez of Gomez makes an unprovoked ascent upon the sheepfolds of Diego Linez. A challenge of battle follows. Rodrigo, only son of Diego, a lad in his thirteenth year, insists upon being one of the hundred combatants on the side of his family, and slays Don Gomez in single combat. Jimena, the daughter of Gomez, implores justice of the king. But when Ferdinand declares that there is a danger of an insurrection if Rodrigo be punished, she proposes reconciliation through marriage. Diego and his son are summoned to the court, where Rodrigo's appearance and conduct terrify all. He denies vassalship, and declares to King Ferdinand, that my father kissed your hand has foully dishonored me. Married to Jimena against his will, Jimena Diaz, not Jimena Gomez, was his historical wife, 
he vows never to recognize her as wife until he has won five battles with the Moors in open field. Ferdinand plays a very unkingly role in this poem. While his fierce vassal is absent, the king is helpless, and Rodrigo draws near only to assert anew his contempt for the royal authority by blunt refusals of Ferdinand's requests. He is always ready, however, to take up the gauntlet and defend the realm against every enemy, Christian or Moor. But this rude courage is coupled with devout piety, and is not insensible to pity. At the ford of the Duero, a wretched leper is encountered. All turn from him with loathing, save Rodrigo, who gives to him a brother's care. It is St. Lazarus, who, departing, blesses him. At last a formidable coalition is formed against Spain. The Emperor of Germany and the King of France, supported by the Pope and Patriarch, requires of Spain, in recognition of her feudal dependence upon the Roman Empire, a yearly tribute of fifteen noble virgins, besides silver, horses, falcons, etc. Rodrigo appears when Ferdinand is in despair, and kisses at last the royal hand in sign of vassalship. Though the enemy gather countless as the herbs of the fields, even Persia and Armenia furnishing contingents, their battle array is vain. The five kings of Spain cross the Pyrenees. Arrived before Paris, Rodrigo passes through the midst of the French army, strikes with his hand the gates of the city, and challenges the twelve French peers to combat. The allies, in alarm, implore a truce. At the council, Rodrigo, seated at the feet of his king and acting as Ferdinand's spokesman, curses the Pope when the latter offers the imperial crown of Spain. We came for that which was to be won, he declares, not for that already won. Against Rodrigo's advice, the truce is accorded to all. Here the poem is interrupted. Besides these two epic poems, we have in the earlier Spanish literature two chronicles in prose which describe the life of the Cid, the general chronicle of Alfonso the Learned, and the chronicle of the Cid, the latter being drawn from the former. Both rest in part upon historical sources, in part upon legend and tradition. Two centuries and more after the poem, we meet with the romances or ballads of the Cid, for the earliest of these do not in their present form date far back of 1500. These ballads derive from all sources, but chiefly from the Cid legend, which is here treated in a lyric, sentimental, popular, and at times even vulgar tone. Guillermo de Castro, 1569-1631, chose two themes from the life of the Cid for dramatic treatment, composing a dual drama styled La Mocadetes del Cid, The Youth of the Cid. The first part is the more important. De Castro, drawing from the ballads, told again the story of the insult to Don Diego, according to the ballads, a blow in the face given by Don Gomez in a moment of passion, its revenge, the pursuit of Rodrigo by Jimena, demanding justice of King Ferdinand, and finally the reconciliation through marriage. But de Castro added love, and the conflict in the mind of Rodrigo and in that of Jimena between affection and the claims of honor. Cornel recast de Castro's first drama in his Le Cid, condensing it and giving to the verse greater dignity and nobility. The French dramatist has worked with entire independence here, and both in what he has omitted and what he has added has usually shown an unerring dramatic instinct. In certain instances, however, through ignorance of the spirit and sources of the Spanish drama, he has erred. But the invention is wholly de Castro's, and many of Corneille's most admired passages are either free translations from the Spanish, or expressions of some thought or sentiment contained in de Castro's version. In more recent times, Herder has enriched German literature with free renderings of some of the Cid ballads. Victor Hugo has drawn from the Cid theme in his La Légion de Sigels, The Legend of the Centuries, fresh inspiration for his muse. Charles Sprague Smith From The Poem of My Cid, Leaving Burgos With tearful eyes he turned to gaze upon the wreck behind. His rifled coffers, burst in gates all open to the wind. Nor mantle left, nor robe of fur, stripped bare his castle hall. Nor hawk, nor falcon in the mew, the perches empty all. Then forth in sorrow went my Cid, and a deep sigh sighed he. Yet with a measured voice and calm, my Cid spake loftily. I thank thee, God our Father, thou that dwellest upon high. I suffer cruel wrong to-day, but of my enemy. As they came riding from Bavar, the crow was on the right. By Burgos's gate, upon the left, the crow was there in sight. My Cid, he shrugged his shoulders, and he lifted up his head. Good tidings, Alvervenez, we are banished men, he said. 
With sixty lances in his train my Cid rode up the town, the burghers and their dames from all the windows looking down. And there were tears in every eye, and on each lip one word. A worthy vassal would to God he served a worthy lord. Farewell to his wife at San Pedro de Cardena. The prayer was said, the mass was sung, they mounted to depart. My Cid a moment stayed to press Jimena to his heart. Jimena kissed his hand, as one distraught with grief was she. He looked upon his daughters, these to God I leave, said he. As when the fingernail from out the flesh is torn away, even so sharp to him and them the parting pang that day. Then to his saddle sprang my Cid, and forth his vassals led, but ever as he rode, to those behind he turned his head. Battle Scene Then cried my Cid, In charity as to the rescue, ho! Oh! With bucklers braced before their breast, with lances pointing low, with stooping crests and heads bent down above the saddle bow, all firm of hand and high of heart they rolled upon the foe. And he that in a good hour was born, his clarion voice rings out, and clear above the clang of arms is heard his battle shout. Among them, gentlemen, strike home for the love of charity. The champion of Avar is his. Roy Diaz, I am he. Then bearing where Bamaru still maintains unequal fight, three hundred lances down they come, their pennons flickering white. Down go three hundred moors to earth, a man to every blow, and when they wheel, three hundred more, as charging back they go. It was a sight to see the lances rise and fall that day, the shivered shields and riven mail, to see how thick they lay. The pennons that went in snow white came out gory red, the horses riding riderless, the riders lying dead. While Moors call on Mohammed, and St. James the Christians cry, and sixty score of Moors and more in narrow compass lie. The Challenges Seen from the challenges that preceded the judicial duels. Ferrando, one of the Amphidatus, has just declared that he did right in spurning the Cid's daughters. The Cid turns to his nephew. Now is the time, Dom Peter, speak, O man that sittest mute. My daughters and thy cousin's name and fame are in dispute. To me they speak, to thee they look to answer every word. If I am left to answer now, thou canst not draw thy sword. Tongue-tied Bemarez stood, a while he strode for words in vain. But look you, when he once began, he made his meaning plain. Cid, first I have a word for you. You always are the same, and Cortez ever jibing me. Dom Peter is the name. It never was a gift of mine, and that long since you know. But have you found me fail in aught that fell to me to do? You lie, Fernando, lie in all you say upon that score. The honor was to you, not him, the Cid Campiador. For I know something of your worth, and somewhat I can tell. That day beneath Valencia wall, you recollect it well. You prayed the Cid to place you in the forefront of the fray. You spied a moor, and valiantly you went that moor to slay. And then you turned and fled, for his approach you would not stay. Right soon he would have taught you, t'was a sorry game to play. Had I not been in battle there to take your place that day. I slew him on the first one fall. I gave his steed to you. To no man have I told the tale from that hour hitherto. Before my Cid and all his men you got yourself a name, how you in single combat slew a moor, a deed of fame, and all believed in your exploit, they wist not of your shame. You are as craven at the core, tall handsome as you stand, how dare you talk as now you talk, you tongue without a hand. Now take thou my defiance as a traitor, trothless knight, upon this plea before our king Alfonso will I fight. The daughters of my lord are wronged, their wrong is mine to right. That ye these ladies did desert, the baser are ye then. For what are they? Weak women. And what are ye? Strong men. On every count I deem their cause to be the holier, and I will make thee own it when we meet in battle here. Traitor thou shalt confess thyself, so help me God on high, and all that I have said today my sword shall verify. Thus far these two, Diego rose and spoke as ye shall hear. Counts by our birth are we, of stain our lineage is clear, and this alliance with my Cid there was no parody. If we his daughters cast aside, no cause for shame we see, and little need we care if they in mourning pass their lives, enduring the reproach that clings to scorned rejected wives. In leaving them we but uphold our honor and our right, and ready to the death am I, 
maintaining this to fight. Here Martin Antolia sprang upon his feet. False hound! Will you not silent keep that mouth where truth was never found? For you to boast, the lion's scare have you forgotten too? How through the open door you rushed across the courtyard flew? How sprawling in your terror on the wine-press beam you lay? Aye, never more, I trow, you wore the mantle of that day. There is no choice. The issue now the sword alone can try. The daughters of my Cid ye spurned. That must ye justify. On every count I here declare their cause the cause of right, and thou shalt own thy treachery the day we join in fight. He ceased, and striding up the hall a Sir Gonzales passed. His cheek was flushed with wine, for he had stayed to break his fast. Ungirt his robe, and trailing low his ermine mantle hung. Rude was his bearing to the court, and reckless was his tongue. What are to do is here, my lords, was the like ever seen? What talk is this about my Cid, him of Bavere, I mean? To Rio Dorino let him go to take his miller's rent, and keep his mills a-going there, as once he was content. He, forsooth, made his daughters with the counts of Carrion. Upstarted Monio Gostias, False, foul-mouthed knave, have done! Thou glutton, want to break thy fast without a thought or prayer, whose heart is plotting mischief when thy lips are speaking fair, whose plighted word to friend or lord hath ever proved a lie, false always to thy fellow men, falser to God on high. No share in thy good will I seek, one only boon I pray, the chance to make thee own thyself the villain that I say. Then spoke the king, Enough of words. Ye have my leave to fight, the challenged and the challengers, and God defend the right. Conclusion And from the field of honor went Don Roderick's champion three. Thanks be to God, the Lord of all, that gave the victory. But in the lands of Carrion it was a day of woe, and on the lords of Carrion it fell a heavy blow. He who a noble lady wrongs and casts aside, may he, meet like requital for his deeds or worse, if worse there be, But let us leave them where they lie, their meed is all men's scorn. Turn we to speak of him that in a happy hour was born. Valencia the Great was glad, rejoiced at heart to see, the honored champions of her lord return in victory. And Rudiaz grasped his beard, thanks be to God, said he, of part or lot in Carrion, now are my daughters free. Now may I give them without shame, who e'er their suitors be. And favored by the king himself, Alfonso of Leon, prosperous was the wooing of Navarre and Aragon, the bridles of Novara and of Sol in splendor passed. Stately the former nuptials were, but statelier far the last. And he that in a good hour was born, behold how he hath sped, his daughters now to higher rank and greater honor wed. Sought by Navarre and Aragon, for queens his daughters twain, and monarchs of his blood to-day upon the thrones of Spain. And so his honor in the land grows greater day by day. Upon the feast of Pentecost from life he passed away. For him and all of us the grace of Christ let us implore. And here ye have the story of my Cid Compiador. Translation of John Ormsby End of section 25 Recording by Todd Section 26. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. Section 26. Earl of Clarendon, Edward Hyde, 1609 to 1674. The statesman, first known as Mr. Hyde of the Inner Temple, then as Sir Edward Hyde, and finally as the Earl of Clarendon, belongs to the small but most valuable and eminent band who have both made and written history a group which includes, among others, Caesar, Procopius, Sully, and Baber, and on a smaller scale of active importance, Ammianus and Finlay. 
born in dinton wiltshire 1609 he was graduated at oxford in 1626 and had attained a high standing in his profession when the civil troubles began and he determined to devote all his energies to his public duties in parliament during the momentous period of the long parliament he was strongly on the side of the people until the old abuses had been swept away but he would not go with them in paralyzing the royal authority from distrust of charles and when the civil war broke out he took the royal side accompanying the king to oxford and remaining his ablest adviser and loyal friend he was the guardian of charles the second in exile and in sixteen sixty one after the restoration was made lord chancellor and chief minister lord macaulay says of him he was well fitted for his great place no man wrote abler state papers no man spoke with more weight and dignity in council and parliament no man was better acquainted with general maxims of statecraft no man observed the varieties of character with a more discriminating eye it must be added that he had a strong sense of moral and religious obligation a sincere reverence for the laws of his country and a conscientious regard for the honor and interest of the crown but his faults were conspicuous one of his critics insisted that his temper was arbitrary and vehement his arrogance was immeasurable his gravity assumed the character of censoriousness he took part in important and dangerous negotiations and eventually alienated four parties at once the royalists by his bill of indemnity the low churchmen and dissenters by his uniformity act the many who suffered the legal fine for private assemblages for religious worship and the whole nation by selling dunkirk to france by the court he was hated because he censured the extravagance and looseness of the life led there and finally charles who had long resented his sermons deprived him of the great seal accused him of high treason and doomed him to perpetual banishment thus after being the confidential friend of two kings and the future grandfather of two sovereigns mary and anne he was driven out of england to die in poverty and neglect at rouen in sixteen seventy four but these last days were perhaps the happiest and most useful of his life he now indulged his master passion for literature and revised his history of the rebellion which he had begun while a fugitive from the rebels in the isle of jersey in this masterpiece one of the greatest ornaments of the historical literature of england he has described not only the events in which he participated but noted people of the time whom he had personally known the book is written in a style of sober and stately dignity with great acuteness of insight and weightiness of comment it incorporates part of an autobiography afterwards published separately and is rather out of proportion his other works are the essay on an active and contemplative life the life of edward earl of clarendon dialogues on education and the want of respect paid to age miscellaneous essays and contemplation of the psalms of david the character of lord falkland if celebrating the memory of eminent and extraordinary persons and transmitting their great virtues for the imitation of posterity be one of the principal ends and duties of history it will not be thought impertinent in this place to remember a loss which no time will suffer to be forgotten and no success or good fortune could repair in this unhappy battle was slain the lord viscount falkland 
a person of such prodigious parts of learning and knowledge of that inimitable sweetness and delight in conversation of so flowing and obliging a humanity and goodness to mankind and of that primitive simplicity and integrity of life that if there were no other brand upon this odious and accursed civil war than that single loss it must be most infamous and execrable to all posterity before this parliament his condition of life was so happy that it was hardly capable of improvement before he came to twenty years of age he was master of a noble fortune which descended to him by the gift of a grandfather without passing through his father or mother who were then both alive and not well enough contented to find themselves passed by in the descent his education for some years had been in ireland where his father was lord deputy so that when he returned into england to the possession of his fortune he was unentangled with any acquaintance or friends which usually grow up by the custom of conversation and therefore was to make a pure election of his company which he chose by other rules than were prescribed to the young nobility of that time and it cannot be denied though he admitted some few to his friendship for the agreeableness of their natures and their undoubted affection to him that his familiarity and friendship for the most part was with men of the most eminent and sublime parts and of untouched reputation in the point of integrity and such men had a title to his bosom he was a great cherisher of wit and fancy and good parts in any man and if he found them clouded with poverty or want a most liberal and bountiful patron towards them even above his fortune of which in those administrations he was such a dispenser as if he had been trusted with it to such uses and if there had been the least of vice in his expense he might have been thought too prodigal he was constant and pertinacious in whatever he resolved to do and not to be wearied by any pains that were necessary to that end and therefore having once resolved not to see london which he loved above all places till he had perfectly learned the greek tongue he went to his own house in the country and pursued it with that indefatigable industry that it will not be believed in how short a time he was master of it and accurately read all the greek historians in this time his house being within ten miles of oxford he contracted familiarity and friendship with the most polite and accurate men of that university who found such an immenseness of wit and such a solidarity of judgment in him so infinite a fancy bound in by a most logical ratiocination such a vast knowledge that he was not ignorant in anything yet such an excess of humility as if he had known nothing that they frequently resorted and dwelt with him as in a college situated in a purer air so that his house was a university bound in a less volume whither they came not so much for repose as study and to examine and refine those grosser propositions which laziness and consent made current in vulgar conversation the great opinion he had of the uprightness and integrity of those persons who appeared most active especially of mr hampton kept him longer from suspecting any design against the peace of the kingdom and though he differed commonly from them in conclusions he believed long their purposes were honest when he grew better informed what was law and discerned in them a desire to control that law by a vote of one or both houses no man more opposed those attempts and gave the adverse party more trouble by reason and argumentation 
insomuch as he was by degrees looked upon as an advocate for the court to which he contributed so little that he declined those addresses and even those invitations which he was obliged almost by civility to entertain and he was so jealous of the least imagination that he should incline to preferment that he affected even a morosity to the court and to the courtiers and left nothing undone which might prevent and divert the king's or queen's favour towards him but the deserving it for when the king sent for him once or twice to speak with him and to give thanks for his excellent comportment in those councils which his majesty graciously termed doing him service his answers were more negligent and less satisfactory than might have been expected as if he cared only that his actions should be just not that they should be acceptable and that his majesty should think that they proceeded only from the impulsion of conscience without any sympathy in his affections, which, from a stoical and sullen nature, might not have been misinterpreted. Yet, from a person of so perfect a habit of generous and obsequious compliance with all good men, might very well have been interpreted by the king as more than an ordinary averseness to his service, so that he took more pains and more forced his nature to actions unagreeable and unpleasant to it, that he might not be thought to incline to the court than any man hath done to procure an office there. Two reasons prevailed with him to receive the seals, and but for those he had resolutely avoided them the first consideration that it his refusal might bring some blemish upon the king's affairs and that men would have believed that he had refused so great an honour and trust because he must have been with it obliged to do somewhat else not justifiable and this he made matter of conscience since he knew the king made choice of him before other men especially because he thought him more honest than other men the other was lest he might be thought to avoid it out of fear to do an ungracious thing to the house of commons who were sorely troubled at the displacing of harry vane whom they looked upon as removed for having done them those offices they stood in need of and the disdain of so popular an encumbrance wrought upon him next to the other for as he had a full appetite of fame by just and generous actions so he had an equal contempt of it by any servile expedients and he had so much the more consented to and approved the justice upon sir harry vane in his own private judgment by how much he surpassed most men in the religious observation of a trust the violation whereof he would not admit of any excuse for for these reasons he submitted to the king's command and became his secretary with as humble and devout an acknowledgment of the greatness of the obligation as could be expressed and as true a sense of it in his own heart yet two things he could never bring himself to whilst he continued in that office that was to his death for which he was contented to be reproached as for omissions in a most necessary part of his office the one employing of spies or giving any countenance or entertainment to them i do not mean such emissaries as with danger would venture to view the enemy's camp and bring intelligence of their number and quartering or such generals as such an observation can comprehend but those who by communication of guilt or dissimulation of manners wound themselves into such trusts and secrets as enabled them to make discoveries for the benefit of the state the other the liberty of opening letters upon a suspicion that they might contain matter of dangerous consequence for the first he would say such instruments must be void of all ingenuity and common honesty before they could be of use and afterwards they could never be fit to be credited 
and that no single preservation could be worth so general a wound and corruption of human society as the cherishing such persons would carry with it the last he thought such a violation of the law of nature that no qualification by office could justify a single person in the trespass and though he was convinced by the necessity and iniquity of the time that those advantages of information were not to be declined and were necessarily to be practised he found means to shift it from himself when he confessed he needed excuse and pardon for the omission so unwilling he was to resign anything in his nature to an obligation in his office in all other particulars he filled his place plentifully being sufficiently versed in languages to understand any that are used in business and to make himself again understood to speak of his integrity and his high disdain of any bait that might seem to look towards corruption in tanto viro injuria virtutum fuerit in the case of so great a man would be an insult to his merits he had a courage of the most clear and keen temper and so far from fear that he was not without appetite of danger and therefore upon any occasion of action he always engaged his person in those troops which he thought by the forwardness of the commanders to be most like to be farthest engaged and in all such encounters he had about him a strange cheerfulness and companionableness without at all affecting the execution that was then principally to be attended in which he took no delight but took pains to prevent it where it was not by resistance necessary insomuch that at edgehill when the enemy was routed he was like to have incurred great peril by interposing to save those who had thrown away their arms and against whom it may be others were more fierce for their having thrown them away insomuch as a man might think he came into the field only out of curiosity to see the face of danger and charity to prevent the shedding of blood yet in his natural inclination he acknowledged that he was addicted to the profession of a soldier and shortly after he came to his fortune and before he came to age he went into the low countries with a resolution of procuring command and to give himself up to it from which he was converted by the complete inactivity of that summer and so he returned into england and shortly after entered upon that vehement course of study we mentioned before till the first alarm from the north and then again he made ready for the field and though he received some repulse in the command of a troop of horse of which he had a promise he went volunteer with the earl of essex from the entrance into this unnatural war his natural cheerfulness and vivacity grew clouded and a kind of sadness and dejection of spirit stole upon him which he had never been used to yet being one of those who believed that one battle would end all differences and that there would be so great a victory on the one side that the other would be compelled to submit to any conditions from the victor which supposition and conclusion generally sunk into the minds of most men and prevented the looking after many advantages which might then have been laid hold of he resisted those indispositions et in luctu bellum interremedia erat and in his grief strife was one of his curatives but after the king's return from brentford and the furious resolution of the two houses not to admit any treaty for peace those indispositions which had before touched him grew into a perfect habit of uncheerfulness and he who had been so exactly unreserved and affable to all men that his face and countenance was always present and vacant to his company and held any cloudiness and less pleasantness of the visage 
a kind of rudeness or incivility became on a sudden less communicable and thence very sad pale and exceedingly affected with the spleen in his clothes and habit which he had intended before always with more neatness and industry and expense than is usual in so great a mind he was now not only incurious but too negligent and in his reception of suitors and the necessary or casual addresses to his place so quick and sharp and severe that there wanted not some men who were strangers to his nature and disposition who believed him proud and imperious from which no mortal man was ever more free the truth is that as he was of a most incomparable gentleness application and even a demissness and submission to good and worthy and entire men so he was naturally which could not but be more evident in his place which objected him to another conversation and intermixture than his own election had done adversus malus injucundus toward evil-doers ungracious and was so ill a dissembler of his dislike and disinclination to ill men that it was not possible for such not to discern it there was once in the house of commons such a declared acceptation of the good service an eminent member had done to them and as they said to the whole kingdom that it was moved he being present that the speaker might in the name of the whole house give him thanks and then that every member might as a testimony of his particular acknowledgment stir or move his hat towards him the which though not ordered when very many did the lord falkland who believed the service itself not to be of that moment and that an honourable and generous person could not have stooped to it for any recompense instead of moving his hat stretched both his arms out and clasped his hands together upon the crown of his hat and held it close down to his head that all men might see how odious that flattery was to him and the very approbation of the person though at that time most popular when there was any overture or hope of peace he would be more erect and vigorous and exceedingly solicitous to press anything which he thought might promote it and sitting amongst his friends often after a deep silence and frequent sighs would with a shrill and sad accent ingeminate the word peace peace and would passionately profess that the very agony of the war and the view of the calamities and desolation the kingdom did and must endure took his sleep from him and would shortly break his heart this made some think or pretend to think that he was so much enamoured on peace that he would have been glad the king should have bought it at any price which was a most unreasonable calumny as if a man that was himself the most punctual and precise in every circumstance that might reflect upon conscience or honour could have wished the king to have committed a trespass against either in the morning before the battle as always upon action he was very cheerful and put himself into the first rank of the lord byron's regiment who was then advancing upon the enemy who had lined the hedges on both sides with musketeers from whence he was shot with a musket in the lower part of the belly and in the instant falling from his horse his body was not found till the next morning till when there was some hope he might have been a prisoner though his nearest friends who knew his temper received small comfort from that imagination thus fell that incomparable young man in the fourth and thirtieth year of his age having so much dispatched the business of life that the oldest rarely attain to that immense knowledge and the youngest enter not into the world with more innocence and whosoever leads such a life 
needs not care upon how short warning it be taken from him. End of section 26section twenty seven library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by rita boutros library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine Section 27. Marcus A. H. Clark, 1846-1881. Although a native of England, Marcus Clark is always classed as an Australian novelist. The son of a barrister, he was born in Kensington, April 24, 1846. In 1864 he went to seek his fortune in Australia. His taste for adventure soon led him to the bush, where he acquired many experiences afterwards used by him for literary material. Drifting into journalism, he joined the staff of the Melbourne Argus. After publishing a series of essays called The Peripatetic Philosopher, he purchased the Australian magazine, the name of which he changed to the Colonial Monthly, and in 1868 published in it his first novel entitled Long Odds. Owing to a long illness, this tale of sporting life was completed by other hands. When he resumed his literary work, he contributed to the Melbourne Punch and edited The Humbug, a humorous journal. He dramatized Charles Reed's and Dion Boucicault's novel of foul play adapted Moliere's Bourgeois Gentilhomme, wrote a drama entitled Plot, successfully performed at the Princess Theatre in 1873, and another play called A Daughter of Eve. He was connected with the Melbourne Press until his death, August 2, 1881. Clark's literary fame rests upon the novel His Natural Life, a strong story describing the life of an innocent man under a life sentence for felony. The story is repulsive, but gives a faithful picture of the penal conditions of the time, and is built upon official records. It appeared in the Australian magazine, and before it was issued in book form, Clark, with the assistance of Sir Charles Gavin Duffy, revised it almost beyond recognition. It was republished in London in 1875 and in New York in 1878. He was also the author of Old Tales of a New Country, Holiday Peak, another collection of short stories, Four Stories High, and an unfinished novel called Felix and Felicitas. Clark was a devoted student of Balzac and Poe, and some of his sketches of rough life in Australia have been compared to Bret Hart's pictures of primitive California days. His power in depicting landscape is shown by this glimpse of a midnight ride in the bush taken from Holiday Peak. There is an indescribable ghastliness about the mountain bush at midnight, which has affected most imaginative people. The grotesque and distorted trees, huddled here and there together in the gloom like whispering conspirators, the little open flats encircled by boulders, which seem the forgotten altars of some unholy worship, the white, bare, and ghostly gum trees, gleaming momentarily among the deeper shades of the forest, the lonely pools begirt with shivering reeds and haunted by the melancholy bittern only, the rifted and draggled creek bed, which seems violently gouged out of the lacerated earth by some savage convulsion of nature, 
the silent and solitary places where a few blasted trees crouch together like withered witches who brooding on some deed of blood have suddenly been stricken horror stiff riding through this nightmare landscape a whir of wings and a harsh cry disturb you from time to time hideous and mocking laughter peals above and about you and huge grey ghosts with little red eyes hop away in gigantic but noiseless bounds you shake your bridle the mare lengthens her stride the tree trunks run into one another the leaves make overhead a continuous curtain the earth reels out beneath you like a strip of grey cloth spun by a furiously flying loom the air strikes your face sharply the bush always grey and colourless parts before you and closes behind you like a fog you lose yourself in this prevailing indecision of sound and colour you become drunk with the wine of the night and losing your individuality sweep onward a flying phantom in a land of shadows selection how a penal system can work by marcus a h clark from his natural life the next two days were devoted to sightseeing sylvia frere was taken through the hospital and the workshops shown the semaphores and shut up by maurice in a dark cell her husband and burgess seemed to treat the prison like a tame animal whom they could handle at their leisure and whose natural ferocity was kept in check by their superior intelligence this bringing of a young and pretty woman into immediate contact with bolts and bars had about it an incongruity which pleased them maurice frere penetrated everywhere questioned the prisoners jested with the jailers even in the munificence of his heart bestowed tobacco on the sick with such graceful rattlings of dry bones they got by and by to point pure where a luncheon had been provided an unlucky accident had occurred at point pure that morning however and the place was in a suppressed ferment a refractory little thief named peter brown aged twelve years had jumped off the high rock and drowned himself in full view of the constables these jumpings off had become rather frequent lately and burgess was enraged at one happening on this particular day if he could by any possibility have brought the corpse of poor little peter brown to life again he would have soundly whipped it for its impertinence it is most unfortunate he said to frere as they stood in the cell where the little body was laid that it should have happened to-day oh says frere frowning down upon the young face that seemed to smile up at him it can't be helped i know those young devils they do it out of spite what sort of character had he very bad johnson the book johnson bringing it the two saw peter brown's iniquities set down in the neatest of running hand and the record of his punishments ornamented in quite an artistic way with flourishes of red ink twentieth november disorderly conduct twelve lashes twenty fourth november insolence to hospital attendant diet reduced fourth december stealing cap from another prisoner twelve lashes fifteenth december absenting himself at roll call two days cells twenty third december insolence and insubordination two days cells eighth january insolence and insubordination twelve lashes twentieth january insolence and insubordination twelve lashes twenty second february insolence and insubordination twelve lashes and one week's solitary sixth march insolence and insubordination twenty lashes that was the last asked frere 
Yes, sir, says Johnson. And then he, um, did it? Just so, sir, that was the way of it. Just so. The magnificent system starved and tortured a child of twelve until he killed himself. That was the way of it. After the farce had been played again, and the children had stood up and sat down, and sung a hymn, and told how many twice five were, and repeated their belief in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, the party reviewed the workshops, and saw the church, and went everywhere but into the room where the body of Peter Brown, aged twelve, lay starkly on its wooden bench, staring at the jail roof which was between it and heaven. Just outside this room Sylvia met with a little adventure. Meekin had stopped behind, and Burgess, being suddenly summoned for some official duty, Frere had gone with him, leaving his wife to rest on a bench that, placed at the summit of the cliff, overlooked the sea. While resting thus, she became aware of another presence, and, turning her head, beheld a small boy with his cap in one hand and a hammer in the other. The appearance of the little creature, clad in a uniform of grey cloth that was too large for him, and holding in his withered little hand a hammer that was too heavy for him, had something pathetic about it. "'What is it you might?' asked Sylvia. "'We thought you might have seen him, Mum,' said the little figure, opening its blue eyes with wonder at the kindness of the tone. "'Him? Whom?' "'Cranky Brown, Mum,' returned the child, "'him as did it this morning. "'Me and Billy knowed him, Mum. "'He was a mate of ours, "'and we wanted to know if he looked happy. "'What do you mean, child?' said she, "'with a strange terror at her heart, "'and then, filled with pity at the aspect of the little being, "'she drew him to her with sudden womanly instinct "'and kissed him. "'He looked up at her with joyful surprise. "'Oh!' he said. Sylvia kissed him again. "'Does nobody ever kiss you, poor little man?' said she. "'Mother used to,' was the reply, "'but she's at home. "'Oh, ma'am, with a sudden crimsoning of the little face, "'may I fetch Billy?' And taking courage from the bright young face, he gravely marched to an angle of the rock and brought out another little creature with another grey uniform and another hammer. "'This is Billy, Mum,' he said. "'Billy never had no mother. Kiss Billy!' The young wife felt the tears rush to her eyes. "'You two poor babies!' she cried. And then, forgetting that she was a lady, dressed in silk and lace, she fell on her knees in the dust, and folding the friendless pair in her arms, wept over them. "'What is the matter, Sylvia?' said Frere, when he came up. "'You've been crying.' "'Nothing, Maurice. At least I will tell you by and by.' When they were alone that evening, she told him of the two little boys, and he laughed. "'Artful little humbugs,' he said, and supported his argument by so many illustrations of the precocious wickedness of juvenile felons that his wife was half convinced against her will. Unfortunately, when Sylvia went away, Tommy and Billy put into execution a plan which they had carried in their poor little heads for some weeks. "'I can do it now,' said Tommy. "'I feel strong.' "'Will it hurt much, Tommy?' said Billy, who was not so courageous. "'Not so much as a whipping.' "'I'm afraid. Oh, Tom, it's so deep. Don't leave me, Tom.' The bigger boy took his little handkerchief from his neck and with it bound his own left hand to his companion's right. "'Now I can't leave you.' "'What was it the lady that kissed us said, Tommy?' "'Lord, have pity of them, two fatherless children,' repeated Tommy. "'Let's say it, Tom.' And so the two babies knelt on the brink of the cliff, and raising the bound hands together, looked up at the sky, and ungrammatically said, "'Lord, have pity on we two fatherless children.' And then they kissed each other, and did it. 
Selection The Valley of the Shadow of Death by Marcus A. H. Clark From His Natural Life It was not until they had scrambled up the beach to safety that the absconders became fully aware of the loss of another of their companions. As they stood on the break of the beach, wringing the water from their clothes, Gabbett's small eye, counting their number, missed the stroke oar. "'Where's Cox?' "'The fool fell overboard,' said Jimmy Vetch shortly. "'He never had as much sense in that skull of his as would keep it sound on his shoulders.' Gabbett scowled. "'That's three of us gone,' he said, in the tones of a man suffering some personal injury." They summed up their means of defense against attack. Sanders and Greenhill had knives. Gabbett still retained the axe in his belt. Vetch had dropped his musket at the neck, and Bodenham and Cornelius were unarmed. "'Let's have a look at the tucker,' said Vetch. There was but one bag of provisions. It contained a piece of salt pork, two loaves, and some uncooked potatoes." Signal Hill Station was not rich in edibles. "'That ain't much,' said the crow, with rueful face. "'Is it, Gabbett?' "'It must do anyway,' returned the giant carelessly. The inspection over, the six proceeded up the shore and encamped under the lee of a rock. Bodnum was for lighting a fire, but Vetch, who by tacit consent had been chosen leader of the expedition, forbade it, saying that the light might betray them. They'll think we're drowned and won't pursue us, he said. So all that night the miserable wretches crouched fireless together. Morning breaks clear and bright, and, free for the first time in ten years, they comprehend that their terrible journey has begun. Where are we to go? "'How are we to live?' asks Bodnum, scanning the barren bush that stretches to the barren sea. "'Gavit, you've been out before. How's it done?' "'We'll make the shepherds' huts and live on their tucker till we get a change of clothes,' said Gavit, evading the main question. "'We can follow the coastline.' "'Steady, lads,' said prudent Vetch. "'We must sneak round yon sandhills and so creep into the scrub.' If they've a good glass at the neck, they can see us. It does seem close, said Bodnum. I could pitch a stone on to the guardhouse. Good-bye, you bloody spot, he adds with sudden rage, shaking his fist vindictively at the penitentiary. I don't want to see you no more till the day of judgment. Vetch divides the provisions, and they travel all that day until dark night. The scrub is prickly and dense, their clothes are torn, their hands and feet bleeding. Already they feel out-wearied. No one pursuing, they light a fire and sleep. The second day they come to a sandy spit that runs out into the sea, and find that they have got too far to the eastward and must follow the shoreline to East Bay Neck. Back through the scrub they drag their heavy feet. That night they eat the last crumb of the loaf. The third day, at high noon, after some toilsome walking, they reach a big hill, now called Collins Mount, and see the upper link of the ear ring, the isthmus of East Bay Neck at their feet. A few rocks are on their right hand, and blue in the lovely distance lies hated Maria Island. We must keep well to the eastward, said Greenhill or we shall fall in with the settlers and get taken. So, passing the isthmus, they strike into the bush along the shore, and tightening their belts over their gnawing bellies, camp under some low-lying hills. The fourth day is notable for the indisposition of Bodnum, who is a bad walker and falling behind, delays the party by frequent cooies. Gabbett threatens him with a worse fate than sore feet if he lingers. Luckily, that evening, Greenhill espies a hut, but not trusting to the friendship of the occupant, they wait until he quits it in the morning, and then send Vetch to forage. 
vetch secretly congratulating himself on having by his counsel prevented violence returns bending under half a bag of flour you'd better carry the flour said he to gabbett and give me the axe gabbett eyes him for a while as if struck by his puny form but finally gives the axe to his mate sanders that day they creep along cautiously between the sea and the hills camping at a creek vetch after much search finds a handful of berries and adds them to the main stock half of this handful is eaten at once the other half reserved for to-morrow the next day they come to an arm of the sea and as they struggle northward maria island disappears and with it all danger from telescopes that evening they reach the camping ground by twos and threes and each wonders between the paroxysms of hunger if his face is as haggard and his eyes as bloodshot as those of his neighbor on the seventh day bodnam says his feet are so bad he can't walk and greenhill with a greedy look at the berries bids him stay behind being in a very weak condition, he takes his companion at his word and drops off about noon the next day. Gabbett, discovering this defection, however, goes back and in an hour or so appears, driving the wretched creature before him with blows as a sheep is driven to the shambles. Greenhill remonstrates at another mouth being thus forced upon the party but the giant silences him with a hideous glance. Jemmy Vetch remembers that Greenhill accompanied Gabbett once before and feels uncomfortable. He gives hint of his suspicions to Sanders, but Sanders only laughs. It is horribly evident that there is an understanding among the three. The ninth son of their freedom, rising upon sandy and barren hillocks, bristling thick with cruel scrub sees the six famine-stricken wretches cursing their god and yet afraid to die all round is the fruitless shadeless shelterless bush above the pitiless heaven in the distance the remorseless sea something terrible must happen that grey wilderness arched by grey heaven stooping to grey sea is a fitting keeper of hideous secrets vetch suggests that oyster bay cannot be far to the eastward the line of ocean is deceitfully close and though such a proceeding will take them out of their course they resolve to make for it after hobbling five miles they seem no nearer than before and nigh dead with fatigue and starvation sink despairingly upon the ground vetch thinks gabbett's eyes have a wolfish glare in them and instinctively draws off from him said greenhill in the course of a dismal conversation i am so weak that i could eat a piece of a man on the tenth day Bodnam refuses to stir, and the others, being scarcely able to drag along their limbs, sit on the ground about him. Greenhill, eyeing the prostrate man, said slowly, I have seen the same done before, boys, and it tasted like pork. Vetch, hearing his savage comrade give utterance to a thought all had secretly cherished, speaks out, crying, It would be murder to do it, and then perhaps we couldn't eat it. Oh, said Gabbett, with a grin, I'll warrant you that, but you must all have a hand in it. Gabbett, Sanders, and Greenhill then go aside, and presently Sanders, coming to the crow, said, He consented to act as flogger. He deserves it. So did Gabbett, for that matter, shudders Vetch. Aye, but Bodenham's feet are sore, said Sanders, and tis a pity to leave him. Having no fire, they made a little windbreak, and Vetch, half dozing behind this, at about three in the morning, hears someone cry out, Christ, and awakes, sweating ice. No one but Gabbett and Greenhill would eat that night. That savage pair, however, make a fire, fling ghastly fragments on the embers, and eat the broil before it is right warm. 
in the morning the frightful carcass is divided that day's march takes place in silence and at the midday halt cornelius volunteers to carry the billy affecting great restoration from the food vetch gives it to him and in half an hour afterward cornelius is missing gabbett and greenhill pursue him in vain and return with curses he'll die like a dog said greenhill alone in the bush jemmy vetch with his intellect acute as ever thinks that cornelius prefers such a death to the one in store for him but says nothing the twelfth morning dawns wet and misty but vetch seeing the provision running short strives to be cheerful telling stories of men who have escaped greater peril vetch feels with dismay that he is the weakest of the party but has some sort of ludicro horrible consolation in remembering that he is also the leanest they come to a creek that afternoon and look until nightfall in vain for a crossing place the next day gabbett and vetch swim across and vetch directs gabbett to cut a long sapling which being stretched across the water is seized by greenhill and the moocher who are dragged over what would you do without me said the crow with a ghastly grin they cannot kindle a fire for greenhill who carries the tinder has allowed it to get wet the giant swings his axe in savage anger at enforced cold and vetch takes an opportunity to remark privately to him what a big man greenhill is on the fourteenth day they can scarcely crawl and their limbs pain them greenhill who is the weakest sees gabbett and the moocher go aside to consult and crawling to the crow whimpers for god's sakes jemmy don't let em murder me i can't help you says vetch looking about in terror think of poor tom bodnam but he was no murderer if they kill me i shall go to hell with tom's blood on my soul he writhes on the ground in sickening terror and gabbett arriving bids vetch bring wood for the fire vetch going sees greenhill clinging to wolfish gabbett's knees and sanders calls after him you will hear it presently jem the nervous crow puts his hands to his ears but is conscious nevertheless of a dull crash and a groan when he comes back gabbett is putting on the dead man's shoes which are better than his own we'll stop here a day or so and rest said he now we've got provisions two more days pass and the three eyeing each other suspiciously resume their march the third day the sixteenth of their awful journey such portions of the carcass as they have with them prove unfit to eat they look into each other's famine sharpened faces and wonder who next we must all die together said sanders quickly before anything else must happen vetch marks the terror concealed in the words and when the dreaded giant is out of earshot says for god's sake let's go on alone alec you see what sort of a cove that gabbett is he'd kill his father before he'd fast one day they made for the bush but the giant turned and strode toward them vetch skipped nimbly on one side but gabbett struck the moocher on the forehead with the axe help jem help cried the victim cut but not fatally and in the strength of his desperation tore the axe from the monster who bore it and flung it to vetch keep it jimmy he cried let's have no more murder done they fare again through the horrible bush until nightfall when vetch in a strange voice called the giant to him he must die either you or he laughs gabbett give me the axe no no said the crow his thin malignant face distorted by a horrible resolution i'll keep the axe stand back you shall hold him and i'll do the job sanders seeing them approach knew his end had come and submitted crying give me half an hour to pray for myself they consent and the bewildered wretch knelt down and folded his hands like a child 
His big stupid face worked with emotion. His great cracked lips moved in desperate agony. He wagged his head from side to side in pitiful confusion of his brutalized senses. I can't think of the words, Jem. Pa, snarled the cripple, swinging the axe. We can't starve here all night. Four days had passed, and the two survivors of this awful journey sat watching each other. The gaunt giant, his eyes gleaming with hate and hunger, sat sentinel over the dwarf. The dwarf, chuckling at his superior sagacity, clutched the fatal axe. For two days they had not spoken to each other. For two days each had promised himself that on the next his companion must sleep and die. Vetch comprehended the devilish scheme of the monster, who had entrapped five of his fellow beings to aid him by their deaths to his own safety, and held aloof. Gabbett watched to snatch the weapon from his companion, and make the odds even for once and forever. In the daytime they travelled on, seeking each a pretext to creep behind the other. In the nighttime, when they feigned slumber, each stealthily raising a hand caught the wakeful glance of his companion. Vetch felt his strength deserting him, and his brain overpowered by fatigue. Surely the giant, muttering, gesticulating, and slavering at the mouth, was on the road to madness. Would the monster find opportunity to rush at him, and, braving the blood-stained axe, kill him by main force? Or would he sleep, and be himself a victim? Unhappy Vetch! It is the terrible privilege of insanity to be sleepless. On the fifth day, Vetch, creeping behind a tree, takes off his belt and makes a noose. He will hang himself. He gets one end of the belt over a bough, and then his cowardice bids him pause. Gabbett approaches. He tries to evade him and steal away into the bush. In vain. The insatiable giant, ravenous with famine and sustained by madness, is not to be shaken off. Vetch tries to run, but his legs bend under him. The axe that has tried to drink so much blood feels heavy as lead. He will fling it away. No, he dares not. Night falls again. He must rest or go mad. His limbs are powerless. His eyelids are glued together. He sleeps as he stands. This horrible thing must be a dream. He is at Port Arthur, or will wake on his pallet in the penny lodging house he slept at when a boy. Is that the deputy come to wake him to the torment of living? It is not time, surely not time yet. He sleeps, and the giant, grinning with ferocious joy, approaches on clumsy tiptoe and seizes the coveted axe. On the northeast coast of Van Diemen's Land is a place called St. Helen's Point, and a certain skipper, being in want of fresh water, landing there with a boat's crew, found on the banks of the creek a gaunt and blood-stained man clad in tattered yellow, who carried on his back an axe and a bundle. When the sailors came within sight of him, he made signs to them to approach, and, opening his bundle with much ceremony, offered them some of its contents. Filled with horror at what the maniac displayed, they seized and bound him. At Hobart Town, he was recognized as the only survivor of the nine desperados who had escaped from Colonel Arthur's natural penitentiary. End of section 27section 28 of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 9 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 9 Section 28, Selected Works by Matthias 
claudius seventeen forty to eighteen fifteen matthias claudius best known as the wandsbecker boat the messenger from wandsbeck was born at rhinefield in holstein august fifteenth seventeen forty he was of excellent stock coming from a long line of clergymen it was said that scarcely another family in schleswig holstein had given to the church so many sons there is but little to record of the quiet boyhood passed in the picturesque stillness of the north german village at the outset the education of claudius was conducted by his father the village pastor from beginning to end his life was simple moderate and well ordered after finishing his school days at plowen he entered the university of jena 1759 with the intention of studying theology in order to follow the traditions of the family and enter the ministry this idea he was soon obliged to relinquish on account of a pulmonary weakness and he turned instead to the study of jurisprudence his strongest attraction was towards literature he became a member of the literary guild in jena and later when he had attained fame as the wandsbecker boat he was intimately associated with voss f l stolberg herder and others of the gottingen fraternity his first verses published in jena in 1763 under the title tandeleien und erzelungen trifles and tales gave no indication of his talents and were no more than the usual student efforts of unconscious imitation they have absolutely no poetic value and are interesting only as they indicate a stage of development in editing his works in later years claudius preserved of this early poetry only one song an ein quella to a spring after leaving the university in seventeen sixty four he took a position as private secretary to count holstein in copenhagen and here under the powerful influence of klopstock whose friendship was at this time the most potent element of his life and in the brilliant circle which that poet had drawn around him claudius entered fully into the life of sentiment and ideas which conduced so largely to his intellectual development some years later after a fallow period spent in the quiet of his father's house at rheinfeld he settled at wandsbeck near altona seventeen seventy one where in connection with bode he published the wandsbecker boat the popular weekly periodical so indissolubly associated with his name his contributions under the name of asmus found everywhere the warmest acceptance in seventeen seventy five through herder's recommendation claudius was appointed chief land commissioner at darmstadt but circumstances rendering the position uncongenial he returned to his beloved wandsbeck where he supported his family by his pen until seventeen eighty eight when crown prince frederick of denmark appointed him reviser of the holstein bank at altona he died in hamburg january first eighteen fifteen in the house of his son-in-law the bookseller perthes a collection of his works with the title asmus omnia sua sacum portens odor samtlich work des wandsbecker boten the collected works of the wandsbeck messenger appeared at hamburg seventeen seventy five to eighteen twelve these collected works comprise songs romances fables poems letters etc originally published in various places the translation of st martin and fenelon marked the pietistic spirit of his later years and is in strong contrast to the exuberance 
which produced the Rheinweinlied, Rhein Wine Song, and Urien's Reis um die Welt, Urien's Journey Around the World. Claudius, as a poet, won the hearts of his countrymen. His verses express his idyllic love of nature and his sympathy with rustic life. The poet and the man are one. His pure and simple style appealed to the popular taste, and some of his lyrics have become genuine folk songs. Speculations on New Year's Day from the Wandsbecker Boat A happy new year, a happy new year to my dear country, the land of old integrity and truth, a happy new year to friends and enemies, Christians and Turks, Hottentots and cannibals, to all on whom God permits his sun to rise and his rain to fall also to the poor negro slaves who have to work all day in the hot sun it's wholly a glorious day the new year's day at other times i can bear that a man should be a little bit patriotic and not make court to other nations true one must not speak evil of any nation the wiser part are everywhere silent and who would revile a whole nation for the sake of the loud ones as i said i can bear at other times that a man should be a little patriotic but on new year's day my patriotism is dead as a mouse and it seems to me on that day as if we were all brothers and had one father who is in heaven as if all the goods of the world were water which god has created for all men as i once heard it said and so i am accustomed every new year's morning to sit down on a stone by the wayside to scratch with my staff in the sand before me and to think of this and of that not of my readers i hold them in all honour but on new year's morning on the stone by the wayside i think not of them but i sit there and think that during the past year i saw the sun rise so often and the moon that i saw so many rainbows and flowers and breathed the air so often and drank from the brook and then i do not like to look up and i take with both hands my cap from my head and look into that then i think also of my acquaintances who have died during the year and how they can talk now with socrates and numa and other men of whom i have heard so much good and with john huss and then it seems as if graves opened round me and shadows with bald crowns and long grey beards came out of them and shook the dust out of their beards that must be the work of the everlasting huntsman who has his doings about the twelfth the old pious longbeards would fain sleep but a glad new year to your memory and to the ashes in your graves rhine wine with laurel wreath the glasses vintage mellow and drink it gaily dry through farthest europe no my worthy fellow for such in vain ye'll try nor hungary nor poland ever could boast it and as for gallia's vine saint viet the ritter if he choose may toast it we germans love the rhine our fatherland we thank for such a blessing and many more beside and many more though little show possessing well worth our love and pride not everywhere the vine bedecks our border as well the mountains show that harbour in their bosoms foul disorder not worth their room below thuringia's hills for instance are aspiring to wear a juice like wine but that is all nor mirth nor song inspiring it breathes not of the vine and other hills with buried treasures glowing for wine are far too cold though iron ores and cobalt there are growing and chants some paltry gold the rhine the rhine 
there grow the gay plantations o oh, hallowed be the rhine upon his banks are brewed the rich potations of this consoling wine drink to the rhine and every coming morrow be mirth and music thine and when we meet a child of care and sorrow we'll send him to the rhine winter a song to be sung behind the stove old winter is the man for me stout-hearted sound and steady steel nerves and bones of brass hath he come snow come blow he's ready if ever man was well tis he he keeps no fire in his chamber and yet from cold and cough is free in bitterest december he dresses him outdoors at morn nor needs he first to warm him toothache and rheumatis he'll scorn and colic don't alarm him in summer when the woodland rings he asks what mean these noises warm sounds he hates and all warm things most heartily despises but when the fox's bark is loud when the bright hearth is snapping when children round the chimney crowd all shivering and clapping when stone and bone with frost do break and pond and lake are cracking then you may see his old side shake such glee his frame is racking near the north pole upon the strand he has an icy tower likewise in lovely switzerland he keeps a summer bower so up and down now here now there his regiments manoeuvre when he goes by we stand and stare and cannot choose but shiver night song the moon is up in splendour and golden stars attend her the heavens are calm and bright trees cast a deepening shadow and slowly off the meadow a mist is rising silver white night's curtains now closing round half a world reposing in calm and holy trust all seems one vast still chamber where weary hearts remember no more the sorrows of the dust translations of charles t brooks end of section twenty eight Section 29 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Pyle. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. Section 29. Henry Clay. 1777 to 1852 by john r proctor henry clay must not be judged as an order by his reported speeches which are but skeletons of the masterly originals but by the lasting effect of these speeches on those who heard them and by his ability as an originator of important measures and his success in carrying these measures to a conclusion by convincing and powerful oratory judged by his achievements and by his widespread influence he must take rank as a statesman and orator of pre-eminent ability the son of a poor baptist clergyman with but scant advantages for acquiring an education leaving home at an early age and going among strangers to a community where family ties and social connections were a controlling element this poor boy with no family influence assumed at once by sheer force of character and ability a leadership which he held undisputed until his death and the years after he had passed away, it was the followers of Henry Clay who kept Kentucky from joining the states of the South in their unsuccessful efforts to withdraw from the Union. Of his oratory, Robert C. Winthrop wrote after a lapse of years, I can only bear witness to an impressiveness of speech never exceeded, if ever equaled, within an experience of half a century, during which I have listened to many of the greatest orators on both sides of the Atlantic. As a parliamentary leader, Rhodes calls him the greatest in our history. His leadership, says Mr. Schurz, was not of that mean order which merely contrives to organize a personal following. It was the leadership of a statesman zealously striving to promote great public interests. 
As a presiding officer, he was the most commanding speaker the National House of Representatives has ever had. Winthrop, who served long with him in Congress, said of him, No abler or more commanding presiding officer ever sat on the speaker's chair on either side of the Atlantic. Prompt, dignified, resolute, fearless, he had a combination of intellectual and physical qualities which made him a natural ruler over men. He was six times elected speaker, sometimes almost by acclamation, and during the many years which he presided over the House, not one of his decisions was ever reversed. As a Secretary of State, during his term of four years, the treaties with foreign countries negotiated by him exceeded in numbers all that had been negotiated by other secretaries during the previous thirty-five years of our constitutional history. As a diplomat, he showed himself at Ghent more than a match for the trained diplomatists of the old world. And with all these he was, at his ideal country home, Ashland, surrounded by wooded lawns and fertile acres of beautiful blue grass land, a most successful farmer and breeder of thoroughbred stock, from the Scotch collie to the thoroughbred racehorse. I have been told by one who knew him as a farmer that no one could guess nearer to the weight of a short-horn bullock than he. He was as much at home with horses and horsemen as with senators and diplomats. I have known many men who were friends and followers of Mr. Clay, and from the love and veneration these men had for his memory, I can well understand why the historian Rhodes says, No man has been loved as the people of the United States loved Henry Clay. Clay seemed to have had honors, and leadership thrust upon him. Arriving in Kentucky in 1797, he had once advocated the gradual emancipation of slaves, regardless of the strong prejudices to the contrary of the rich slaveholding community in which he had cast his lot. Yet, unsolicited on his part, this community elected him to the state legislature by a large majority in 1803, and before three years of service he was chosen by his fellow members to fill a vacancy in the United States Senate. And until his death in 1852, his constituents in Kentucky vied with each other in their desires to keep him as their representative in either the National Senate or House of Representatives. He entered the latter in 1811, and was selected as Speaker of that body almost by acclamation, on the first day of his taking his seat. After a long life spent in his country's service, he was elected unanimously to the Senate in 1848, despite party strife and the fact that the two parties were almost evenly divided in Kentucky. No attempt can here be made to even recapitulate the events of importance connected with his long public services. I will call attention only to some of the most important measures which he carried by his magnificent leadership. War of 1812. Clay assumed the leadership of those who urged resistance to the unjust and overbearing encroachments of Great Britain, and he more than anyone else was instrumental in overcoming opposition and forcing a declaration of war. This war, a second war for independence, which changed this country from a disjointed confederacy liable to fall asunder to a compact, powerful, and self-respecting union, will ever be regarded as one of the crowning glories of his long and brilliant career. He proved more than a match in debate for Randolph, Quincy, and other able advocates for peace. When asked what we were to gain by war, he answered, What are we not to lose by peace, commerce, character, a nation's best treasure, honor? In answer to the arguments that certificates of protection authorized by Congress were fraudulently used, his magnificent answer, the colors that float from the masthead should be the credentials of our seamen. Electrified the Patriots of the Country There is but a meager report of this great speech, but the effect produced was overwhelming and bore down all opposition. It is said that men of both parties, forgetting all antipathies under the spell of his eloquence, wept together. Mr. Clay's first speech on entering Congress was in favor of the encouragement of domestic manufactures, mainly as a defensive measure in anticipation of a war with Great Britain, arguing that whatever doubts might be entertained, as to the general policy of encouraging domestic manufacturers by import duties, none could exist regarding the propriety of adopting measures for producing such articles as are requisite in times of war. If his measure for the increase of the standing army had been adopted in time, the humiliating reverses on land during the early part of the war would have been averted. He carried through a bill for the increase of the navy, and the brilliant naval victories of the War of 1812 followed. In the debate on the bill to provide for a standing army, 
it was argued that 25,000 could not be had in the United States. Clay aroused the people of Kentucky to such enthusiasm that 15,000 men volunteered in that state alone, and members of Congress shouldered their muskets and joined the ranks. Treaty of Ghent Henry Clay's faith in the destiny of his country and his heroic determination that a continuation of the war was preferable to the terms proposed prevented humiliating concessions. The American commissioners were Henry Clay, John Quincy Adams, Albert Gallatin, James A. Bayard, and Jonathan Russell, and the British commissioners Lord Gambier, Henry Goulburn, and William Adams. The news received by Clay on his arrival in Europe was not calculated to inspire him with hope. From Mr. Bayard he received a letter dated April 20th, 1814, with news of the triumph of the Allies over Napoleon, and stating, There is reason to think that it has materially changed the views of the British ministry. The great augmentation of their disposable force presents an additional temptation to prosecute the war. By the same mail, Mr. Gallatin writes from London, April 22nd, 1814, You are sufficiently aware of the total change in our affairs produced by the late revolution, and by the restoration of universal peace in the European world, from which we are alone excluded. A well-organized and large army is at once liberated from any European employment, and ready, together with a superabundant naval force, to act independently against us. How ill-prepared we are to meet it in a proper manner, no one knows better than yourself, and above all, our own divisions and the hostile attitude of the eastern states give room to apprehend that a continuation of the war might prove vitally fatal to the United States. Mr. Russell writes from Stockholm, July 2nd, 1814. My distress at the delay which our joint errand has encountered has almost been intolerable, and the kind of comfort I have received from Mr. Adams has afforded very little relief. His apprehensions are rather of a gloomy cast with regard to the result of our labors. Mr. Crawford, our minister to France, who with Clay favored a vigorous prosecution of the war, writes to him, July 4, 1814, I am thoroughly convinced that the United States can never be called upon to treat under circumstances less auspicious than those which exist at the present moment, unless our internal bickering shall continue to weaken the effects of the government. With discouraging news from home, the seat of the government taken, and the capital burned, the eastern states opposing the war and threatening to withdraw from the Union, and his fellow commissioners in the despondent mood evidenced by the above-quoted letters, it is amazing that Clay, whom some historians have called a compromiser by nature, opposed any and all concessions, and wished that the war should go on. By the third article of the Treaty of 1783, it was agreed that citizens of the United States should not fish in the waters or cure fish on the land of any of the maritime provinces north of the United States, after they were settled, without a previous agreement with the inhabitants or possessors of the ground. By the eighth article of the same treaty, it was agreed that the navigation of the Mississippi River should ever remain free and open to the subjects of Great Britain and the United States. It was then supposed that the British-Canadian possessions included the headwaters of this river. By the Jay Treaty of 1794, this was confirmed, and that all ports and places on its eastern side, to whichever of the parties belonging, might be freely resorted to and used by both parties. At this time Spain possessed the sovereignty of the west side of the river, and both sides from its mouth to 31 degrees north latitude. The United States acquired by the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 all the sovereignty of Spain, which had previously been acquired by France. Gallatin proposed to insert a provision for the renewal to the United States of the rights in the fisheries, and as an equivalent to give to Great Britain the right to the navigation of the Mississippi River. This was favored by Gallatin, Adams, and Bayard, and opposed by Clay and Russell. Mr. Clay, seeing that he was in a minority, stated that he would affix his name to no treaty which contained such a provision. After his firm stand, Mr. Bayard left the majority. Clay's obstinacy in opposing concessions is well shown in Mr. Adams' journal. To this article, the right of the British to navigate the Mississippi River, Mr. Clay makes strong objections. He is willing to leave the matter of the fisheries as a nest egg for another war. He considers it a privilege much too important to be conceded for the mere liberty of drying fish upon a desert. But the Mississippi was destined to form a most important part of the interest of the American Union. Mr. Clay, of all the members, had alone been urgent to present an article stipulating the abolition of impressment. Mr. Clay lost his temper, as he generally does whenever the right of the British to navigate the Mississippi is discussed. December 11th. 
he, Clay, was for war three years longer. He had no doubt, but three years more of war would make us a warlike people, and that then we would come out of the war with honor. December 2nd. At last he turned to me and asked me whether I would not join him now and break off negotiations. After five months of weary negotiations under most adverse conditions so far as the American commissioners were concerned, the treaty was signed on December 24th, 1814. During all these months, Clay had resisted any and all concessions, and none were made. The Marquis of Wellesley declared in the House of Lords that the American commissioners had shown a most astonishing superiority over the British during the whole of the correspondence. During Mr. Clay's absence at Ghent, his admiring constituents returned him to Congress by an almost unanimous vote. A year later in Congress, Clay referred to his part in the bringing on the war as follows. I gave a vote for a declaration of war. I exerted all the little influence and talent I could command to make the war. The war was made. It is terminated. And I declare with perfect sincerity, if it had been permitted to me to lift the veil of futurity and to foresee the precise series of events which had occurred, my vote would have been unchanged. We had been insulted and outraged and spoliated upon by almost all Europe. By Great Britain, by France, Spain, Denmark, Naples, and to cap the climax by the little contemptible power of Algiers. We had submitted too long and too much. We had become the scorn of foreign powers and the derision of our own citizens. What have we gained by the war? Let any man look at the degraded condition of this country before the war the scorn of the universe, the contempt of ourselves, and tell me if we have gained nothing by the war. What is our situation now? Respectability and character abroad, security and confidence at home. Clay more than any other man forced the war. He was the successful military hero of this war, the victor of New Orleans, who defeated him in after years for the presidency. Missouri Compromise the heated struggle in Congress over the admission of Missouri into the Union first brought prominently forward the agitation of the slavery question. This struggle, which lasted from 1818 to 1821, threatened the very existence of the Union. Jefferson wrote from Monticello, The Missouri question is the most portentous one that has ever threatened the Union. In the gloomiest moments of the Revolutionary War, I never had any apprehension equal to that I feel from this source. Mr. Schurz, writing of the feeling at the time, says, While thus the thought of dissolving the Union occurred readily to the Southern mind, the thought of maintaining the government and preserving the Union by means of force hardly occurred to anybody. It seemed to be taken for granted on all sides that if the Southern states insisted on cutting loose from the Union, nothing could be done but to let them go. The two sections were at this time so evenly balanced that the maintenance of the Union by force could not have been successfully attempted. The compromise which admitted Missouri to the Union as a slave state and recognized the right of settlers to carry slaves into the territory south of 36 degree 30 minutes was carried through by the splendid leadership of Clay, who thus earned the title of the Great Pacificator. Future historians will accord to him the title of the Savior of the Union. Upon the adoption of the compromise measures, Mr. Clay resigned his seat in Congress to give his attention to his private affairs, being financially embarrassed by endorsing for a friend. During his stay at home, there was a fierce controversy over the issue of paper money and relief measures to favor debtors who had become involved through recklessness following such inflation. Against what seemed to be an overwhelming popular feeling, Clay arrayed himself on the side of sound money and sound finance. In 1823, he was again returned to the House of Representatives without opposition and was chosen Speaker by a vote of 139 to 42. Internal Improvements Soon after his entrance into Congress, Clay took advanced ground in favor of building roads, improving waterways, and constructing canals by the general government in order to connect the seaboard states with the boundless empire of the growing West. He became the leader, the foremost champion of a system which was bitterly opposed by some of the ablest statesmen of the time, as unauthorized by the Constitution. Clay triumphed, and during his long public service was the recognized leader of a system which, though opposed at first, has been accepted as a national policy by both of the great political parties. That he was actuated by a grand conception of the future destiny of the country and the needs of such improvements to ensure a more perfect union, his able speeches on these questions will show. In one, he said, 
Every man who looks at the Constitution in the spirit to entitle him to the character of statesman must elevate his views to the height to which this nation is destined to reach in the rank of nations. We are not legislating for this moment only, or for the present generation, or for the present populated limits of the United States. But our acts must embrace a wider scope, reaching northward to the Pacific and southwardly to the River del Norte. Imagine this extent of territory with sixty or seventy or hundred millions of people. The powers which exist now will exist then, and those which will exist then exist now. What was the object of the Convention in framing the Constitution? The leading object was union. Union, then peace. Peace external and internal, and commerce. But more particularly union and peace, the great objects of the framers of the Constitution, should be kept steadily in view in the interpretation of any clause of it, and when it is susceptible of various interpretation. For that construction should be preferred which tends to promote the objects of the framers of the Constitution to the consolidation of the Union. No man deprecates more than I do the idea of consolidation. Yet between separation and consolidation, painful as would be the alternative, I would greatly prefer the latter. Congress now appropriates yearly for internal improvements a sum far greater than the entire revenue of the government at the time Clay made this speech. Spanish-American Independence It was but natural that Clay's ardent nature and his love of liberty would incline him to aid the people of Central and South America in their efforts to free themselves from Spanish oppression and misrule. Effective here, as in all things undertaken by him, his name must always be linked with the cause of Southern American independence. Richard Rush, writing from London to Clay in 1825, says, The South Americans owe to you, more than to any other man of either hemisphere, their independence. His speeches, translated into Spanish, were read to the revolutionary armies, and his name was a household name among the patriots. Bolivar, writing to him from Bogota in 1827, says, all America, Colombia, and myself owe Your Excellency our purest gratitude for the incomparable services which you have rendered to us by sustaining our cause with sublime enthusiasm. In one of his speeches on this subject, Clay foreshadows a great American Zolferine. The failure of the Spanish-American republics to attain the high ideals hoped for by Clay caused him deep regret in after years. The American System the Tariff Law of 1824 was another triumph of Clay's successful leadership, since which time he has been called the father of what has been termed the American system. It must be remembered that Clay was first led to propose protective duties in order to prepare this country for a war which he felt could not be avoided without loss of national honor, when in 1824 he advocated increased tariff duties in order to foster home industries. Protection was universal. Even our agricultural products were excluded from British markets by the Corn Laws. The man who would now advocate in Congress duties as low as those levied by the Tariff Law of 1824 would be called by protectionists of the present day a free trader. When in 1833 nullification of the Tariff Laws was threatened, Clay, while demanding that the laws should be enforced and that, if necessary, nullification should be put down by the strong arm of the government, feared that the growing discontent of the South and the obstinacy of a military president threatened the Union, introduced and carried to a conclusion a compromised tariff measure that brought peace to the country. Secretary of State It was unfortunate that Clay temporarily relinquished his leadership in Congress to accept the premiership in the cabinet of President Adams. Although the exacting official duties were not congenial and proved injurious to his health, his administration of this high office was brilliant and able, as is well attested by the number of important treaties concluded. His instructions to the United States delegates to the Panama Congress of American Republics will grow in importance in the years to come, because of the broad principles there enunciated, that private property should be exempt from seizure on the high seas in times of war. His chivalrous loyalty to President Adams was fully appreciated, and his friendship reciprocated. After the close of his administration, Mr. Adams, in a speech, said, As to my motives for tendering him the Department of State when I did, let the man who questions them come forward. Let him look around among the statesmen and legislators of the nation and of that day. Let him select and name the man whom, by his preeminent talents, by his splendid services, by his ardent patriotism, by his all-embracing public spirit, 
by his fervid eloquence in behalf of the rights and liberties of mankind, by his long experience in the affairs of the Union, foreign and domestic, a President of the United States intent only upon the honor and welfare of his country, ought to have preferred to Henry Clay. Yes, before the close of his administration, President Adams offered him a position on the bench of the Supreme Court, which he declined. His Position on African Slavery Clay was a slaveholder, a kind master, but through his entire public life an open advocate of emancipation. He promptly received his early predilections against slavery from his association with Chancellor White, before removing from Virginia, as indeed the best part of his education probably came from personal contact with that able man. The intellectual forces of the border slave states were arrayed in favor of emancipation until, as Clay writes with some feeling in 1849, they were driven to an opposite course by the violent and indiscreet course of ultra-abolitionists in the North. But Clay remained to his death hopeful that by peaceable means his country might be rid of this great evil. In the letter above quoted, writing of his failure to establish a system of gradual emancipation in Kentucky, he says, It is a consoling reflection that although a system of gradual emancipation cannot be established, slavery is destined inevitably to extinction by the operation of peaceful and natural causes. And it is also gratifying to believe that there will not be probably much difference in the period of its existence whether it terminates legally or naturally. The chief difference in the two modes is that, according to the first, we should take hold of the institution intelligently and dispose of it cautiously and safely, while according to the other, it will some day or other take hold of us and constrain us in some manner or other to get rid of it. As early as 1798, he made his first political speeches in Kentucky, advocating an amendment to the state constitution, providing for the gradual emancipation of the slaves. Referring to the failure to adopt this amendment, he said in a speech delivered in the capital of Kentucky in 1829, I shall never cease to regret a decision, the effects of which have been to place us in the rear of our neighbors, who are exempt from slavery, in the state of agriculture, the progress of manufactures, the advance of improvements, and the general progress of society. In these days, when public men who should be leaders bend to what they believe to be the popular wishes, the example of Clay, in his bold disregard of the prejudices and property interests of his constituents, is inspiring. George W. Prentice was sent from New England to Kentucky to write a life of Clay, and writing in 1830, he says, Whenever a slave brought an action at law for his liberty, Mr. Clay volunteered as his advocate, and it is said that in the whole course of his practice he never failed to obtain a verdict in the slave's favor. He has been the slave's friend through life. In all stations he has pleaded the cause of African freedom without fear, from high or low. To him, more than to any other individual, is to be ascribed the great revolution which has taken place upon this subject, a revolution whose wheels must continue to move onward till they reach the goal of universal freedom. Three years before this was written, Clay, in a speech before the Colonization Society, said, If I could be instrumental in eradicating this deepest stain upon the character of my country and removing all cause of reproach, on account of it by foreign nations. If I could only be instrumental in ridding of this foul blot that revered state which gave me birth, or that not less beloved state which kindly adopted me as her son, I would not exchange the proud satisfaction which I should enjoy for the honor of all the triumphs ever decreed to the most successful conqueror. He longed to add the imperial domain of Texas to this country, but feared that it would so strengthen the slave power as to endanger the Union. And when finally he yielded to the inevitable, the free soilers threw their votes to Bernie and thus defeated Clay for the presidency. He deprecated the war with Mexico, yet gave his favorite son as a soldier who fell at Buena Vista. He stood for the reception of anti-slavery petitions by Congress against the violent opposition of the leading men of his own section. He continued steadfast to the end, writing in 1849 that if slavery were, as claimed, a blessing, the principle on which it is maintained would require that one portion of the white race should be reduced to bondage to serve another portion of the same race, when black subjects of slavery could not be obtained. He proposed reasonable schemes for gradual emancipation and deportation, which would, if adopted, have averted the war and settled peaceably the serious problem. He warned the Southerners in 1849 that their demands were unreasonable and would lead to the formation of a sectional northern party, which would sooner or later take permanent and exclusive possession of the government. 
Seeming inconsistencies in Mr. Clay's record on this subject will disappear with a full understanding of the difficulties of his position. Living in a state midway between the North and South, where slavery existed in its mildest and least objectionable form, yet fully alive to its evils, recognizing that the grave problem requiring solution was not alone slavery, but the presence among a free people of a numerous, fecund, servile, alien race, realizing that one section of the country, then relatively too powerful to be ignored, was ready to withdraw from the Union rather than to submit to laws that would endanger slavery, loving the Union with an ardor not excelled by that of any public man in our history, wishing and striving for the emancipation of the slaves, yet too loyal to the Union, to follow the more zealous advocates of freedom in their higher law than the Constitution crusade, Mr. Clay, in his whole course on this question, was consistent and patriotic in the highest degree. THE COMPROMISE OF 1850 The crowning triumph of a long life of great achievements was his great compromise measures of 1850. These, with their predecessors of 1821 and 1833, have caused some writers to speak of Clay as a man of compromising nature. The reverse is true. Bold, aggressive, uncompromising, and often dictatorial by nature, he favored compromise when convinced that only by such means could civil war or a disruption of the Union be averted. And he was right. He averted a conflict or separation from the Union when the relative strength of the South was such as to have rendered impossible for the preservation of the Union by force. The Constitution was a compromise, without which there would have been no Union of States. That the compromise did not long survive him was no fault of Clay's, but chargeable to the agitators of both sections who cared less for the Union than for their pet theories or selfish interests. Two years after his death, the compromise measures were repealed, and the most destructive civil war of modern times and a long list of resultant evils are the result. Those who knew Henry Clay and had felt his wonderful power as a leader are firm in the belief that had he been alive and in the possession of his faculties in 1861, the Civil War would have been averted. His name and the memory of his love for the Union restrained his adopted state from joining the South. The struggle over the passage of the compromise measures, lasting for seven months, was one of the most memorable parliamentary struggles on record. The old hero, Henry Clay, broken in health, with the stamp of death upon him, for six weary months, led the fight with much of his old-time fire and ability. Sustained by indomitable will and supreme love of country, I am here, he said, expecting soon to go hence, and owing no responsibility but to my own conscience and to God. In his opening speech, which lasted for two days, he said, I owe it to myself to say that no earthly power can induce me to vote for a specific measure for the introduction of slavery, where it had not before existed, either south or north of that line. Sir, while you reproach unjustly too our British ancestors for the introduction of this institution upon the continent of America, I am for one unwilling that the posterity of the present inhabitants of California and New Mexico shall reproach us for doing just what we reproach Great Britain for doing to us. He upbraided, on the one hand, the ultra-abolitionists as reckless agitators and hurled defiance at disunionists of the South, while at the same time appealing to the loftier nature and patriotic impulses of his hearers. I believe from the bottom of my soul this measure is the reunion of the Union. And now let us discard all resentments, all passions, all petty jealousies, all personal desires, all love of peace, all hungering after gilded crumbs which fall from the table of power. Let us forget popular fears from whatever quarter they may spring. Let us go to the fountain of unadulterated patriotism, and performing a solemn lustration, return divested of all selfish, sinister, and sordid impurities, and think alone of our God, our country, our conscience, and our glorious union. As described by Bancroft, Clay was in stature over six feet, spare and long-limbed. He stood erect as if full of vigor and vitality, and ever ready to command. His countenance expressed perpetual wakefulness and activity. His voice was music itself, and yet penetrating and far-reaching, enchanting the listeners. His words followed rapidly without sing-song or mannerism in a clear and steady stream. Neither in public nor in private did he know how to be dull. Bold, fearless, commanding the lordliest leader of his day, he was yet gentle, and as an old friend wrote, was the most emotional man I ever knew. I have seen his eyes fill instantly on shaking the hand of an old friend, however obscure, who had stood by him in his early struggles. The manliest of men, yet his voice would tremble with emotion on reading aloud from a letter the love messages from a little grandchild. The following, told me by a gentleman who knew Mr. Clay, illustrates the true gentleman he was. 
When I was a small boy, my father took me with him to visit Mr. Clay at his home, Ashland. We found some gentlemen there who had been invited to dinner. Just before they went in to dinner, my father told me privately to run out and play on the lawn while they were dining. As the gentlemen came out, Mr. Clay saw me, and calling me to him, said, My young friend, I owe you an apology. Turning to the gentleman, he said, Go into the library, gentlemen, and light your cigars. I will join you presently. Taking me by the hand, he returned with me to the table, ordered the servants to attend to my wants, and conversed most delightfully with me until I finished my dinner. He had the faculty of making friends and holding them through life by ties which no circumstances or conditions could sever. When Clay passed away, there was no one whose unionism embraced all sections, who could stand between the overzealous advocates of abolition of slavery on the one side and the fiery defenders of the divine institution on the other. Sectionalism ran riot, and the Civil War was the result. During the many years when the North and South were divided on the question of slavery and sectional feeling ran high, Henry Clay was the only man in public life whose broad nationalism and intense love for the Union embraced all sections, with no trace of sectional bias. He could well be called the Great American. John R. Proctor End of Section 29 Recording by Chris Pyle Section 30 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Pyle. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 30. Excerpts of Selected Speeches by Henry Clay. Public Spirit in Politics, from a speech at Buffalo, July 17, 1839. Are we not then called upon by the highest duties to our country, to its free institutions, to posterity, and to the world, to rise above all local prejudices and personal partialities, to discard all collateral questions, to disregard every subordinate point, and in a genuine spirit of compromise and concession, uniting heart and hand to preserve for ourselves the blessings of a free government, wisely, honestly, and faithfully administered, and as we receive them from our fathers to transmit them to our children. Should we not justly subject ourselves to eternal reproach if we permitted our differences about mere men to bring defeat and disaster upon our cause? Our principles are imperishable, but men have but a fleeting existence and are themselves liable to change and corruption during its brief continuance. On the Greek Struggle for Independence, from a speech in 1824. Are we so mean, so base, so despicable, that we may not attempt to express our horror, utter our indignation, at the most brutal and atrocious war that ever stained earth or shocked high heaven, at the ferocious deeds of a savage and infuriated soldiery, stimulated and urged on by the clergy of a fanatical and inimical religion, and rioting in all the excesses of blood and butchery, at the mere details of which the heart sickens and recoils. If the great body of Christendom can look on calmly and coolly, while all this is perpetuated, on a Christian people, in its own immediate vicinity, in its very presence, let us at least evince that one of its remote extremities is susceptible of sensibility to Christian wrongs, and capable of sympathy for Christian sufferings. That in this remote quarter of the world, there are hearts not yet closed against compassion for human woes that can pour out their indignant feelings at the oppression of a people endeared to us by every ancient recollection and every modern tie. Sir, attempts have been made to alarm the committee by the dangers to our commerce in the Mediterranean, and a wretched invoice of figs and opium has been spread before us to repress our sensibilities and to eradicate our humanity. Ah, sir, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall it avail a nation to save the whole of a miserable trade and lose its liberties? South American Independence as Related to the United States From a Speech Before the House of Representatives in 1818 It is the doctrine of thrones that man is too ignorant to govern himself. Their partisans assert his incapacity in reference to all nations. 
If they cannot command universal assent to the proposition, it is then demanded as to particular nations. And our pride and our presumption too often make converts of us. I contend that it is to arraign the dispositions of Providence himself, to suppose that he has created beings incapable of governing themselves, and to be trampled on by kings. Self-government is the natural government of man, and for proof I refer to the aborigines of our own land. Were I to speculate in hypotheses unfavorable to human liberty, my speculation should be founded rather upon the vices, refinements, or density of population. Crowded together in compact masses, even if they were philosophers, the contagion of the passions is communicated and caught, and the effect too often, I admit, is the overthrow of liberty. Dispersed over such an immense space as that on which the people of Spanish America are spread, their physical and I believe also their moral condition both favor their liberty. With regard to their superstition, they worship the same God with us. Their prayers are offered up in their temples to the same Redeemer, whose intercession we expect to save us. Nor is there anything in the Catholic religion unfavorable to freedom. All religions united with government are more or less inimical to liberty. All separated from government are compatible with liberty. If the people of Spanish America have not already gone so far in religious toleration as we have, the difference in their condition from ours should not be forgotten. Everything is progressive, and in time I hope to see them imitating in this respect our example. But grant that the people of Spanish America are ignorant and incompetent for free government. To whom is that ignorance to be ascribed? Is it not to the execrable system of Spain, which she seeks again to establish and to perpetuate? So far from chilling our hearts, it ought to increase our solicitude for our unfortunate brethren. It ought to animate us to desire the redemption of the minds and bodies of unborn millions from the brutifying effects of a system whose tendency is to stifle the faculties of the soul and to degrade them to the level of beasts. I would invoke the spirits of our departed fathers. Was it for yourselves only that you nobly fought? No, no. It was the chains that were forging for your posterity that made you fly to arms. And scattering the elements of these chains to the winds, you transmitted to us the rich inheritance of liberty. From the Valedictory to the Senate, delivered 1842. From 1806, the period of my entrance upon this noble theatre, with short intervals to the present time, I have been engaged in the public councils at home or abroad. Of the services rendered during that long and arduous period of my life, it does not become me to speak. History, if she deign to notice me, and posterity, if the recollection of my humble actions shall be transmitted to posterity, are the best, the truest, and the most impartial judges. When death has closed the scene, their sentence will be pronounced, and to that I commit myself. My public conduct is a fair subject for the criticism and judgment of my fellow men, but the motives by which I have been prompted are known only to the great searcher of the human heart and to myself, and I trust I may be pardoned for repeating a declaration made some thirteen years ago, that whatever errors, and doubtless there have been many, may be discovered in a review of my public service. I can with unshaken confidence appeal to that divine arbiter, for the truth of the declaration that I have been influenced by no impure purpose, no personal motive, have sought no personal aggrandizement, but that in all my public acts I have had a single eye directed and a warm and devoted heart dedicated to what, in my best judgment, I believe the true interests, the honor of the Union, and the happiness of my country required. During that long period, however, I have not escaped the fate of other public men, nor failed to incur censure and detraction of the bitterest, most unrelenting, and most malignant character. And though not always insensible to the pain it was meant to inflict, I have borne it, in general, with composure and without disturbance, waiting as I have done in perfect and undoubting confidence, for the ultimate triumph of justice and of truth, and in the entire persuasion that time should settle all things that they should be, and that whatever wrong or injustice I might experience at the hands of man, he to whom all hearts are open and fully known, would by the inscrutable dispensations of his providence rectify all error, redress all wrong, and cause ample justice to be done. But I have not meanwhile been unsustained. Everywhere throughout the extent of this great continent, I have had cordial, warm-hearted, faithful, and devoted friends who have known me, loved me, and appreciated my motives. To them, if language were capable of fully expressing my acknowledgments, I would now offer all the return I have the power to make, 
for their genuine disinterested and persevering fidelity and devoted attachment the feelings and sentiments of a heart overflowing with never ceasing gratitude if however i fail in suitable language to express my gratitude to them for all the kindness they have shown me what shall i say what can i say at all commensurate with those feelings of gratitude with which i have been inspired by the state whose humble representative and servant i have been in this chamber i emigrated from virginia to the state of kentucky now nearly forty-five years ago i went as an orphan boy who had not yet attained the age of majority who had never recognized a father's smile nor felt his warm caresses poor penniless without the favor of the great with an imperfect and neglected education hardly sufficient for the ordinary business and common pursuits of life but scarce had i set foot upon her generous soil when i was embraced with parental fondness caressed as though i had been a favorite child and patronized with liberal and unbounded munificence from that period the highest honors of the state have been freely bestowed upon me and when in the darkest hour of calumny and detraction i seemed to be assailed by all the rest of the world she interposed her broad and impenetrable shield repelled the poison shafts that were aimed for my destruction and vindicated my good name from every malignant and unfounded aspersion i return with indescribable pleasure to linger a while longer and mingle with the warm-hearted and whole-souled people of that state and when the last scene shall forever close upon me i hope that my earthly remains will be laid under her green sod with those of her gallant and patriotic sons that my nature is warm my temper ardent my disposition especially in relation to the public service enthusiastic i am ready to own and those who suppose that i have been assuming the dictatorship have only mistaken for arrogance or assumption that ardor and devotion which are natural to my constitution and which i may have displayed with too little regard to cold calculating and cautious prudence in sustaining and zealously supporting important national measures of policy which i have presented and espoused i go from this place under the hope that we shall mutually consign a perpetual oblivion whatever personal collisions may at any time unfortunately have occurred between us and that our recollection shall dwell in future only on those conflicts of mind with mind those intellectual struggles those noble exhibitions of the powers of logic argument and eloquence honorable to the senate and to the nation in which each has sought and contended for what he deemed the best mode of accomplishing one common object the interest and the most happiness of our beloved country to these thrilling and delightful scenes it will be my pleasure and my pride to look back in my retirement with unmeasured satisfaction may the most precious blessings of heaven rest upon the whole senate and each member of it and may the labors of every one redound to the benefit of the nation and to the advancement of his own fame and renown and when you shall retire to the bosom of your constituents may you receive the most cheering and gratifying of all human rewards their cordial greeting of well done good and faithful servant from the lexington speech on retirement to private life it would neither be fitting nor is it my purpose to pass judgment on all the acts of my public life but i hope i shall be excused for one or two observations which the occasion appears to me to authorize i never but once changed my opinion on any great measure of national policy or on any great principle of construction of the national constitution in early life on deliberate consideration i adopted the principles of interpreting the federal constitution which have been so ably developed and enforced by mr madison in his memorable report to the virginia legislature and to them as i understood them i have constantly adhered upon the question of coming up in the senate of the united states to recharter the first bank of the united states thirty years ago i opposed the recharter upon convictions which i honestly entertained the experience of the war which shortly followed the condition into which the currency of the country was thrown without a bank and i may now add later and more disastrous experience convinced me i was wrong i publicly stated to my constituents in a speech in lexington that which i made in the house of representatives of the united states not having been reported my reasons for that change and they are preserved in the archives of the country i appeal to that record and am willing to be judged now and hereafter by their validity i do not advert to the fact of this solitary insistence of change of opinion as implying any personal merit but because it is a fact i will however say that i think it very perilous to the utility of any public man 
to make frequent changes of opinion, or any change, but upon grounds so sufficient and palpable, that the public can clearly see and approve them. If we could look through a window into the human breast, and there discover the causes which led to changes of opinion, they might be made without hazard. But as it is impossible to penetrate the human heart and distinguish between the sinister and honest motives which prompt it, any public man that changes his opinion, once deliberately formed and promulgated, under other circumstances than those which I have stated, draws around him distrust, impairs the public confidence, and lessens his capacity to serve his country. I will take this occasion now to say that I am, and have been long satisfied, that it would have been wiser and more politic in me to have declined accepting the office of Secretary of State in 1825. Not that my motives were not as pure and as patriotic as ever carried any man into public office. Not that the calumny which was applied to the fact was not as gross and as unfounded as any that was ever propagated. Not that valued friends and highly esteemed opponents did not unite in urging my acceptance of the office. Not that the administration of Mr. Adams will not, I sincerely believe, advantageously compare with any of his predecessors in economy, purity, prudence, and wisdom. Not that Mr. Adams himself was wanting in any of those high qualifications and upright and patriotic intentions which were suited to the office. But my error in accepting the office arose out of my underrating the power of detraction and the force of ignorance, and abiding with too sure a confidence in the conscious integrity and uprightness of my own motives. Of that ignorance I had a remarkable and laughable example on an occasion which I shall relate. I was traveling in 1828 through, I believe it was Spotsylvania County in Virginia, on my return to Washington, in company with some young friends. We halted at night at a tavern, kept by an aged gentleman who, I quickly perceived from the disorder and confusion which reigned, had not the happiness to have a wife. After a hurried and bad supper, the old gentleman sat down by me, and without hearing my name, but understanding that I was from Kentucky, remarked that he had four sons in that state, and that he was very sorry they were divided in politics, two being for Adams and two for Jackson. He wished they were all for Jackson. Why? I asked him. Because, he said, that fellow Clay and Adams had cheated Jackson out of the presidency. Have you ever seen any evidence, my old friend? said I, of that. No, he replied, none. And he wanted to see none. But, I observed, looking him directly and steadily in the face, suppose Mr. Clay were to come here and assure you upon his honor that it was all a vile calumny and not a word of truth in it, would you believe him? No, replied the old gentleman promptly and emphatically. I said to him in conclusion, Will you be good enough to show me to bed, and bade him good night. The next morning, having in the interval learned my name, he came to me full of apologies, but I at once put him at his ease by assuring him that I did not feel in the slightest degree hurt or offended with him. If to have served my country during a long series of years with fervent zeal and unshaken fidelity, in seasons of peace and war, at home and abroad, in the legislative halls and in an executive department, if to have labored most sedulously to avert the embarrassment and distress which now overspread this union, and when they came to have exerted myself anxiously at the extra session, and to this to devise healing remedies, if to have desired to introduce economy and reform in the general administration, curtail enormous executive power, and amply provide, at the same time, for the wants of the government and the wants of the people, by a tariff which would give it revenue and then protection, if to have earnestly sought to establish the bright but too rare example of a party in power faithful to its promises and pledges made when out of power, if these services, exertions, and endeavors justify the accusation of ambition, I must plead guilty to the charge. I have wished the good opinion of the world, but I defy the most malignant of my enemies to show that I have attempted to gain it by any low or groveling arts, by any mean or unworthy sacrifices, by the violation of any of the obligations of honor, or by a breach of any of the duties which I owed to my country. How is this right of the people, to abolish an existing government and set up a new one to be practically exercised? Our revolutionary ancestor did not tell us by words, but they proclaimed it by gallant and noble deeds. Who are the people that are to tear up the whole fabric of human society, whenever and as often as caprice or passion may prompt them? When all the arrangements and ordinances of existing organized society are prostrated and subverted, as must be supposed in such a lawless and irregular movement as that in Rhode Island, 
the established privileges and distinctions between the sexes, between the colors, between the ages, between natives and foreigners, between the sane and insane, and between the innocent and guilty convict. All the offspring of positive institutions are cast down and abolished, and society is thrown into one heterogeneous and unregulated mass. And is it contended that the major part of this Babel congregation is invested with the right to build up at its pleasure a new government, that as often and whenever society can be drummed up and thrown into such a shapeless mass, the major part of it may establish another and another new government in endless succession, why this would overturn all social organization, make revolutions the extreme and last resort of an oppressed people the commonest occurrences of human life, and the standing order of the day. How such a principle would operate in a certain section of this union with a peculiar population you will readily conceive. No community could endure such an intolerable state of things anywhere, and all would sooner or later take refuge from such ceaseless agitation in the calm repose of absolute despotism. Fellow citizens of all parties, the present situation of our country is one of unexampled distress and difficulty, but there is no occasion for any despondency. A kind and bountiful providence has never deserted us. Punished us he perhaps has, for our neglect of his blessings and our misdeeds. We have a varied and fertile soil, a genial climate and free institutions. Our whole land is covered in profusion with the means of subsistence and the comforts of life. Our gallant ship, it is unfortunately true, lies helpless, tossed on a tempestuous sea amid the conflicting billows of contending parties, without a rudder and without a faithful pilot. But that ship is our country, embodying all our past glory, all our future hopes. Its crew is our whole people, by whatever political denomination they are known. If she goes down, we all go down together. Let us remember the dying words of the gallant and lamented Lawrence. Don't give up the ship. The glorious banner of our country, with its unstained stars and stripes, still proudly floats at its masthead. With stout hearts and strong arms, we can surmount all our difficulties. Let us all, all, rally round that banner, and finally resolve to perpetuate our liberties and regain our lost prosperity. Whigs! Arouse from that ignoble supineness which encompasses you. Awake from the lethargy in which you lie bound. Cast from you that unworthy apathy which seems to make you indifferent to the fate of your country. Arouse, awake, shake off the dewdrops that glitter on your garments, and once more march to battle and to victory. You have been disappointed, deceived, betrayed, shamefully deceived and betrayed. But will you therefore also prove false and faithless to your country, or obey the impulses of a just and patriotic indignation? As for Captain Tyler, he is a mere snap, a flash in the pan. Pick your wig flints, and try your rifles again. From the Speeches of Henry Clay, edited by Calvin Cotton, copyright 1857, by A.S. Barnes and Company. End of section 30. Recording by Chris Pyle. Section 31 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Kibbe. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. Section 31. Hymn to Zeus by Cleanthes. Cleanthes, 331 to 232 BC. Cleanthes, the immediate successor of Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, was born at Assos in the Troad in BC 331. Of his early life we know nothing, except that he was for a time a prize fighter. About the age of thirty, he came to Athens with less than a dollar in his pocket and entered the school of Zeno, where he remained for some nineteen years. At one time, the court of Areopagus, not seeing how he could make an honest livelihood, summoned him to appear before it and give an account of himself. He did so, bringing with him his employers, who proved that he spent much of the night in carrying water for gardens or in kneading dough. The court, filled with admiration, offered him a pension, which he refused by the advice of his master, who thought the practice of self-dependence and strong endurance an essential part of education. Cleanthes' mind was slow of comprehension, but extremely retentive, like a hard tablet, Zeno said, which retains clearest and longest what is written on it. He was not an original thinker, 
but the strength and loftiness of his character and his strong religious sense gave him an authority which no other member of the school could claim. For many years, head of the Stoa, he reached the ripe age of ninety-nine, when, falling sick, he refused to take food and died of voluntary starvation in B.C. 232. Long afterwards, the Roman Senate caused the statue to be erected to his memory in his native town. Almost the only writing of his that has come down to us is his noble hymn to the Supreme Being. Hymn to Zeus Most glorious of all, the undying, many-named, girt round with awe, Jove, author of nature, applying to all things the rudder of law. Hail, hail, for it justly rejoices the races, whose life is a span to lift unto thee their voices, the author and framer of man. For we are thy sons. Thou didst give us the symbols of speech at our birth, alone of the things that live, and mortal move upon earth. Wherefore thou shalt find me extolling, and ever singing thy praise since thee the great universe rolling on its path round the world obeys obeys thee wherever thou guidest and gladly is bound in thy bands so great is the power thou confidest with strong and invincible hands to thy mighty ministering servant the bolt of the thunder that flies two-edged like a sword and fervent that is living and never dies all nature in fear and dismay doth quake in the path of its stroke what time thou preparest the way for the one word thy lips have spoke, which blends with lights smaller and greater, which pervadeth and thrilleth all things, so great is thy power and thy nature, in the universe highest of kings. On earth, of all deeds that are done, O God, there is none without thee, in the holy ether not one, nor one on the face of the sea, save the deeds that evil men, driven by their own blind folly, have planned. But things that have grown uneven are made even again by thy hand, and things unseemly grow seemly, the unfriendly are friendly to thee. For so good and evil supremely thou hast blended in one by decree. For all thy decree is one ever, a word that endureth for aye, which mortals, rebellious, endeavor to flee from and shun to obey. Ill-fated that, worn with proneness for the lordship of goodly things, neither hear nor behold, in its oneness, the law that divinity brings. Which men with reason obeying might attain unto glorious life, no longer aimlessly straying in the paths of ignoble strife. There are men with a zeal unblessed, that are wearied with following of fame, and men with a baser quest, that are turned to lucre and shame. There are men, too, that pamper and pleasure the flesh with delicate stings, all these desire beyond measure to be other than all these things. Great Jove, all-giver, dark-clouded, great lord of the thunderbolt's breath, deliver the men that are shrouded in ignorance dismal as death. O oh, Father, dispel from their souls the darkness, and grant them the light, of reason thy stay, when the whole wide world thou rulest with might, that we, being honored, may honor thy name with the music of hymns extolling the deeds of the donor, unceasing, as rightly beseems mankind, for no worthier trust is awarded to God or to man than forever to glory with justice in the law that endures and is one. End of section 31 Section 32 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 32. Samuel Langhorne Clemens, Mark Twain, by Charles Dudley Warner. Samuel Langhorne Clemens, Mark Twain, 1835. Samuel Langhorne Clemens has made the name he assumed in his earliest sketches for newspapers so completely to usurp his own in public and private that until recently the world knew him by no other. His world of admirers rarely use any other in referring to the great author and even to his intimate friends 
the borrowed name seems the more real the pseudonym so lightly picked up has nearly universal recognition and it is safe to say that the name mark twain is known to more people of all conditions the world over than any other in this century except that of some reigning sovereign or great war captain the term is one used by the mississippi river pilots to indicate the depth of water two fathoms when throwing the lead it was first employed by a river correspondent in reporting the state of the river to a new orleans newspaper this reporter died just about the time mr clemens began to write and he jumped the name mr clemens was born in hannibal missouri a small town on the west bank of the mississippi in eighteen thirty five he got the rudiments of an education at a village school learned boy life and human nature in a frontier community entering a printing office and became an expert compositor travelled and worked as a journeyman printer and at length reached the summit of a river boy's ambition in a mississippi steamboat in learning the business of a pilot it is to this experience that the world is indebted for some of the most amusing the most real and valuable and the most imaginative writing of this century which gives the character and interest and individuality to this great western river that history has given to the nile if he had no other title to fame he could rest securely on his reputation as the prose poet of the mississippi upon the breaking out of the war the river business was suspended mr clemens tried the occupation of war for a few weeks on the confederate side in a volunteer squad which does not seem to have come into collision with anything but scant rations and imaginary alarms and then he went to nevada with his brother who had been appointed secretary of that territory here he became connected with the territorial enterprise a virginia city newspaper as a reporter and sketch writer and immediately opened a battery of good-natured and exaggerated and complimentary description that was vastly amusing to those who were not its targets afterwards he drifted to the coast tried mining and then joined that group of young writers who illustrated the early history of california a short voyage in the sandwich islands gave him new material for his pen and he made a successful debut in san francisco as a humorous lecturer the first writing to attract general attention was the jumping frog of calaveras which was republished with several other sketches in book form in new york shortly after this he joined the excursion of the quaker city steamship to the orient wrote letters about it to american newspapers and advertised it quite beyond the expectations of its projectors these letters collected and revised became the innocents abroad which instantly gave him a world-wide reputation this was followed by roughing it most amusing episodes of frontier life his pen became immediately in greater demand and innumerable sketches flowed from it many of them recklessly exaggerated for the effect he wished to produce always laughter-provoking and nearly always having a wholesome element of satire of some sham or pretense or folly for some time he had charge of a humorous department in the galaxy magazine these sketches and others that followed were from time to time collected into volumes which had a great sale about this time he married and permanently settled in hartford where he began the collection of a library set himself to biographical and historical study made incursions into german and french and prepared himself for the more serious work that was before him 
a second sojourn in europe produced a tramp abroad full of stories and adventures much in the spirit of his original effort but with more reading reflection and search into his own experiences came old times on the mississippi tom sawyer and huckleberry finn in which the author wrote out of his own heart to interest in social problems must be attributed the beautiful idol of the prince and the pauper and the yankee at the court of king arthur which later the english thought lacked reverence for the traditions of chivalry during all this period mr clemens was in great demand as a lecturer and an after-dinner speaker his remarks about new england weather at a new england dinner in new york are a favorite example of his humor and his power of poetic description as a lecturer a teller of stories and delineator of character he had scarcely a rival in his ability to draw and entertain vast audiences he made a large income from his lectures in america and in england and from his books which always had a phenomenally large sale very remunerative also was the play of colonel sellers constructed out of a novel called the gilded age since eighteen ninety mr clemens and his family have lived most of the time in europe for some time before he had written little but since that his pen has again become active he has produced many magazine papers a story called puddenhead wilson and the most serious and imaginative work of his life in the personal recollections of joan of arc feigned to be translated from a contemporary memoir left by her private secretary in it the writer strikes the universal chords of sympathy and pathos and heroic elevation in eighteen ninety five to six he made a lecturing tour of the globe speaking in australia new zealand south africa and india and everywhere received an ovation due to his commanding reputation he is understood to be making this journey the subject of another book mr clemens is universally recognized as the first of living humorists but if the fashion of humor changes as change it may he will remain for other qualities certain primordial qualities such as are exhibited in his work on the mississippi a force to be reckoned with in the literature of this century mr clemens's humor has the stamp of universality which is the one indispensable thing in all enduring literary productions and his books have been translated and very widely diffused and read in german french and other languages this is a prophecy of his lasting place in the world of letters End of section thirty two section thirty three of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Bennett. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 33. Excerpts from Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain. The Child of Calamity from Life on the Mississippi, Copyright 1883 by James R. Osgood and Company. By way of illustrating keelboat talk and manners, and that now departed and hardly remembered raft life, I will throw in, in this place, a chapter from a book which I have been working at by fits and starts during the past five or six years, and may possibly finish in the course of five or six more. The book is a story which details some passages in the life of an ignorant village boy, Huck Finn, son of the town drunkard of my time out west there. He has run away from his persecuting father and from a persecuting good widow who wishes to make a nice truth-telling respectable boy of him, 
and with him a slave of the widow's has also escaped. They've found a fragment of a lumber raft, it is high water and dead summertime, and are floating down the river by night and hiding in the willows by day, bound for Cairo, whence the Negro will seek freedom in the heart of the free states. But in a fog they pass Cairo without knowing it. By and by they begin to suspect the truth, and Huck Finn is persuaded to end the dismal suspense by swimming down to a huge raft which they have seen in the distance ahead of them, creeping aboard under cover of the darkness and gathering the needed information by eavesdropping. But you know a young person can't wait very well when he is impatient to find a thing out. We talked it over, and by and by Jim said it was such a black night now that it wouldn't be no risk to swim down to the big raft and crawl aboard and listen. They would talk about Cairo because they would be calculating to go ashore there for a spree, maybe, or anyway they would send boats ashore to buy whiskey or fresh meat or something. Jim had a wonderful level head for a nigger. He could most always start a good plan when you wanted one. I stood up and shook my rags off and jumped into the river and struck out for the raft's light. By and by, when I got down nearly to her, I eased up and went slow and cautious. But everything was all right, nobody at the sweeps. So I swum down along the raft till I was most abreast the campfire in the middle. Then I crawled aboard and inched along and got in amongst some bundles of shingles on the weather side of the fire. There was thirteen men there. They was the watch on deck, of course, and a mighty rough-looking lot, too. They had a jug and tin cups and... They kept the jug moving. One man was singing, roaring, you might say, and it wasn't a nice song for a parlor anyway. He roared through his nose and strung out the last word of every line very long. When he was done, they all fetched a kind of engine war whoop, and then another was sung. It begun, There was a woman in our Towden, and our Towden did dweddle, dwell. She loved her husband dearly, but another man twist as weddle. Singing to relu relu, relu relu relay. She loved her husband dearly, but another man twist as weddle. And so on, fourteen verses. It was kind of poor, and when he was going to start on the next verse, one of them said it was the tune the old cow died on, and another one said, Oh, give us a rest. And another one told him to take a walk. They made fun of him till he got mad and jumped up and began to cuss the crowd and said he could lamb any thief in the lot. They was all about to make a break for him, but the biggest man there jumped up and says, Sit where you are, gentlemen. Leave him to me. He's my meat. Then he jumped up in the air three times and cracked his heels together every time. He flung off a buckskin coat that was all hung with fringes and says, You lay there till the chawin' up's done and flung his hat down, which was all over ribbons, and says, You lay there till his sufferings is over. Then he jumped up in the air and cracked his heels together again and shouted out, Whoop! I'm the old original iron-jawed, brass-mounted, copper-bellied course maker from the wilds of Arkansas. Look at me. I'm the man they call sudden death and general desolation, sired by a hurricane, damned by an earthquake, half-brother to the cholera, nearly related to the smallpox on the mother's side. Look at me! I take nineteen alligators and a barrel of whiskey for breakfast when I'm in robust health, and a bushel of rattlesnakes and a dead body when I'm ailing. I split the everlasting rocks with my glance, and I squench the thunder when I speak. Whoop! Stand back and give me the room according to my strength. Blood's my natural drink, and the wails of the dying is music to my ear. Cast your eye on me, gentlemen, and lay low and hold your breath, for I'm about to turn myself loose. All the time he was getting this off, he was shaking his head and looking fierce and kind of swelling around in a little circle, tucking up his wristbands and now and then straightening up and beating his breast with his fist, saying, Look at me, gentlemen. When he got through, he jumped up and cracked his heels together three times and let off a roaring, Whoop! I'm the bloodiest son of a wild cat that lives. Then the man that had started the row tilted his old slouch hat down over his right eye. Then he bent stooping forward with his back sagged and his south end sticking out far and his fists a-shoving out and drawing in in front of him 
and so went around in a little circle about three times, swelling himself up and breathing hard. Then he straightened and jumped up and cracked his heels together three times before he lit again. That made them cheer. And he begun to shout like this. Whoop! Bow your neck and spread for the kingdom of sorrows a coming. Hold me down to earth for I feel my powers a working. Whoop! I'm a child of sin. Don't let me get a start. Smoked glass here for all. Don't attempt to look at me with the naked eye, gentlemen. When I'm playful, I use the meridians of longitude and the parallels of latitude for a sane and drag the Atlantic Ocean for whales. I scratch my head with the lightning and purr myself to sleep with the thunder. When I'm cold, I bile the Gulf of Mexico and bathe in it. When I'm hot, I fan myself with an equinoctial storm. When I'm thirsty, I reach up and suck a cloud dry like a sponge. When I range the earth hungry, famine follows in my tracks. Whoop! Bow your neck and spread. I put my hand on the sun's face and make it not in the earth. I bite a piece out of the moon and hurry the seasons. I shake myself and crumble the mountains. Contemplate me through leather. Don't use the naked eye. I'm the man with the petrified heart and biler iron bows. The massacre of isolated communities is the pastime of my idle moments, the destruction of nationalities, the serious business of my life. The boundless vastness of the great American desert is my enclosed property, and I bury my dead on my own premises." He jumped up and cracked his heels together three times before he lit. They cheered him again, and as he came down, he shouted out, Whoop! Bow your neck and spread, for the pet child of calamities a coming. Then the other one went to swelling around and blowing again. The first one, the one they called Bob. Next, the child of calamity chipped in again, bigger than ever. Then they both got at it at the same time, swelling round and round each other and punching their fists most into each other's faces and whooping and jawing like engines. Then Bob called the child names and the child called him names back again. Next, Bob called him a heap rougher names and the child come back at him with the very worst kind of language. Next, Bob knocked the child's hat off and the child picked it up and kicked Bob's ribbon he had about six foot Bob went and got it and said, never mind, this weren't going to be the last of this thing because he was a man that never forgot and never forgive. And so the child better look out for there was a time a coming just as sure as he was a living man that he would have to answer to him with the best blood in his body. The child said no man was willinger than he was for that time to come and he would give Bob fair warning now never to cross his path again for he could never rest till he had waited in his blood. For such was his nature, though he was sparing him now on the count of his family, if he had one. Both of them was edging away in different directions, growling and shaking their heads, and going on about what they was going to do. But a little black-whiskered chap skipped up and says, Come back here, you couple of chicken-livered cowards, and I'll thrash the two of you. And he done it, too. He snatched them, he jerked them this way and that, he booted them around, he knocked them sprawling faster than they could get up. Why, it weren't two minutes till they begged like dogs, and how the other lot did yell and laugh and clap their hands all the way through, and shout, Sail him, corpse maker! Hi at him again, child of calamity! Bully for you, little Davy! Well, it was a perfect powwow for a while. Bob and the child had red noses and black eyes when they got through. Little Davy made them own up that they was sneaks and cowards and not fit to eat with a dog or drink with a nigger. Then Bob and the child shook hands with each other, very solemn, and said they had always respected each other and was willing to let bygones be bygones. So then they washed their faces in the river, and just then there was a loud order to stand by for a crossing, and some of them went forward to man the sweeps there, and the rest went aft to handle the after sweeps. A Steamboat Landing at a Small Town From Life on the Mississippi Copyright 1883 by James R. Osgood and Company Once a day a cheap gaudy packet arrived upward from St. Louis and another downward from Keokuk. Before these events the day was glorious with expectancy. 
After them, the day was a dead and empty thing. Not only the boys, but the whole village felt this. After all these years, I can picture that old time to myself now, just as it was then. The white town drowsing in the sunshine of a summer's morning, the streets empty, or pretty nearly so, one or two clerks sitting in front of the Water Street stores with their splint-bottom chairs tilted back against the wall, chins on breasts, hats slouched over their faces asleep, with shingle shavings enough around to show what broke them down, a sow and a litter of pigs loafing along the sidewalk, doing a good business in watermelon rinds and seeds, two or three lonely little freight piles scattered about on the levee, a pile of skids on the slope of the stone-paved wharf, and the fragrant town drunker to sleep in the shadow of them. Two or three wood flats at the head of the wharf, but nobody to listen to the peaceful lapping of the wavelets against them. The great Mississippi, the majestic, the magnificent Mississippi, rolling its mile-wide tide along, shining in the sun, the dense forest away on the other side, the point above the town and the point below, bounding the river glimpse and turning it into a sort of sea, and withal a very still and brilliant and lonely one. Presently a film of dark smoke appears above one of those remote points. Instantly a negro drayman, famous for his quick eye and prodigious voice, lifts up the cry, Steamboat a-comin'! And the scene changes. The town drunkard stirs, the clerks wake up, and a furious clatter of drays follows. Every house and store pours out a human contribution, and all in a twinkling the dead town is alive and moving. Drays, carts, men, boys, all go hurrying from many quarters to a common center, the wharf. Assembled there, the people fasten their eyes upon the coming boat, as upon a wonder they are seeing for the first time. And the boat is rather a handsome sight, too. She is long and sharp and trim and pretty. She has two tall, fancy top chimneys with a gilded device of some kind swung between them. A fanciful pilot house, all glass and gingerbread, perched on top of the Texas deck behind them. The paddle boxes are gorgeous with a picture or with gilded rays above the boat's name. The boiler deck, the hurricane deck, and the Texas deck are fenced and ornamented with clean white railings. There's a flag gallantly flying from the jackstaff. The furnace doors are open and the fires glaring bravely. The upper decks are black with passengers. The captain stands by the big bell, calm and posing, the envy of all. Great volumes of the blackest smoke are rolling and tumbling out of the chimneys, a husbanded grandeur created with a bit of pitch pine just before arriving at a town. The crew are grouped on the forecastle, the broad stage is run far out over the port bow, and an envied deckhand stands picturesquely on the end of it with a coil of rope in his hand. The pent steam is screaming through the gauge cocks. The captain lifts his hand, a bell rings, the wheels stop. Then they turn back, churning the water to a foam, and the steamer is at rest. Then such a scramble as there is to get aboard and to get ashore, and to take in freight and to discharge freight, all at one and the same time, and such a yelling and cursing as the mates facilitate it all with. Ten minutes later... The steamer is underway again with no flag on the jackstaff and no black smoke issuing from the chimneys. After ten more minutes, the town is dead again and the town drunkard asleep by the skids once more. The High River and a Phantom Pilot from Life on the Mississippi, copyright 1883 by James R. Osgood and Company. During this big rise, these small fry craft were an intolerable nuisance. We were running chute after chute, a new world to me, and if there was a particularly cramped place in a chute, we would be pretty sure to meet a broadhorn there, and if he failed to be there, we would find him in a still worse locality, namely the head of a chute on the shoal water, and then there would be no end of profane cordialities exchanged. Sometimes in the big river, when we would be feeling our way cautiously along through a fog, a deep hush would suddenly be broken by yells and a clamor of tin pans, and all in an instant a log raft would appear vaguely through the webby veil, close upon us, and then we did not wait to swap knives, but snatched our engine bells out by the roots and piled on all the steam we had to scramble out of the way. One doesn't hit a rock or a solid log raft with a steamboat when he can get excused. 
You will hardly believe it, but many steamboat clerks always carried a large assortment of religious tracts with them in those old departed steamboating days. Indeed they did. Twenty times a day we would be cramping up around a bar while a string of these small fry rascals were drifting down into the head of the bend away above and beyond us a couple of miles. Now a skiff would dart away from one of them and come fighting its laborious way across the desert of water. It would ease all in the shadow of our forecastle, and the panting oarsmen would shout, "'Give me your paper!' as the skiff drifted swiftly astern. The clerk would throw over a file of New Orleans journals. If these were picked up without comment, you might notice that now a dozen other skiffs had been drifting down upon us without saying anything. You understand they had been waiting to see how number one was going to fare. Number one, making no comment, all the rest would bend their oars and come on now, and as fast as they came, the clerk would heave over neat bundles of religious tracts tied to shingles. The amount of hard swearing which twelve packages of religious literature will command when impartially divided up among twelve rasmen crews who have pulled a heavy skiff two miles on a hot day to get them is simply incredible. As I have said, the big rise brought a new world under my vision. By the time the river was over its banks, we had forsaken our old paths and were hourly climbing over bars that had stood ten feet out of water before. We were shaving stumpy shores like that at the foot of Madrid Bend, which I had always seen avoided before. We were clattering through chutes like that of 82, where the opening at the foot was an unbroken wall of timber till our nose was almost at the very spot. Some of these chutes were utter solitudes. The dense, untouched forest overhung both banks of the crooked little crack, and one could believe that human creatures had never intruded there before. The swinging grapevines, the grassy nooks and vistas glimpsed as we swept by, the flowering creepers waving their red blossoms from the tops of dead trunks, and all the spendthrift richness of the forest foliage were wasted and thrown away there. The chutes were lovely places to steer in. They were deep, except at the head. The current was gentle. Under the points, the water was absolutely dead, and the invisible banks so bluff that where the tender willow thickets projected, you could bury your boat's broadside in them as you tore along, and then you seemed fairly to fly. Behind other islands, we found wretched little farms and wretcheder little log cabins. There were crazy rail fences sticking a foot or two above the water, with one or two jeans-clad, chills-racked, yellow-faced male miserables roosting on the top rail, elbows on knees, jaws in hands, grinding tobacco and discharging the result at floating chips through crevices left by lost teeth, while the rest of the family and the few farm animals were huddled together in an empty wood flat riding at her moorings close at hand. In this flat boat, the family would have to cook and eat and sleep for a lesser or greater number of days, or possibly weeks, until the river should fall two or three feet and let them get back to their log cabin and their chills again, chills being a merciful provision of an all-wise providence to enable them to take exercise without exertion. And this sort of watery camping out was a thing which these people were rather liable to be treated to a couple of times a year. By the December rise out of the Ohio and the June rise out of the Mississippi, and yet these were kindly dispensations, for they at least enabled the poor things to rise from the dead now and then and look upon life when a steamboat went by. They appreciated the blessing, too, for they spread their mouths and eyes wide open and made the most of these occasions. Now what could these banished creatures find to do to keep from dying of the blues during the low-water season? Once in one of these lovely island shoots, we found our course completely bridged by a great fallen tree— this will serve to show how narrow some of the chutes were. The passengers had an hour's recreation in a virgin wilderness while the boat hands chopped the bridge away. For there was no such thing as turning back, you comprehend. From Cairo to Baton Rouge, when the river is over its banks, you have no particular trouble in the night, for the thousand-mile wall of dense forest that guards the two banks all the way is only gapped with a farm or woodyard opening at intervals, and so you can't get out of the river much easier than you could get out of a fence lane. But from Baton Rouge to New Orleans, it is a different matter. 
The river is more than a mile wide and very deep, as much as 200 feet in places. Both banks, for a good deal over a 100 miles, are shorn of their timber and bordered by continuous sugar plantations, with only here and there a scattering sapling or row of ornamental china trees. The timber is shorn off clear to the rear of the plantations from two to four miles. When the first frost threatens to come, the planters snatch off their crops in a hurry. When they have finished grinding the cane, they form the refuse of the stalks, which they call bagasse, and set fire to them, though in other sugar countries the bagasse is used for fuel in the furnaces of the sugar mills. Now the piles of damp bagasse burn slowly and smoke like Satan's own kitchen. An embankment ten or fifteen feet high guards both banks of the Mississippi all the way down that lower end of the river, and this embankment is set back from the edge of the shore from ten to perhaps a hundred feet according to circumstances, say thirty or forty feet is a general thing. Fill that whole region with an impenetrable gloom of smoke from a hundred miles of burning bagasse piles when the river is over the banks and turn a steamboat loose along there at midnight and see how she will feel. And see how you will feel, too. You find yourself away out in the midst of a vague, dim sea that is shoreless, that fades out and loses itself in the murky distances. For you cannot discern the thin rib of embankment, and you are always imagining you see a straggling tree when you don't. The plantations themselves are transformed by the smoke and look like a part of the sea. All through your watch you are tortured with the exquisite misery of uncertainty. You hope you are keeping in the river, but you do not know. All that you are sure about is that you are likely to be within six feet of the bank and destruction when you think you are a good half mile from shore. And you are sure also that if you chance suddenly to fetch up against the embankment and topple your chimneys overboard, you will have the small comfort of knowing that it is about what you were expecting to do. One of the great Vicksburg packets darted out into a sugar plantation one night at such a time and had to stay there a week. But there was no novelty about it. It had often been done before. I thought I had finished this chapter, but I wish to add a curious thing while it is in my mind. It is only relevant in that it is connected with piloting. There used to be an excellent pilot on the river, a Mr. X, who was a somnambulist. It was said that if his mind was troubled about a bad piece of river, he was pretty sure to get up and walk in his sleep and do strange things. He was once fellow pilot for a trip or two with George Ehler on a great New Orleans passenger packet. During a considerable part of the first trip, George was uneasy, but got over it by and by as X seemed content to stay in his bed when asleep. Late one night, the boat was approaching Helena, Arkansas. The water was low and the crossing above the town in a very blind and tangled condition. X had seen the crossing since Ehler had, and as the night was particularly drizzly, sullen, and dark, Ehler was considering whether he had not better have X called to assist in running the place when the door opened and X walked in. Now on very dark nights, light is a deadly enemy to piloting. You are aware that if you stand in a lighted room on such a night, you cannot see things in the street to any purpose. But if you put out the lights and stand in the gloom, you can make out objects in the street pretty well. So on very dark nights, pilots do not smoke. They allow no fire in the pilot house stove if there is a crack which can allow the least ray to escape. They order the furnaces to be curtained with huge tarpaulins and the skylights to be closely blinded. Then no light whatsoever issues from the boat. The undefinable shape that now entered the pilot house had Mr. X's voice. This said, Let me take her, George. I've seen this place since you have, and it is so crooked that I reckon I can run it myself easier than I could tell you how to do it. It is kind of you, and I swear I am willing. I haven't got another drop of perspiration left in me. I have been spinning around and around the wheel like a squirrel. It is so dark I can't tell which way she is swinging till she is coming around like a whirligig. So Ehler took a seat on the bench, panting and breathless. The black phantom assumed the wheel without saying anything, steadied the waltzing steamer with a turn or two, and then stood at ease, coaxing her a little to this side and then to that, as gently and sweetly as if the time had been noonday. When Ehler observed this marvel of steering, he wished he had not confessed. 
He stared and wondered and finally said, Well, I thought I knew how to steer a steamboat, but that was another mistake of mine. X said nothing, but went serenely on with his work. He rang for the leads. He rang to slow down the steam. He worked the boat carefully and neatly into invisible marks, then stood at the center of the wheel and peered blandly out into the blackness, fore and aft, to verify his position. As the leads shoaled more and more, he stopped the engines entirely, and the dead silence and suspense of drifting followed. When the shoalest water was struck, he cracked on the steam, carried her handsomely over, and then began to work her warily into the next system of shoal marks. The same patient, heedful use of leads and engines followed. The boat slipped through without touching bottom and entered upon the third and last intricacy of the crossing. Imperceptibly she moved through the gloom, crept by inches into her marks, drifted tediously till the shoalest water was cried, and then, under a tremendous head of steam, went swinging over the reef and away into deep water and safety. Eeler let his long pent breath pour out in a great relieving sigh and said, That's the sweetest piece of piloting that was ever done on the Mississippi River. I wouldn't have believed it could be done if I hadn't seen it. There was no reply, and he added, Just hold her five minutes longer, partner, and let me run down and get a cup of coffee. A minute later, Eeler was biting into a pie down in the Texas and comforting himself with coffee. Just then the night watchman happened in and was about to happen out again when he noticed Eeler and exclaimed, "'Who's at the wheel, sir?' X, "'Dart for the pilot house quicker than lightning!' The next moment both men were flying up the pilot house companionway, three steps at a jump. Nobody there. The great steamer was whistling down the middle of the river at her own sweet will. The watchman shot out of the place again. Eeler seized the wheel, set the engine back with power, and held his breath while the boat reluctantly swung away from a towhead which she was about to knock into the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. By and by, the watchman came back and said, Didn't that lunatic tell you he was asleep when he first came up here? No. Well, he was. I found him walking along on top of the railings just as unconcerned as another man would walk a pavement and I put him to bed. Now just this minute there he was again, away astern, going through that sort of tightrope deviltry of the same as before. Well, I think I'll stay by next time he has one of those fits, but I hope he'll have them often. You just ought to have seen him take this boat through Helena Crossing. I never saw anything so gaudy before, and if he can do such gold-leaf, kid-glove, diamond breast-pin piloting when he is sound asleep, what couldn't he do if he was dead?' An Enchanting River Scene, from Life on the Mississippi, copyright 1883, by James R. Osgood and Company. The face of the water in time became a wonderful book, a book that was a dead language to the uneducated passenger, but which told its mind to me without reserve, delivering its most cherished secrets as clearly as if it uttered them with a voice. And it was not a book to be read once and thrown aside, for it had a new story to tell every day. Throughout the long twelve hundred miles there was never a page that was void of interest, never one that you could leave unread without loss, never one that you would want to skip, thinking you could find higher enjoyment in some other thing. There never was so wonderful a book written by a man, never one whose interest was so absorbing, so unflagging, so sparklingly renewed with every reperusal. The passenger who could not read it was charmed with a particular sort of faint dimple on its surface, on the rare occasions when he did not overlook it altogether, but to the pilot that was an italicized passage. Indeed, it was more than that. It was a legend of the largest capitals, with a string of shouting exclamation points at the end of it, for it meant that a wreck or a rock was buried there that could tear the life out of the strongest vessel that ever floated. It is the faintest and simplest expression the water ever makes, and the most hideous to a pilot's eye. In truth, the passenger who could not read this book saw nothing but all manner of pretty pictures in it, painted by the sun and shaded by the clouds, whereas to the trained eye these were not pictures at all, but the grimmest and most dead earnest of reading matter. Now when I had mastered the language of this water and had come to know every trifling feature that bordered the great river as familiarly as I knew the letters of the alphabet, I had made a valuable acquisition. 
but I had lost something too. I had lost something which could never be restored to me while I lived. All the grace, the beauty, the poetry had gone out of the majestic river. I still kept in mind a certain wonderful sunset which I witnessed when steamboating was new to me. A broad expanse of the river was turned to blood. In the middle distance the red hue brightened into gold, through which a solitary log came floating, black and conspicuous. In one place a long slanting mark lay sparkling upon the water. In another the surface was broken by boiling, tumbling rings that were as many tinted as an opal. Where the ruddy flush was faintest was a smooth spot that was covered with graceful circles and radiating lines, ever so delicately traced. The shore on our left was densely wooded, and the somber shadow that fell from this forest was broken in one place by a long, ruffled trail that shone like silver. And high above the forest wall, a clean-stemmed dead tree waved a single leafy bough that glowed like a flame in the unobstructed splendor that was flowing from the sun. There were graceful curves, reflected images, woody heights, soft distances, and over the whole scene, far and near, the dissolving lights drifted steadily, enriching it every passing moment with new marvels of coloring. I stood like one bewitched. I drank it in, in a speechless rapture. The world was new to me, and I had never seen anything like this at home. But as I have said, a day came when I began to cease from noting the glories and the charms which the moon and the sun and the twilight wrought upon the river's face. Another day came when I ceased altogether to note them. Then, if that sunset scene had been repeated, I should have looked upon it without rapture and should have commented upon it inwardly after this fashion. This sun means that we are going to have wind tomorrow. That floating log means that the river is rising, small thanks to it, that slanting mark on the water refers to a bluff reef which is going to kill somebody's steamboat one of these nights if it keeps on stretching out like that. Those tumbling boils show a dissolving bar and a changing channel there. The lines and circles in the slick water over yonder are a warning that that troublesome place is shoaling up dangerously. That silver streak in the shadow of the forest is the break from a new snag, and he has located himself in the very best place he could have found to fish for steamboats. That tall dead tree with a single living branch is not going to last long. And then how is a body ever going to get through this blind place at night without the friendly old landmark? No, the romance and the beauty were all gone from the river. All the value any feature of it had for me now was the amount of usefulness it could furnish toward compassing the safe piloting of a steamboat. Since those days, I have pitied doctors from my heart. What does the lovely flush in a beauty's cheek mean to a doctor but a break that ripples above some deadly disease? Are not all her visible charms sown thick with what are to him the signs and symbols of hidden decay? Does he ever see her beauty at all, or doesn't he simply view her professionally and comment upon her unwholesome condition all to himself? And doesn't he sometimes wonder whether he has gained most or lost most by learning his trade? The Lightning Pilot From Life on the Mississippi Copyright 1883 by James R. Osgood and Company Next morning I felt pretty rusty and low-spirited. We went booming along, taking a good many chances, for we were anxious to get out of the river, as getting out to Cairo was called, before night should overtake us. But Mr. Bixby's partner, the other pilot, presently grounded the boat, and we lost so much time getting her off that it was plain the darkness would overtake us a good long way above the mouth. This was a great misfortune, especially to certain of our visiting pilots whose boats would have to wait for their return no matter how long that might be. It sobered the pilot house talk a good deal. Coming upstream, pilots did not mind low water or any kind of darkness. Nothing stopped them but fog. But downstream work was different. A boat was too nearly helpless with a stiff current pushing behind her so it was not customary to run downstream at night in low water. There seemed to be one small hope, however. If we could get through the intricate and dangerous Hat Island crossing before night, we could venture the rest, for we would have plainer sailing and better water. But it would be insanity to attempt Hat Island at night. So there was a deal of looking at watches all the rest of the day, and a constant ciphering upon the speed we were making. 
Hat Island was the eternal subject. Sometimes hope was high, and sometimes we were delayed in a bad crossing, and down it went again. For hours all hands lay under the burden of this suppressed excitement. It was even communicated to me, and I got to feeling so solicitous about Hat Island, and under such an awful pressure of responsibility, that I wished I might have five minutes on shore to draw a good, full, relieving breath and start over again. We were standing no regular watches. Each of our pilots ran such portions of the river as he had run when coming upstream because of his greater familiarity with it, but both remained in the pilot house constantly. An hour before sunset, Mr. Bixby took the wheel and Mr. W. stepped aside. For the next thirty minutes, every man held his watch in his hand and was restless, silent, and uneasy. At last, somebody said with a doomful sigh, Well, yonder's Hat Island, and we can't make it. All the watches closed with a snap. Everybody sighed and muttered something about its being too bad, too bad. Ah, if we could only have gotten here a half an hour sooner. And the place was thick with the atmosphere of disappointment. Some started to go out, but loitered, hearing no bell tap to land. The sun dipped behind the horizon. The boat went on. Inquiring looks passed from one guest to another, and one who had his hand on the doorknob and had turned it, waited, then presently took away his hand and let the knob turn back again. We bore steadily down the bend. More looks were exchanged and nods of surprised admiration, but no words. Insensibly, the men drew together behind Mr. Bixby as the sky darkened and one or two dim stars came out. The dead silence and sense of waiting became oppressive. Mr. Bixby pulled the cord and two deep mellow notes from the big bell floated off on the night. Then a pause, and one more note was struck. The watchman's voice followed from the hurricane deck. Labbard lead there! Stabbard lead! Cries of the leadsmen began to rise out of the distance and were gruffly repeated by the word passers on the hurricane deck. Mark three! Mark three! Quarter less three! Half twain! Quarter twain! Mark twain! Quarter less! Mr. Bixby pulled two bell ropes and was answered by faint jinglings far below in the engine room, and our speed slackened. The steam began to whistle through the gauge cocks. The cries of the leadsmen went on, and it is a weird sound always in the night. Every pilot in the lot was watching now with fixed eyes and talking under his breath. Nobody was calm and easy but Mr. Bixby. He would put his wheel down and stand on a spoke, and as the steamer swung into her, to me, utterly invisible marks, for we seemed to be in the midst of a wide and gloomy sea, he would meet and fasten her there. Out of the murmur of half-audible talk, one caught a coherent sentence now and then, such as, There, she's over the first reef, all right. After a pause, another subdued voice. Her stern's coming down just exactly right by George. Now she's in the marks. Over she goes, somebody else muttered. Oh, it was done beautiful. Beautiful. Now the engines were stopped altogether, and we drifted with the current. Not that I could see the boat drift, for I could not, the stars being all gone by this time. This drifting was the dismalest work. It held one's heart still. Presently I discovered a blacker gloom than that which surrounded us. It was the head of the island. We were closing right down upon it. We entered its deeper shadow, and so imminent seemed the peril that I was likely to suffocate, and I had the strongest impulse to do something, anything, to save the vessel. But still Mr. Bixby stood by his wheel, silent, intent as a cat, and all the pilots stood shoulder to shoulder at his back. "'She'll not make it,' somebody whispered. The water grew shoaler and shoaler by the leadsman's cries till it was down to eight and a half, eight feet, eight feet, seven and—' Mr. Bixby said warningly through his speaking tube to the engineer— Stand by now. Aye, aye, sir. Seven and a half. Seven feet. Six and... We touched bottom. Instantly, Mr. Bixby set a lot of bells ringing, shouted through the tube, Now let her have it. Every ounce you've got. Then to his partner, Put her hard down. Snatch her. Snatch her. The boat rasped and ground her way through the sand. 
hung upon the apex of disaster a single tremendous instant, and then over she went, and such a shout as went up at Mr. Bixby's back never loosened the roof of a pilot house before. There was no more trouble after that. Mr. Bixby was a hero that night, and it was some little time, too, before his exploit ceased to be talked about by rivermen. End of section 33「Section 34 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 34, An Expedition Against Ogres. From a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. My expedition was all the talk that day and that night, and the boys were very good to me, and made much of me, and seemed to have forgotten their vexation and disappointment, and come to be as anxious for me to hive those ogres and set those ripe old virgins loose as if it were themselves that had the contract. Well, they were good children, but just children, that is all and they gave me no end of points about how to scout for giants, and how to scoop them in, and they told me all sorts of charms against enchantments, and gave me salves and other rubbish to put on my wounds. But it never occurred to one of them to reflect that if I was such a wonderful necromancer as I was pretending to be, I ought not to need salves, or instructions, or charms against enchantments, and least of all arms and armor, on a foray of any kind, even against fire-spouting dragons and devils hot from perdition, let alone such poor adversaries as these I was after, these commonplace ogres of the back settlements. I was to have an early breakfast and start at dawn, for that was the usual way, but I had the demon's own time with my armor, and this delayed me a little. It is troublesome to get into, and there is so much detail. First, you wrap a layer or two of blanket around your body for a sort of cushion, and to keep off the cold iron. Then you put on your sleeves and shirt of chain mail. These are made of small steel links woven together, and they form a fabric so flexible that if you toss your shirt onto the floor it slumps into a pile like a peck of wet fish net. It is very heavy, and is nearly the uncomfortablest material in the world for a nightshirt, yet plenty used for that. Tax collectors and reformers, and one-horse kings with a defective title, and those sorts of people. Then you put on your shoes, flat boats roofed over with interleaving bands of steel and screw your clumsy spurs into the heels. Next you buckle your greaves on your legs and your cuisses to your thighs. Then come your backplate and your breastplate, and you begin to feel crowded. Then you hitch on to the breastplate the half-petticoat of broad overlapping bands of steel which hangs down in front, but is scalloped out behind so you can sit down, and isn't any real improvement on an inverted coal scuttle, either for looks or for wear, or to wipe your hands on. Next you belt on your sword, then you put your stovepipe joints onto your arms, your iron gauntlets onto your hands, your iron rat trap onto your head, with a rag of steel web hitched onto it to hang over the back of your neck. And there you are, snug as a candle in a candle mold. This is no time to dance. Well, a man that is packed away like that is a nut that isn't worth the cracking. There is so little of the meat, when you get down to it, by comparison with the shell. The boys helped me, or I never could have got in. Just as we finished, Sir Bedivere happened in, and I saw that as like as not I hadn't chosen the most convenient outfit for a long trip. How stately he looked, and tall and broad and grand. He had on his head a conical steel cask that only came down to his ears, and for visor had only a narrow steel bar that extended down to his upper lip and protected his nose, and all the rest of him, from head to heel, was flexible chain mail, trousers and all. But pretty much all of him was hidden under this outside garment, which, of course, was of chain-mail, as I said, and hung straight from his shoulders to his ankles, and from his middle to the bottom, both before and behind, was divided, so that he could ride and let the skirts hang down on each side. He was going grailing, and it was just the outfit for it, too. I would have given a good deal for that ulster, but it was too late now to be fooling around. The sun was just up. The king and the court were all on hand to see me off and wish me luck, so it wouldn't be etiquette for me to tarry. You don't get on your horse yourself. No, if you tried it, you would get disappointed. 
They carry you out, just as they carry a sunstruck man to the drugstore, and put you on, and help get you to rights and fix your feet in the stirrups. And all the while you do feel so strange and stuffy and like somebody else. Like somebody that has been married on a sudden, or struck by lightning, or something like that, and hasn't quite fetched around yet, and is sort of numb and can't just get his bearings. Then they stood up the mast they called a spear in its socket by my left foot, and I gripped it with my hand. Lastly, they hung my shield round my neck, and I was all complete and ready to up anchor and get to sea. Everybody was as good to me as they could be, and a maid of honor gave me the stirrup cup her own self. There was nothing more to do now but for that damsel to get up behind me on pillion, which she did, and put an arm or so around me to hold on. And so we started, and everybody gave us a good-bye and waved their handkerchiefs or helmets, and everybody we met, going down the hill and through the village, was respectful to us, except some shabby boys on the outskirts. They said, Oh, what a guy! and hove clods at us. In my experience, boys are the same in all ages. They don't respect anything. They don't care for anything or anybody. They say, Go up, baldhead! to the prophet, going his unoffending way in the gray of antiquity. They sass me in the holy gloom of the Middle Ages. And I had seen them act the same way in Buchanan's administration. I remember, because I was there and helped. The prophet had his bears and settled with his boys, and I wanted to get down and settle with mine. But it wouldn't answer, because I couldn't have gotten up again. I hate a country without a derrick. Straight off, we were in the country. It was most lovely and pleasant in those sylvan solitudes in the early cool morning in the first freshness of autumn. From hilltops we saw fair green valleys lying spread out below, with streams winding through them and island groves of trees here and there, and huge lonely oaks scattered about and casting black blots of shade. And beyond the valleys we saw the ranges of hills, blue with haze, stretching away in billowy perspective to the horizon, with at wide intervals a dim fleck of white or grey on a wave summit, which we knew was a castle. We crossed broad natural lawns sparkling with dew, and we moved like spirits, the cushioned turf giving out no sound of footfall. We dreamed along through glades in a mist of green light that got its tint from the sun-drenched roof of leaves overhead, and by our feet the clearest and coldest of runlets went frisking and gossiping over its reefs and making a sort of whispering music comfortable to hear. And at times we left the world behind and entered into the solemn great deeps and rich gloom of the forest, where furtive wild things whisked and scurried by and were gone before you could even get your eye on the place where the noise was, and where only the earliest birds were turning out and getting to business, with a song here and a quarrel yonder, and a mysterious far-off hammering and drumming for worms on a tree trunk away somewhere in the impenetrable remoteness of the woods. And by and by, out we would swing again into the glare. About the third or fourth or fifth time that we swung out into the glare, it was along there somewhere, a couple of hours or so after sun-up. It wasn't as pleasant as it had been. It was beginning to get hot. This was quite noticeable. We had a very long pull, after all, without any shade. Now it is curious how progressively little frets grow and multiply after they once get a start. Things which I didn't mind at all at first, I begin to mind now. And more and more, too, all the time. The first ten or fifteen times I wanted my handkerchief, I didn't seem to care. I got along and said, never mind, it isn't any matter, and dropped it out of my mind. But now it was different. I wanted it all the time. It was nag, 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 right along, and no rest. I couldn't get it out of my mind. And so at last I lost my temper, and said, hang a man that would make a suit of armor without any pockets in it. You see, I had my handkerchief and my helmet, and some other things, but it was that kind of a helmet that you can't take off by yourself. That hadn't occurred to me when I put it there. And in fact, I didn't know it. I supposed it would be particularly convenient there. And so now the thought of it being there, so handy and close by, and yet not get atable, made it all the worst and harder to bear. Yes, the thing that you can't get is the thing you want, mainly. Everyone has noticed that. Well, it took my mind off from everything else. Took it clear off and centered it in my helmet. And mile after mile there it stayed, imagining the handkerchief, picturing the handkerchief, and it was bitter and aggravating to have the salt sweat keep trickling down into my eyes, and I couldn't get at it. It seems like a little thing on paper, but it was not a little thing at all. It was the most real kind of misery. I would not say it if it was not so. I made up my mind that I would carry along a reticule next time, let it look how it might, and people say what they would. 
Of course, these iron dudes of the round table would think it was scandalous and maybe raise shoal about it. But as for me, give me comfort first and style afterwards. So we jogged along, and now and then we struck a stretch of dust, and it would tumble up in clouds and get into my nose and make me sneeze and cry, and of course I said things I oughtn't to have said. I don't deny that. I am not better than others. We couldn't seem to meet anybody in this lonesome Britain, not even an ogre, and in the mood I was in then, it was well for the ogre. That is, an ogre with a handkerchief. Most knights would have thought of nothing but getting his armor, but so I got his bandana, he could keep his hardware for all me. Meanwhile, it was getting hotter and hotter in there. You see, the sun was beating down and warming up the iron more and more all the time. Well, when you are hot that way, every little thing irritates you. When I trotted, I rattled like a crate of dishes, and that annoyed me. And moreover, I couldn't seem to stand that shield slatting and banging, now about my breast, now about my back. And if I dropped into a walk, my joints creaked and scratched in that wearisome way that a wheelbarrow does. And as we didn't create any breeze at that gate, I was like to get fried in that stove. And besides, the quieter you went, the heavier the iron settled down on you, and the more and more tons you seemed to weigh every minute. And you had to be always changing hands and passing your spear over to the other foot. It, it got so irksome for one hand to hold it long at a time. Well, you know, when you perspire that way in rivers, there comes a time when you... Well, when you itch. You are inside, your hands are outside. So there you are, nothing but iron between. It is not a light thing, let it sound as it may. First it is one place, then another, then some more. And it goes on spreading and spreading, and at last the territory is all occupied, and nobody can imagine what you feel like or how unpleasant it is. And when it had got to the worst, and it seemed to me I could not stand anything more, a fly got in through the bars and settled on my nose, and the bars were stuck and wouldn't work, and I couldn't get the visor up, and I could only shake my head, which was baking hot by this time, and the fly, well, you know how a fly acts when he has got a certainty. He only minded the shaking enough to change from nose to lip and lip to ear and buzz and buzz all around in there and keep on blighting and biting in a way that a person already so distressed as I simply could not stand. So I gave in and got Alsanda to unship the helmet and relieve me of it. Then she emptied the conveniences out of it and fetched it full of water, and I drank, and then stood up, and she poured the rest down inside the armor. One cannot think how refreshing it was. She continued to fetch and pour until I was well soaked and thoroughly comfortable. It was good to have a rest and peace. But nothing is quite perfect in this life at any time. I had made a pipe a while back, and also some pretty fair tobacco. Not the real thing, but what some of the Indians use. The inside bark of the willow, dried. These comforts had been in the helmet, and now I had them again. But no matches. Gradually, as time wore along, one annoying fact was borne in upon my understanding, that we were weather-bound. An armed novice cannot mount his horse without help and plenty of it. Sandy was not enough, not enough for me, anyway. We had to wait until somebody should come along. Waiting in silence would have been agreeable enough, for I was full of matter for reflection, and wanted to give it a chance to work. I wanted to try and think out how it was that rational or even half-rational men could ever have learned to wear armor, considering its inconveniences, and how they had managed to keep up such a fashion for generations when it was plain that what I had suffered today they had had to suffer all the days of their lives. I wanted to think that out. And moreover, I wanted to think out some way to reform this evil and persuade the people to let the foolish fashion die out. But thinking was out of the question in the circumstances. You couldn't think where Sandy was. She was quite a biddable creature and good-hearted, but she had a flow of talk that was as steady as a mill and made your head sore like the drays and wagons in a city. If she had had a cork, she would have been a comfort. But you can't cork that kind. They would die. Her clack was going all day, and you would think something would surely happen to her works by and by. But no, they never got out of order, and she never had to slack up for words. She could grind and pump and churn and buzz by the week, and never stop to oil up or blow out. And yet the result was just nothing but wind. She never had any ideas, any more than a fog has. She was a perfect blatherskite. I mean, for jaw, 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 talk, 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 jabber, 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 but just as good as she could be. I hadn't minded her mill that morning, on account of having that hornet's nest of other troubles. But more than once in the afternoon, I had to say... 
Take a rest, child. The way you are using up all the domestic air, the kingdom will have to go to importing it by tomorrow, and it's a low enough treasury without that. End of section 34. Recording by Todd. Section 35 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. Section 35. The True Prince and the Feigned One. From the Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain. At last the final act was at hand. The Archbishop of Canterbury lifted up the crown of England from its cushion, and held it out over the trembling mock king's head. In the same instant a rainbow radiance flashed along the spacious transept, for with one impulse every individual in the great concourse of nobles lifted a coronet and poised it over his or her head, and paused in that attitude. A deep hush pervaded the abbey. At this impressive moment a startling apparition intruded upon the scene, an apparition observed by none in the absorbed multitude, until it suddenly appeared, moving up the great central aisle. It was a boy, bareheaded, ill-shod, and clothed in coarse plebeian garments that were falling to rags. He raised his hand with a solemnity which ill comported with his soiled and sorry aspect, and delivered this note of warning. I forbid you to set the crown of England upon that forfeited head. I am the king. In an instant, several indignant hands were laid upon the boy, but in the same instant Tom Canty, in his regal vestments, made a swift step forward and cried out in a ringing voice, Loose him and forbear! He is the king! A sort of panic of astonishment swept the assemblage, and they partly rose in their places and stared in a bewildered way at one another and at the chief figures in this scene, like persons who wondered whether they were awake and in their senses, or asleep and dreaming. The Lord Protector was as amazed as the rest, but quickly recovered himself, and exclaimed in a voice of authority, Mind not, His Majesty! His malady is upon him again! Seize the vagabond! He would have been obeyed, but the mock king stamped his foot and cried out, On your peril! Touch him not! He is the king! The hands were withheld. A paralysis fell upon the house. No one moved. No one spoke. Indeed, no one knew how to act or what to say in so strange and surprising an emergency. While all minds were struggling to right themselves, the boy still moved steadily forward, with high port and confident mien. He had never halted from the beginning, and while the tangled minds still floundered helplessly, he stepped upon the platform, and the mock king ran with a glad face to meet him, and fell upon his knees before him, and said, Oh, my lord the king, let poor Tom Canty be first to swear fealty to thee, and say, Put on thy crown, and enter into thine own again. The lord protector's eye fell sternly upon the newcomer's face, but straight away the sternness vanished away, and gave place to an expression of wondering surprise. This thing happened also to the other great officers, they glanced at each other, and retreated a step by a common and unconscious impulse. The thought in each mind was the same. What a strange resemblance! The Lord Protector reflected a moment or two in perplexity. Then he said, with grave respectfulness, By your favor, sir, I desire to ask certain questions which— I will answer them then, my lord. The Duke asked him many questions about the court, the late king, the prince, the princesses, the boy answered them correctly and without hesitating. He described the rooms of state in the palace, the late king's apartments, and those of the Prince of Wales. It was strange. It was wonderful. Yes, it was unaccountable. So all said that heard it. The tide was beginning to turn, and Tom Cantry's hopes to run high, when the Lord Protector shook his head and said, It is true it is most wonderful, but it is no more than our Lord the King likewise can do. This remark, and this reference to himself as still the king, saddened Tom Canty, and he felt his hopes crumbling under him. These are not proofs, added the protector. The tide was turning very fast now, very fast indeed, but in the wrong direction. It was leaving poor Tom Canty stranded on the throne, 
and sweeping the other out to sea. The Lord Protector communed with himself, shook his head. The thought forced itself upon him. It is perilous to the state, and to us all, to entertain so fateful a riddle as this. It could divide the nation and undermine the throne. He turned and said, Sir Thomas, arrest this. No, hold. His face lighted, and he confronted the ragged candidate with this question. Where lieth the great seal? Answer me this truly, and the riddle is unriddled. For only he that was Prince of Wales can so answer. On so trivial a thing hang the throne and a dynasty. It was a lucky thought, a happy thought. That it was so considered by the great officials was manifested by the silent applause that shot from eye to eye around their circle in the form of bright approving glances. Yes, none but the true prince could dissolve the stubborn mystery of the vanished great seal. This forlorn little impostor had been taught his lesson well, but here his teachings must fail, for his teacher himself could not answer that question. Ah, very good, very good indeed. Now we shall be rid of this troublesome and perilous business in short order. And so they nodded invisibly and smiled inwardly with satisfaction, and looked to see this foolish lad stricken with a palsy of guilty confusion. How surprised they were, then, to see nothing of the sort happen. How they marveled to hear him answer up promptly in a confident and untroubled voice and say, There is not in this riddle that is difficult. Then, without so much as a by your leave to anybody, he turned and gave this command with the easy manner of one accustomed to doing such things. My Lord St. John, go you to my private cabinet in the palace, for none knoweth the place better than you, and close down to the floor, in the left corner, remotest from the door that opens from the antechamber, you shall find in the wall a brazen nail-head. Press upon it, and a little jewel-closet will fly open, which not even you do know of. No, nor any soul else in all the world but me, and the trusty artisan that did contrive it for me. The first thing that falleth under your eye will be the great seal. Fetch it hither. All the company wondered at this speech and wondered still more to see the little medicant pick out this peer without hesitancy or apparent fear of mistake, and call him by name with such a placidly convincing air of having known him all his life. The peer was almost surprised into obeying. He even made a movement as if to go, but quickly recovered his tranquil attitude, and confessed his blunder with a blush. Tom Canty turned upon him and said sharply, "'Why dost thou hesitate? Hast thou not heard the king's command? Go!' The Lord St. John made a deep obeisance and it was observed that it was a significantly cautious and non-committal one, it not being delivered at either of the kings, but at the neutral ground about halfway between the two, and took his leave. Now began a movement of the gorgeous particles of that official group which was slow, scarcely perceptible, and yet steady and persistent, a movement such as is observed in a kaleidoscope that is turned slowly, whereby the components of one splendid cluster fall away and join themselves to another, a movement which little by little, in the present case, dissolved the glittering crowd that stood about Tom Canty, and clustered it together again in the neighborhood of the newcomer. Tom Canty stood almost alone. Now ensued a brief season of deep suspense and waiting, during which even the few faint hearts still remaining near Tom Canty gradually scraped together courage enough to glide, one by one, over to the majority. So at last Tom Canty, in his royal robes and jewels, stood wholly alone and isolated from the world, a conspicuous figure, occupying an elegant vacancy. Now the Lord St. John was seen returning. As he advanced up the mid-aisle, the interest was so intense that the low murmur of conversation in the great assemblage died out, and was succeeded by a profound hush, a breathless stillness, through which his footfalls pulsed with a dull and distant sound. Every eye was fastened upon him as he moved along. He reached the platform, paused a moment, then moved towards Tom Canty with a deep obeisance, and said, Sire, the seal is not there. A mob does not melt away from the presence of a plague patient with more haste than the band of pallid and terrified courtiers melted away from the presence of the shabby little claimant of the crown. In a moment he stood all alone, without friend or supporter, a target upon which was concentrated a bitter fire of scornful and angry looks. The Lord Protector called out fiercely, Cast the beggar into the street, and scourge him through the town. The paltry knave is worth no more consideration. Officers of the guard sprang forward to obey, but Tom Canty waved them off and said, Back! Who so touches in peril is his life? The Lord Protector was perplexed in the last degree. He said to the Lord St. John, Search do well, but it boots not to ask that. It doth seem passing strange. 
Little things, trifles, slip out of one's ken, and one does not think it matter for surprise. But how so bulky a thing as the seal of England can vanish away, and no man be able to get track of it again? A massy golden disc, Tom Canty, with beaming eyes, sprang forward and shouted, Hold! That is enough! Was it round and thick? And had it letters and devices graved upon it? Yes! Oh! Now I know what this great seal is, that there's been such worry and pother about. And ye had described it to me, ye could have had it three weeks ago. Right well, I know where it lies. But it was not I that put it there, first. Who then, my liege? asked the Lord Protector. He that stands there, the rightful King of England. And he shall tell you himself where it lies. Then you will believe he knew of it with his own knowledge. Bethink thee, my king, spur thy memory. It was the last, the very last thing that didst that day before thou didst rush forth from the palace, clothed in my rags, to punish the soldier that insulted me. A silence ensued, undisturbed by any movement or whisper, and all eyes were fixed upon the newcomer, who stood with bent head and corrugated brow, groping in his memory among a thronging multitude of valueless recollections for one single little elusive fact, which, found, would seat him upon a throne. Unfound would leave him as he was for good and all, a pauper and an outcast. Moment after moment passed. The moments built themselves into minutes. Still the boy struggled silently on and gave no sign. But at last he heaved a sigh, shook his head slowly, and said, with a trembling lip and in a despondent voice, I call the scene back, all of it. But the seal hath no place in it. He paused, then looked up, and said with gentle dignity, My lords and gentlemen, if ye will rob your rightful sovereign of his own for lack of this evidence which he is not able to furnish, I may not stay ye, being powerless, but... Oh, folly, oh, madness, my king, cried Tom Canty in a panic. Wait, think, do not give up. The cause is not lost, nor shall be, neither. List to what I say, follow every word. I am going to bring that morning back again, every hap just as it happened. We talked. I told you of my sisters, Nan and Bet. Ah, yes, you remember that. And about my old grandam, and the rough games of the lads of awful court. Yes, you remember these things also. Very well, follow me still. You shall recall everything. You gave me food and drink, and did with princely courtesy send away the servants, so that my low breeding might not shame me before them. Ah, yes, this also you remember. As Tom checked off his details, and the other boy nodded his head in recognition of them, the great audience and the officials stared in puzzled wonderment. The tale sounded like true history. Yet how could this impossible conjunction between a prince and a beggar boy have come about? Never was a company of people so perplexed, so interested, and so stupefied before. For a jest, my prince, we did exchange garments. Then we stood before a mirror, and so alike were we that both said it seemed as if there had been no change made. Yes, you remember that. Then you noticed that the soldier had hurt my hand. Look, here it is. I cannot yet even write with it. The fingers are so stiff. At this your highness sprang up, vowing vengeance upon that soldier, and ran toward the door. You passed a table. That thing you call the seal lay on the table. You snatched it up and looked eagerly about as if for a place to hide it. Your eye caught sight of... There! Tis sufficient! And the great God be thanked! exclaimed the ragged claimant in a mighty excitement. Go, my good St. John. In an arm piece of the Milanese armor that hangs on the wall, thou shalt find the seal. Right, my king, right! cried Tom Canty. Now the scepter of England is thine own, and it were better for him that would dispute it that he had been born dumb. Go, my lord St. John, give thy feet wings. The whole assemblage was on its feet now, and well nigh out of his mind with uneasiness, apprehension, and consuming excitement. On the floor and on the platform a deafening buzz of frantic conversation burst forth, and for some time nobody knew anything or heard anything or was interested in anything but what his neighbor was shouting into his ear, or he was shouting into his neighbor's ear. Time, nobody knew how much of it, swept by unheeded and unnoted. At last a sudden hush fell upon the house, and in the same moment St. John appeared upon the platform, and held the great seal aloft in his hand. Then such a shout went out, Long live the true king! For five minutes the air quaked with shouts and the crash of musical instruments, and was white with a storm of waving handkerchiefs, and through it all a ragged lad, the most conspicuous figure in England, stood, flushed and happy and proud, in the center of the spacious platform, with the great vassals of the kingdom kneeling about him. 
Then all rose, and Tom Canty cried out, Now, my king, take these regal garments back, and give poor Tom, thy servant, his shreds and remnants again. The Lord Protector spoke up. Let the small varlet be stripped and flung into the tower. But the new king, the true king, said, I will not have it so. But for him I had not got my crown again. None shall lay a hand upon him to harm him. And as for thee, my good uncle, my lord protector, this conduct of thine is not grateful toward this poor lad, for I hear he hath made thee a duke. The protector blushed. Yet he was not a king. Wherefore, what is this fine title worth now? Tomorrow you shall sue to me, through him, for its confirmation, else no duke but a simple earl thou shall remain. Under this rebuke his grace, the Duke of Somerset, retired a little from the front of the moment. The king turned to Tom and said kindly, My poor boy, how was it that you could remember where I hid the seal, when I could not remember it myself? Ah, my king, that was easy, since I used it diverse days. Used it? Yet could not explain where it was? I did not know that it was that they wanted. They did not describe it, your majesty. Then how used you it? The red blood began to steal up into Tom's cheeks, and he dropped his eyes and was silent. "'Speak up, good lad, and fear nothing,' said the king. "'How used you the great seal of England?' Tom stammered a moment in a pathetic confusion, then got it out. "'To crack nuts with!' Poor child! The avalanche of laughter that greeted this nearly swept him off his feet. But if a doubt remained in any mind that Tom Canty was not the king of England, and familiar with the august appurtenances of royalty, this reply disposed of it utterly. Meantime the sumptuous robes of state had been removed from Tom's shoulders to the king's, whose rags were effectually hidden from sight under it. Then the coronation ceremonies were resumed, the true king was anointed, and the crown set upon his head, whilst cannon thundered the news to the city, and all London seemed to rock with applause. End of section 35 Recording by Todd Section 36 Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. Section 36. Author Hugh Clough, 1819-1861, by Charles Eliot Norton The intellectual mood of many of the finest spirits in England and New England during the second quarter of the nineteenth century had something of the nature of a surprise to themselves, no less than to those who came within their influence. It was indeed a natural though unforeseen result of forces, various in kind, that had long been silently at work. The conflicting currents of thought and moral sentiment, which in all ages perplex and divide the hearts of men, took a new direction and seemed to have gathered volume and swiftness. Hardly since the Reformation had there been so deep and general a stirring of the questions, the answers to which, whether they be final or merely provisional, involve conclusions relating to the deepest interests of men. Old convictions were confronted by new doubts. Ancient authority was met by a modern spirit of independence. This new intellectual mood was perhaps first distinctly manifest in England in Carlyle's essays, and correspondingly in New England in the essays and poems of Emerson. It was expressed in In Memoriam and Maud. It gave the undertone of Arnold's most characteristic verse, and it found clear and strikingly distinctive utterance in the poems of Clow. His nature was of rare superiority, alike of character and intellect. 
his moral integrity and sincerity imparted clearness to his imagination and strength to his intelligence so that while the most marked distinction of his poems is that which they possess as a mirror of spiritual conditions shared by many of his contemporaries they have hardly less interest as the expression and image of his own individuality Arthur Hugh Clow was born at Liverpool on New Year's Day, 1819. His father, who came of an old Welsh family, his mother, Anne Perfect, was from Yorkshire, had established himself in Liverpool as a cotton merchant. Toward the end of 1822, he emigrated with his wife and four children to Charleston, South Carolina, and here for four years was their home. For Arthur, they were important years. He was a shy, sensitive boy, already considered as the genius of the family. He was his mother's darling. She was a woman rigidly simple in her tastes and habits, of stern integrity, of cultivated intelligence, fond of poetry, a lover of nature, and quickly sympathetic with high character, whether in real life or in the pages of romance. While his father taught him his Latin grammar and his arithmetic, his mother read with him from Pope's Iliad and Odyssey, from Scott's novels and other books fitted to quicken the imagination. Her influence was strong in the shaping of his taste and disposition. In 1828, the family returned for a visit to England, and Arthur was put to school at Chester, whence in the next year he was transferred to Rugby. Dr. Arnold had then very lately become the headmaster at Rugby, and was already giving to the school a tone and quality unknown previously to the public schools of England. He strove to impress upon the boys the sense of personal responsibility, and to rouse their conscience to the doing of duty, not so much as a matter essential to the discipline of the school as to the formation of manly and religious character. The influence of his high, vigorous, and ardent nature was of immense force, but its virtue was impaired by the artificiality of the ecclesiastical system of the Church of England, and the irrationality of the dogmatic creed, which, even to a nature as liberal as Dr. Arnold's, seemed to belong to the essentials of religion, and to be indissoluble from the foundation of morality. Clow became Arnold's devoted disciple, but he had intellectual independence and sincerity enough to save him from yielding his own individuality to any stream of external influence, however powerful. What he called the busy, argufying spirit of the prize schoolboy stood him in good stead, but the moral stress was great, and it left him early with a sense of strain and of perplexity, as his mind opened to the wider and deeper problems of life, for the solution of which the traditional creed seemed insufficient. His career at school was of the highest distinction, and when he was leaving Rugby for Oxford in 1836, Dr. Arnold broke the rule of silence to which he almost invariably adhered in the delivery of prizes, and congratulated Clow on having gained every honour which Rugby could bestow and on having done the highest credit to the school at the university, for he had won the Balliol Scholarship, then and now the highest honor which a schoolboy could obtain. Clough went into residence at Oxford in October 1837. It was a time of stirring of heart and trouble of mind at the university. The great theological controversy, which was to produce such far-reaching effects upon the lives of individuals, and upon the Church of England as a whole, was then rising to its height. Newman was at the acme of his popularity and influence. His followers were zealous and active. 
Ward, his most earnest disciple, was one of Clough's nearest friends. Clough, not yet nineteen years old, but morally and intellectually developed beyond his years, and accustomed already to independent speculation in regard to creed and conduct, was inevitably drawn into the deep waters of theological discussion. He heard, too, those other voices which Matthew Arnold, in his admirable lecture on Emerson, has spoken of as deeply affecting the more sensitive youthful spirits of the Oxford of this time. The voices of Goethe, of Carlyle, and of Emerson. He studied hard, but his studies seemed, for the moment at least, to be of secondary importance. Although unusually reserved in demeanor and silent in general company, his reputation grew, not merely as a scholar, but as a man distinguished above his fellows for loftiness of spirit, for sweetness of disposition, and for superiority of moral, no less than of intellectual qualities. With much interior storm and stress, his convictions were gradually maturing. He resisted the prevailing tendencies of Oxford thought, but did not easily find a secure basis for his own beliefs. In 1841, he tried for and missed his first class in the examinations. It was more a surprise and disappointment to others than to himself. He knew that he had not shown himself in the examinations for what he really was and his failure did not affect his confidence in his own powers, nor did others lose faith in him, as was shown by his election in the next year to a fellowship at Oriel, and the year later to his appointment as tutor. His livelihood being thus assured, he led from 1843 to 1848 a quiet, hard-working, uneventful tutor's life, diversified with reading parties in the vacations. He was writing poems from time to time, but his vocation as poet was not fully recognized by himself or by others. He had been obliged, in assuming the duties of tutor, to sign the thirty-nine articles, though, as he wrote to a friend, reluctantly enough, and I am not quite sure whether or not in a justifiable sense. However, I have for the present laid by that perplexity, though it may perhaps recur at some time or other, and in general I do not feel perfectly satisfied about staying in my tutor capacity at Oxford. The perplexity would not down, but as the years went on the troubled waters of his soul gradually cleared themselves. He succeeded in attaining independence of mind, such as few men attain, and in finding, if not a solution of the moral perplexities of life, at least a position from which they might be frankly confronted without blinking and without self-deception. It became impossible for him to accept, however they might be interpreted, the doctrines of any church. He would not play tricks with words, nor palter with the integrity of his soul. This perfect mental honesty of Clough, and his entire sincerity of expression, were a stumbling block to many of his more conventional contemporaries, and have remained as a rock of offense to many of the readers of his poetry, who find it disturbing to be obliged to recognize in his work a test of their own sincerity in dealing with themselves. With how few are conviction and profession perfectly at one! The difficulty of the struggle, in Clough's case, the difficulty of freeing himself from the chains of association, of tradition, of affection, of interest, which bound him to conformity with and acceptance of the popular creed in one or the other of its forms, has led superficial critics of his life and poetry to find in them evidence that the struggle was too hard for him and the result unsatisfactory. There could not be a greater error. 
Clough's honest acceptance of the insolubility of the vain questions which men are perpetually asking, and his recognition of the insufficiency of the answers which they are ready to accept or to pretend to accept, left him, as regards his most inward soul, one of the serenest of men. The questions of practical life, of action, of duty, indeed, presented themselves to his sensitive and contemplative nature with their full perplexity. But his spiritual life was based on a foundation that could not be shaken. He had learned the lesson of skepticism, and accepted without trouble the fact of the limitation of human faculties and the insolubility of the mystery of life. He was indeed tired with the hard work of years, and worried by the uncertainty of his future, when at length, in order to deliver himself from a constrained, if not a false position, and to obtain perfect freedom of expression as well as of thought, he resigned in 1848 both his fellowship and tutorship. It was a momentous decision, for it left him without any definite means of support. It alienated the authorities of the university. It isolated him from many old friends. Immediately after resigning his tutorship, Clough went to Paris with Emerson, then on a visit to Europe as his companion. They were drawn thither by interest in the strange revolution which was then in progress, and by desire to watch its aspects. The social conditions of England had long been matter of concern to Clough. He had been deeply touched by the misery of the Irish famine in 1847, and had printed a very striking pamphlet in the autumn of that year, urging upon the students at Oxford retrenchment of needless expenditure and restrictions of waste and luxury. His sympathies were with the poor, and he was convinced of the need of radical social reform. He therefore observed the course of revolution on the continent, not merely with curiosity, but with sympathetic hope. In the autumn of this year, after his return home, and while at Liverpool with his mother and sister, he wrote his first long poem, The Bothy of Turban of Wallach, A Long Vacation Pastoral. It had no great immediate success, but it made him known to a somewhat wider public than that of Oxford. It was in its form the fruit of the reading parties in the Highlands in previous summers. It was in hexameters, and he asked Emerson to convey to Mr. Longfellow the fact that it was a reading of his Evangeline aloud to my mother and sister, which, coming after a re-perusal of the Iliad, occasioned this outbreak of hexameters. It is a delightful poem, full of vitality and variety, original in design, simple in incident. It has the freshness and wholesomeness of the open air, the charm of nature and of life, with constant interplay of serious thought and light humor, of gravity and gaiety of sentiment. Its publication was followed speedily by a little volume entitled Ambarvalia, made up of two parts, one of poems by Clough, and one of those by an old school and college friend, Mr. Burbridge. Clough's part consisted, as he wrote to Emerson, of old things, the casualties of at least ten years. But many of these casualties are characteristic expressions of personal experience, to which Clough's absolute sincerity gives deep human interest. They are the records of his search amid the maze of life for a clue whereby to move. They deal with the problems of his own life, and these problems perplex other men as well. I have seen higher, holier things than these, he writes in 1841. I have seen higher, holier things than these, and therefore must to these refuse my heart. Yet I am panting for a little ease, I'll take and so depart. 
but he checks himself. Ah, hold! The heart is prone to fall away, her high and cherished visions to forget. And if thou takest, how wilt thou repay so vast, so dread a debt? The little volume appealed to but a small band of readers. The poems it contained did not allure by fluency of fancy or richness of diction. They were not of a kind to win sudden popularity, but they gave evidence of a poet who, though not complete master of his art, and not arrived at a complete understanding of himself, had yet a rare power of reflection and expression, and a still rarer sincerity of imaginative vision. They were poems that gave large promise, and that promise was already in part fulfilled by the Bothy. Early in 1849, the headship of University Hall in London was offered to Clough and accepted by him. This was an institution professedly non-sectarian, established for the purpose of receiving students in attendance upon the lectures at University College. He was not to enter upon the duties of the place until October, and he spent the greater part of the intervening period in a fruitful visit to Italy. He reached Rome in April. All Italy was in revolution. The Pope had fled from Rome, the Republic had been declared, and Mazzini was in control of the government. The French army was approaching to besiege the city, and Clau resolved to await the event. No more vivid and picturesque account of aspects of the siege exists than is to be found in his poem of Amours de Voyage, written in great part at Rome, under the pressure and excitement of the moment, then laid aside in the poet's desk, and not published till long afterward. It consists of a series of letters supposed to be written by various persons, in which a narrative of passing events is interwoven with a love story. The hero of the story is a creation of extraordinary subtlety and interest. He has much of the temperament of Hamlet, not wanting in personal courage nor in resolution when forced to action but hesitating through sensitiveness of conscience, through dread of mistaking momentary impulse for fixed conviction. Through the clearness with which diverging paths of conduct present themselves to his imagination with the inevitable doubt as to which be the right one to follow. The character, though by no means an exact or complete image of the poet's own, is yet drawn in part from himself, and offers glimpses of his inner nature, of the delicacy of his sensitive poetic spirit, of his tendency to subtle introspective reflection, of his honesty in dealing with facts and with himself, to see things as they are, to keep his eyes clear, to be true to the living central inmost eye, within the scales of mere exterior, were the principles of his life. The charm of Amours de Voyage, however, consists not merely in animated description, in delicate sentiment, and in the poetic representation of sensitive, impressionable, and high-minded youth, but in its delicate humor in the delineation of character, and in its powerful, imaginative, picturesque reproduction of the atmosphere and influence of Rome, and of the spirit of the moment to which the poem relates. It is as unique and as original in its kind as the Bothy. It is a poem that appeals strongly to the lovers of the poetry of high culture, and is not likely to lack such readers in future generations. From Rome in July, Clough went to Naples, and there wrote another of his most striking poems, Easter Day. In the autumn of 1850, he again went during a short vacation to Italy, but now to Venice, and while there began his third long poem, Dipsicus, 
of which the scene is in that city. In this poem, which represents the conflict of the soul in its struggles to maintain itself against the temptations of the world and the devil, Clough again wrote out much of his inner life. It is not so much a piece of strict autobiography of the spirit of an individual as an imaginative drama of the spiritual experience common in all times to men of fine nature seeking a solution of the puzzle of their own hearts in none of his other poems is there such variety of tone or such an exhibition of mature poetic power it is indeed loosely constructed but its separate parts each contributing to the development of its main theme with their diversity of imagination reflection wit and sentiment combine in an impressive unity of effect the position at university hall proved not altogether satisfactory and no other opening for him offering itself in england clow determined after much hesitation and deliberation to try his fortune as a teacher and writer in america he sailed in October 1852 on a steamer on which he had Lowell and Thackeray for fellow passengers. He spent the next eight months at Cambridge, employed in tutoring and in literary work, winning the warm regard of the remarkable group of men of letters who then gave distinction to the Society of Cambridge and of Boston, and especially keeping up his friendship with Emerson by frequent visits to Concord. There seemed a fair prospect of success for him in his new career, but his friends at home, deeply attached to him, and ill content that he should leave them, obtained for him an appointment as examiner in the education department of the council office. The salary would give to him a secure, though moderate, income. He was the more drawn to accept the place because, shortly before leaving England, he had become engaged to be married, and, accordingly, in July 1853, he returned home and at once entered on the duties of his office. In June 1854 he married. For the next seven years his life was tranquil, laborious, and happy. The account of these years contained in the beautiful sketch of his life by his wife, which is prefixed to the collection of his letters, poems, and prose remains, gives a picture of Clough's domestic felicity and of the various interests which engaged him outside of the regular drudgery of official work. His own letters bear witness to the content of his days. He had little leisure for poetry. He was overworked, and in 1860 his health gave way. Leave of absence from the office was given to him. He went to the seashore. He visited the continent. But though at times he seemed to gain strength, there was no steady recovery. In the autumn of 1861 he went to Italy, accompanied by his wife. He enjoyed the journey, but they had only reached the lakes when he experienced a touch of fever. They went on to Florence. He became more seriously ill. He began, however, apparently to recover, but a sudden blow of paralysis struck him down, and on the thirteenth day of November he died. Among the most original and beautiful of Matthew Arnold's poems is his Thyrsus, a monody, to commemorate his friend, author Hugh Clough. Thyrsus, his mate, has gone. No purer or more subtle soul than he ever sought the light that leaves its seeker still untired, still onward faring by his own heart inspired. The lament is as true as it is tender. The singer continues, What, though the music of thy rustic flute kept not for long its happy country tone, lost it too soon, and learnt a stormy note of men contention-tossed, of men who groan, which tasked 
thy pipe too sore and tired thy throat it failed and thou wast mute yet hadst thou always visions of our light yes always visions of the light but arnold's usual felicity of discrimination is lacking in this last stanza the stormy note is not the characteristic note of clough's mature song nor does his art betray the overtasked pipe his pipe, indeed, is not attuned, as was Arnold's own, to the soft melancholy of regret at leaving behind the happy fields of the past in the quest for the light that shines beyond and across the untraveled and dim waste before them. Its tone was less pathetic, but not less clear. The music of each is the song of travelers whose road is difficult, whose goal is uncertain. Their only guide is the fugitive light, now faint, now distinct, which allures them with irresistible compulsion. Their pathways at time diverge, but when most divergent, the notes of their accordant pipes are heard in the same direction. The memory of Clow remains, with those who had the happiness of knowing him in life, distinct and precious. It is that of one of the highest and purest souls. Sensitive, simple, tender, manly, his figure stands as one of the ideal figures of the past, the image of the true poet, the true friend, the true man. He died too young for his full fame, but not too young for the love which is better than fame. End of section 36